Lord of the Mysteries 2, Audiobook, Part 20 Chapter 476, Calamity Giant Count Poofer charged through the tempest, battling fierce winds, drenching rain, and bolts of lightning. Meanwhile, the pixie in the distinctive blue beret, the overseer of the hostel, positioned near the Shroud of Darkness around Sal de Ball Breeze, took advantage of the moment and slipped through the enigmatic iron-colored door. Fully aware of the peril awaiting her inside, she felt compelled by the will of a deity. Even the prospect of death didn't daunt her. It would only earn her the deity's favor and a return to the eternal realm of fantasy. Regrettably, upon her arrival, she found herself suspended in the midst of the raging storm, amidst smoke and flames. The colossal figure was clearly reflected in her eyes. It resembled a horrifying charred giant, its once fleshy exterior now absent. The charred metal skeleton, engulfed in blazing purple flames, formed what seemed like an intact body, but cracks riddled its structure. Continuously emanating illusory symbols, lightning, hail, fog, the majestic purple flames and the iron-black metal skeleton held inscrutable knowledge, representing countless real phenomena. Drip, drip. Blood-hued, magma-like pus oozed from the cracks, transforming into black-purple flames and various weather phenomena midair. Witnessing this, the pixie in the blue beret combusted from within. Instinctive fear flashed in her eyes as she desperately reached into the void, entering an intangible state. Yet, her physical form did not change for the better. With a swift whoosh, every cell in the pixie's being ignited, including the translucent dragonfly-like wings on her back. After enduring agonizing contortions, she metamorphosed into a pixie crafted from crimson flames. Lifeless eyes stared out from her now empty gaze. Within the fiery dragonfly wings, the altered pixie danced around the giant's figure, as if escorting him. Rumble! Count Poofer was struck by bolts of lightning, and nearby, purple flames erupted. Drenched in the relentless rain, enduring hailstones that battered him until he bled, he persevered through the thick smoke. Perhaps due to the Sauron family's bloodline coursing through him, he remained unaffected by the surrounding chaos. As the smoke cleared and the storm abetted, Poofer eagerly gazed at the towering giant, dozens of meters tall. Within the iron-black skull and amidst the purple flames, a distorted face of pain intermittently flickered. The face bore some resemblance to Poofer, except its eyes, weathered in blood black, were deathly still and vacant. Upon spotting the giant, Count Poofer also ignited in flames. Excruciating pain racked him, yet his gaze remained fixed on the giant's face. Amidst the encircling purple flames, faces filled with venom, hatred, and madness, as if cursing all living beings, alternated. Men and women, bearing a resemblance to both the giant and Count Poofer, emerged on the surface of withered hearts floating in the flames. Poofer glimpsed the family's forebears from the oil paintings. Despite the difficulty, his mouth curled up, his face contorted by the flames. In the turmoil, he transformed into a flaming pixie as well. However, instead of circling the rampaging giant, he was drawn by his family's bloodline into the perilous purple flames on the iron-black head, into Vermanda's face that flickered in and out. In an instant, the two fused. Vermanda's mouth twitched, a hint of liveliness in his eyes. He opened his mouth and let out a scream filled with destructive desire and madness. With this scream, the ground, scorched by the purple flames, shook dramatically, and earth puppets crawled out. These puppets, equally tall at three to four meters tall, charred with an iron hue, were speckled with dark red blood. Transforming as they squirmed, the earth puppets became soldiers, guarding the area with a semblance of life. Almost simultaneously, a fiery meteor descended from the heavens. Streaking across the sky, it plummeted towards the edge of the fog. Bang! A figure emerged amidst the meteorite-like crash and ensuing tremors, standing upright. It was Snarner Einhorn, adorned in iron-black, blood-stained armor. The 1.8-meter-tall angel, with long dark red hair and flamboyant earrings, didn't hesitate. His body expanded, unveiling a mythical creature form reminiscent of Vermanda Sauron's current state. It was a giant, a representation of calamity, 
crafted from flames and various symbolic elements. Under the silent blaze of invisible flames in the sky, across the wilderness, Puales de Roquefort, draped in an elegant black dress and a veiled hat, fixed her gaze on the majestic city not far away. She didn't get her husband, butler, and children to enter the hostel. Instead, she arranged for them to temporarily depart Trier and reside in a suburban town beyond the city wall. After a brief survey, Madame Puales turned her attention to the man merely twenty to thirty meters away. Despite appearing in his fifties, his dense blonde hair showed only slight traces of gray, and his lake blue eyes were clear. Neatly encircling his mouth, the beard framed his unusually deep facial features. It was evident he had been a handsome man in his youth. He was the circle inhabitant of the sinners, Voice and Sanson. Roche Louis Sanson's father. Madame Puales shifted her gaze back to the seemingly boundless city, sensing an inexplicable calling from somewhere. It was gradually contracting and expanding, akin to the embrace of a long-forgotten mother. She took a step forward. Franca hadn't anticipated encountering Gardner Martin immediately upon exiting the mirror world. As an undercover agent for both the Tarot Club and the Demonist sect, she felt a twinge of guilt instinctively. The urge to casually greet him with a what a coincidence surfaced subconsciously. However, she was no longer the naive rookie from her initial transmigration. Her worldly and combat experiences ranked among the elite in the curly-haired baboons research society. Swiftly reacting, she yelled at Anthony Reed, duck, and, turning invisible, lunged to the side. Almost simultaneously, dozens, perhaps hundreds, of blazing white fireballs materialized around Gardner Martin. His eyes were profound, body clad in silver armor, as the fireballs howled and erupted at the previous location of Franca and Anthony Reed. Anthony, his gaze fixed on General Phillips' black cloaked figure, heard Franca's warning, duck, echoing in his ears. Experienced, though unsure of what to expect, he followed his teammate's advice. Adjusting his body midair, he kicked down with both feet, hurtling toward General Philip without picking a side. Amidst the explosive chaos, General Philip was astonished to find a slightly greasy middle-aged man in military green camouflage clothing glaring at him with hatred, launching towards him. Does he hold a grudge against me? Philip wondered, his eyes darkening as focus slipped away. He saw a myriad of intertwined fates and discerned the thread's approximate origins. So, you're a survivor of the Sacrificial Company. Lucky enough to escape back then, and now you dare return for revenge? General Phillips sneered with disdain. As a Sequence Five Reaper of the Hunter Pathway, he made the decision to put his faith in the Great Goddess of Fate and receive the corresponding boon. This choice stemmed from his first-hand recognition of the limitations and issues within his original pathway in the mysticism domain, along with the impending apocalypse he couldn't avoid. His aim was clear, to swiftly ascend to demigod status, securing the protection of a mighty existence to endure the impending apocalypse. Ordinary channels simply couldn't provide him with what he needed. Despite the initial weaknesses and constraints of the goddess of fate's pathway, he accepted it without hesitation. It was worth noting that the boon corresponding to sequence 9, dreamless, merely granted him a dreamless state and the ability to sense the flow of fate. Consequently, he forfeited the potential of gaining revelations through his spirituality via dreams. Sequence 8 musicians were a slight improvement. In certain worlds, musicians often blinded themselves to enhance their focus on the voice of fate before playing it like a symphony. However, this method demanded extensive preparation and sufficient time to orchestrate the tune in order to influence a target's fate. As for Sequence 7 fate priors, they shared essential similarities with seers. However, unlike seers, they didn't require a medium to directly perceive or hear the revelations of fate. By sequence 6, the bestowed of the goddess of fate finally acquired relatively potent abilities. Those who glimpsed fate could convey it and directly impact a target, but each usage came with a significant drawback, a self-imposed silence lasting for an extended period. This sequence was known as mute. Only after faking his death and breaking free from his original fate did the Sequence 5 deceased no longer bear the previous restrictions. They could now function relatively normally. 
As a dual sequence 5, General Philip unraveled the threads of fate, discerning the origin of Anthony Reed's animosity. He chuckled, releasing a voice that seemed confined for an eternity. Fate can't be avoided. You'll ultimately end up as my sacrifice. Amidst these words and the explosive tumult, Anthony Reed's mind replayed the harrowing scene of the camp attack, causing him to break out into a tremble. Thud. He landed on the ground and clutched his head in fear. Not far away, concealed behind a half-collapsed grayish-white stone pillar, Lumian and Jenna both heard Franca's urgent cry to duck. Franca has entered too. How did she do it? Lumian wondered, a sense of alarm coursing through him. Chapter 477, Frenzy Lumian felt a brief moment of surprise before taking a shot in the dark. Considering that General Philip likely used a special item to access the underground mirror world, Lumian figured Franca, equipped with the ancient silver mirror boasting the same powers, should have a shot at it too. The why and what of it didn't matter now. Those questions could wait until after dealing with Gardner Martin and General Philip or finding a way to slip past them. There might be a chance to escape this place. At the fringes of the wilderness, Gardner Martin's attempts to flush out Franca from her invisibility failed, even after a series of explosions. His former lover had vanished to some unknown spot. Being a demoness of pleasure, Franca relied on her assassin abilities, leaving no footprints, masking her scent and spiritual aura. It made her a formidable challenge to track, countering a hunter's knack for gathering environmental intel. Gardner Martin, donned in silver-white full-body armor, kept on the move. Familiar with the Demonis Pathway's traits and abilities, he knew that, having ascended to pleasure, Franca didn't need blood, hair, or nails for her curses. Reflecting him into mirrors and enveloping him in black flames would do the trick. He couldn't stand still for more than three seconds, to prevent himself from being reflected in the mirror. As he swiftly maneuvered, Gardner Martin glanced at Philip and Anthony, the information broker. He noticed the latter lying on the ground clutching his head and trembling. Anthony sporadically used placate on himself, resigning from resistance. Philip's black cloak expanded slightly, and crimson, nearly white flaming ravens materialized beside him, as if preparing for a grand sacrifice. Observing the scene, Gardner Martin paid no heed to the ongoing battle. He raised his right hand and lowered his visor. A broadsword, aglow with condensed light, materialized in Gardner Martin's grip, casting a radiant and holy sunrise gleam over a vast expanse. Its brilliance dispelled illusions, compelling shadows to retreat and revealing Franca's ponytailed form more than ten meters behind him. This was the power of a sequence six dawn paladin of the warrior pathway. The power emanated from Gardner Martin's silver armor, a numbered sealed artifact bestowed by the authorities. He had acquired it in an operation a few years back, slaying two purifiers of the Eternal Blazing Sun Church and claiming the armor from their fallen bodies. Number, 247. Name, Pride Armor. Danger Grade, 2, Dangerous. Use with care and moderation. It can only be applied for operations that require more than three people or by deacons and diocesan bishops. Security classification, official purifiers, and above. Sealing method, place it in a dark chamber and select physically strong humans to guard them with a rotation every three hours. Description, late into the war between the Lowen Kingdom and the Faisak Empire, a plethora of meteors descended from the sky, causing widespread catastrophes. This armor was discovered in a ruined building in the suburbs of Port Lesur. The humans inside had met a brutal end. Through experimentation, it bestows upon the wearer the might of a giant. It blankets an area of 48 meters in sunrise gleam. These rays dispel illusions, erase shadows, and nullify invisibility effects. They also affect wraiths and shadows, diminishing their peculiarities and even weakening evil spirits. It possesses decent defensive capabilities and can be damaged but regenerates slowly. Depending on the extent of the damage, recovery can range from half an hour to a day. For detailed data, refer to Appendix 2. 
It also grants the wearer the ability to manifest a hefty, robust, yet sharp two-handed broadsword. Each strike carries a purifying effect, and dismantling the radiant broadsword results in a formidable hurricane of light. This phenomenon can obliterate the human body, vanquish wraiths, and harm evil spirits. The wearer's combat skills see a significant boost, accompanied by heightened arrogance. They hold disdain for those standing behind them and targets concealed in the darkness or invisible. It indiscriminately eliminates weak humans within a 50-meter radius. Should the wearer weaken, they too become a target. The criteria for determining one's physique are inconsistent, sometimes very high, sometimes low. Initial findings suggest a correlation with the armor's condition and the surrounding environment. Most humans with regular exercise or those who rely on potions to enhance their physique pass the assessment without incident. For exceptions, it was later discovered they suffered from undetected serious illnesses or indulged excessively in the past two days. No matter who you are, caution is warranted when positioned behind this armor, though attacks don't always occur. Similarly, the wearer is vulnerable to its attacks when using other mystical items. Experimental results show heightened reactions when facing items from the Evernight Pathway and the Earth Pathway. The wearer of the armor eventually experiences varying degrees of betrayal, irrespective of whether they still wear the item. At night, this armor is very quiet, exhibiting minimal aggressiveness. However, under a moonlit sky, its demeanor becomes notably irritable, reaching maximal offensiveness. The highest level of experimental subjects is Sequence 5. Appendix 1, the wearer of the armor grows taller to varying degrees. Multiple wearings do not stack. Appendix 2. Under the influence of the sealed artifact, 2, 247, Franca materialized. Gardner Martin, wearing a visor, hesitated briefly before slashing with the radiant broadsword in his hand. Simultaneously, a multitude of crimson, nearly white fire ravens condensed around him. Surrounded by crimson fire ravens, General Philip locked eyes with the prone Anthony Reed. With a slight lift of his chin, he declared, Accept your fate. Anthony sensed the imminent danger but found himself powerless to resist. Trembling, memories of that haunting night flooded his mind, making it difficult to put up any resistance. However, as he recalled General Philip's words about becoming a sacrifice, the tragic fate of his comrades, in the years of investigation, anger ignited within Anthony. It's him. He's the one responsible for harming my comrades, those rough but endearing individuals, and my companions who once had my back. Suddenly, Lumian's earlier question echoed in Anthony's thoughts. Up to this day, do you still wrestle with the fear from that night, the sounds of sudden gunshots? Do you truly possess the courage and determination to press on? Anthony remembered his response. Perhaps I perished in that attack. What remains is an avenging spirit, relentless in its pursuit of truth and retribution. I can be destroyed, but I can't give up. That's right. I should have died long ago. My sole purpose in life is revenge. And today, my true enemy stands before me. Why should I be afraid? I'm not even afraid of death. Why fear gunshots, explosions, or being a sacrifice? Wouldn't the worst outcome be death and being sacrificed to an evil god? I was already mentally prepared. This time, I chose to stay in Trier, not to flee from potential catastrophe but to make amends for my regrets. Now, the opportunity has presented itself. The flames of revenge roared within Anthony Reed's heart. He lifted his gaze to meet General Phillips' slightly reddened, hatred-filled dark brown eyes, once his superior's superior's superior. Go to hell. Anthony cursed inwardly as he unleashed a psychiatrist's frenzy. This ability could manipulate the emotions or destabilize the mental state of the target, pushing them into a frenzied state and inflicting severe mental damage. In some cases, it could even lead the target to lose control. Just as General Philip prepared to unleash a swarm of fire ravens, a surge of danger premonition hit him. Before he could react, the intended sacrifice raised his head locking eyes with him, bloodshot dark brown eyes burning with intensity. With a buzzing sound, Philip's head snapped back, his thoughts thrown into disarray. 
ever since embracing the goddess of fate, originally being a sequence 5, he, armed with the corresponding knowledge, could keenly sense shifts in his personality and thoughts. His body had undergone gradual changes as the power of the boons increased. For Philip, mentally prepared as he was, this was acceptable. One concern nagged at him, his mental state had become unpredictable. Sometimes rational, sometimes fanatical, sometimes cold, and sometimes calm. His behavior was capricious. It mirrored those great existences. General Philip's mind felt like a storm had been unleashed within it. His facial skin swelled, and his pale white hair crinkled, resembling someone submerged in water for days. Invisible threads materialized from each pore, tinged with a faint mercurial hue, giving Philip's flesh the appearance of being ablaze with flames. General Philip briefly succumbed to frenzy. At that moment, a figure materialized behind him. It was Lumian, dressed in a partially tucked white shirt, brown pants, and oil painting like black leather shoes. Recognizing Franca's voice and sensing the onset of the battle, Lumian didn't immediately rush out to provide assistance. Instead, he opted to wait for the right opportunity. Aware that his current spirituality dictated a single optimal choice, Lumian needed to eliminate either Gardner Martin or General Philip swiftly. Franca, Jenna, and Anthony could then join forces to handle the remaining adversary. Choosing a target was no easy decision for Lumian. Gardner Martin, corrupted by 13, Avenue du Marque and the commanding officer of the Iron and Blood Cross Order, possessed numerous peculiarities. Lumian couldn't guarantee that a combination of punches would conclusively finish him. General Philip, with his boon involving fate, might sense danger ahead of time, making Lumian's surprise attack unlikely to succeed. Both options carried substantial risks, forcing Lumian to exercise restraint and wait patiently. As long as Franca and Anthony remained alive for the time being, Lumian would hold back. Patience was a fundamental quality of a hunter, equally crucial for a conspirer. However, Lumian's waiting wasn't blind. Relying on Jenna's mirror magic and the shattered mirrors in the wilderness, he observed the situation closely. Prepared to intervene and save Anthony, Lumian found the opportune moment when Anthony turned the tables on Philip with a frenzy. This was an opportunity. Lumian gazed at General Philip, struggling in his frenzied state, and coldly exclaimed, Humph. Two beams of white light shot out and struck Philip. The deceased's eyes lost focus suddenly, and his body swayed, on the brink of collapse. Lumian had already raised his right hand, bent his pinky and ring finger, and aimed at the back of General Philip's head, mimicking a revolver. Bang! With an added sound effect in his mind and a slight lean backward, a crimson fireball rapidly compressed and shot out from the tips of his index and middle fingers, hurtling towards the target like a bullet. Chapter 478 The Mockery of Fate Bang! The crimson fireball, unleashed from Lumian's fingertips, honed in on its target, striking General Philip's head with deadly precision. The explosion that followed resembled a cannonball's impact. Philip's body disintegrated starting from the point of impact, as if a hammer had shattered a mirror reflecting his form. Amidst the chaos concealed by the explosion, shards of glass scattered across the wilderness, joining the reflections of those already present. Lumian's eyes widened as he observed the unexpected turn of events. Does the deceased pathway also possess mirror substitution? Or does General Philip wield a mystical item from the Demonis pathway? Such thoughts raced through Lumian's mind as he processed the scene. Philip's black cloaked figure swiftly reappeared more than ten meters away. His eyes, once frenzied, now regained clarity. Simultaneously, Jenna, disguised as a female mercenary, materialized from invisibility behind General Philip. She aimed her revolver at the deceased, who had narrowly escaped the fatal attack in negative state. To be honest, Jenna found herself in a perplexing and shocking situation. The revelation that General Philip possessed mirror substitution didn't catch her off guard. However, she hadn't processed the implications before realizing he had chosen to position himself right before her, as if anticipating her to backstab him. Originally, Jenna had devised a plan to exploit Lumian's clash with General Philip. 
Her intention was to utilize invisibility, slip away from her hiding spot, and reach the wilderness's edge. Her goal, to assist Franca, cast a curse if Lumion's strike fell short, or create a frosty hindrance on the ground. Unexpectedly, General Philip had escaped to a location directly in front of her. Such a golden opportunity couldn't be ignored. Confused by the unfolding events, Jenna instinctively raised her right hand, aiming her revolver at the back of General Philip's head. Though unsure of the reasons behind this bizarre turn of events, she suspected it was connected to the lucky gold coin she had received from Will. Bang! Jenna squeezed the trigger, and a yellow bullet, wreathed in black flames, shot out from the muzzle, hurtling toward General Philip's skull. Meanwhile, Franca emerged from the radiant sunrise gleam, witnessing Anthony Reed overcoming his fear to employ his abilities on General Philip. Lumian had for some reason arrived in the vicinity, appearing mysteriously behind Philip. Without time to dwell on her surprise, Franca swiftly raised her brass classic revolver and fired an iron black bullet at Gardner Martin, who wielded his broadsword of light. Her strategy was clear, unleash her full strength to stall Gardner Martin and deny him the opportunity to save General Philip. Franca's decision to use invisibility wasn't about tapping into assassin tactics to backstab her ex-lover. Drawing on her battle experience, she instinctively chose invisibility for a different purpose, to escape Gardner Martin and General Philip's sight, gaining a brief moment of safety. During this fleeting period, Franca not only moved with agility but also retrieved the coin bag filled with coins. Wearing the iron-black ring of punishment on her left thumb and Beatrice's necklace around her neck, she completed her ensemble. Finally, she withdrew the cannon gun from her underarm holster, clasping it firmly in her palm. In her invisible state, Franca armed herself to the teeth, entering her strongest state before the inevitable reveal. Bang! As the iron-black bullet sped toward Gardner Martin, Franca's diamond necklace on her chest emitted a faint glow. Simultaneously, Franca's eyes welled up, and her red lips parted slightly, amplifying the allure of a demoness of pleasure. Gardner Martin's body suddenly heated up, feeling his blood rush to his nether regions. Scenes of his past entanglement with Franca flooded his mind, captivated by the demoness' uncanny demeanor amidst iron and blood. His eyes reddened, breathing grew labored, and movements visibly slowed. Lust From Beatrice's necklace and the lust of the Mother Tree of Desire pathway, coupled with the charm of a demoness of pleasure, it had a synergistic effect greater than the sum of its parts. Moreover, Gardner Martin wasn't a stranger to such experiences. He had always agreed with the words in Emperor Roselle's secret chronicles, the taste of a demoness ain't bad. In this situation, how could he control himself after tasting a demoness? Clang! The iron-black bullet struck Gardner Martin's chest, causing cracks in his silver armor. Franca, not surprised that the attack hadn't worked, realized in her haste, she hadn't activated the heavy strike effect of the cannon gun. The brass revolver, a mystical item purchased from the curly-haired baboon's research society, wasn't particularly potent or mystical, it had two simple abilities. The first, a normal shot, equivalent to a rifle, and the second, a heavy strike, akin to a small cannonball or a sniper rifle. Franca always carried it to compensate for a demoness' lack of offensive capabilities when she couldn't use a curse. The cannon gun's negative effects were minimal, if all six rounds were not fired in a day or maintained every other week, rare situations like chamber explosions or misfires could occur. Observing Gardner Martin's infatuated gaze behind the visor, Franca hesitated before using her right thumb to pull back the cannon gun's hammer, signaling the activation of the heavy strike effect. Bang! As Franca moved, she pulled the trigger at Gardner Martin, who lunged at her as if seeking a mate. The iron-black bullet collided with him, accompanied by blazing flames. Almost simultaneously, Franca sensed an anomaly in the primordial demoness figurine casually stuffed into her pocket. Not only did it turn cold again, like ice, but it also trembled slightly. Damn it! Why is it you again? Are you done? Franca, feeling both angry and cautious, pulled the trigger and threw the palm-sized bone figurine far away. Simultaneously, on the other side, Jenna's bullet, fired from an ordinary revolver, pierced the back of General Philip's head with black flames. 
Unsurprisingly, the deceased shattered like a mirror, his figure outlined at the edge of the sunrise gleam created by Gardner Martin. At that moment, as Franca hurled the primordial Demonis bone figurine, General Philip's body froze. Black flames erupted, silently igniting his spirit body. Cold frost swiftly condensed, enveloping him. Blood seeped from his eyes, nose, mouth, and ears, emitting a series of cracking sounds. The mirror he carried appeared to have shattered. He was clearly in a daze, as if he had been cursed. Without hesitation, Lumian employed spirit world traversal once more, emerging from behind General Philip. Meanwhile, Anthony Reed had stood up, his expression no longer filled with fear but focused hatred. As Philip was not far from him, on the edge of the clear sunrise gleam, he ran towards the general, his mortal enemy. Philip's figure reflected in his eyes, and he couldn't help but smile. His pupils turned vertical, tinged with a faint golden hue. This time, he refrained from employing frenzy, fearing it might cause General Philip to lose control and transform, giving Gardner Martin an opportunity to kill his team. He chose Awe, also known as Dragon Might. General Philip trembled. Under normal circumstances, he wouldn't have succumbed to such a severe awe. At most, he would have experienced temporary fear. However, he was in a dire state, influenced by an unknown force, betrayed by an item on him. Consequently, his entire being fell into a blank state. Observing this, Lumian refrained from using the spell of Harumph. His right hand took the shape of a revolver again, aimed at the back of General Philip's head, and fired a crimson fireball that was nearly white from his fingertips. Philip was jolted awake by a tangible premonition of danger, only to witness his impending demise. A wave of indignation washed over him. Despite being stronger, possessing lethal strikes, and an array of mystical abilities, he suffered a relentless beating without a chance to retaliate. He didn't even have an opportunity to fight back before death knocked on his door. In his eyes, countless fates interwove into a net, constantly changing, as if mocking him. This made him feel like a clown. Bang! General Philip's head exploded from Lumian's crimson, nearly white fireball. Numerous skull fragments splattered with charred marks, red blood, and milky white brain matter. The deceased's lifeless body thudded to the ground, and an item rolled out of the hidden pocket of the black cloak. It was a pitch black figurine palm-sized and resembling a beautiful woman. Long snake-like hair cascaded to its feet, and it had eyes of various forms at the top. W.H., Lumian's gaze instinctively shifted to the primordial Demonis figurine that Franca had thrown out. Similar to the one on General Philip, one was pure white, while the other was pitch black. Suddenly, Lumian grasped why General Philip had mirror substitution and why he had appeared directly in front of Jenna, who was invisible. With the special primordial Demonis figurine, he naturally converged with Demonises. Subsequently, Franca's official primordial Demonis figurine resonated with the pitch black one, causing an abnormality that led to General Philip being cursed by the item at a critical moment. The pitch black primordial Demonis figurine was likely the item Gardner Martin had smuggled into Trier through Rat Christo's smuggling caravan. Chapter 479, Matching Items Bang! The jet-black bullet, ablaze with fiery fury, slammed into Gardner Martin, who was gripped by desire, dead center in his gleaming silver armor once again. It hit him like a battering ram, sending shockwaves through his frame. A web of fractures sprawled out from the impact zone, causing Gardner Martin's advance to stagger, forcing him to lean backward. This abrupt jolt snapped him out of his reverie. He witnessed General Philip, wreathed in black flames and encased in frost, while Lumian materialized behind the deceased. Lumian's right hand acted as a revolver, launching a crimson fireball straight at the back of Philip's head. Behind Gardner Martin's mask, his pupils dilated, and a shiver raced down his spine, as if an icy cascade had been dumped over him. This abrupt awakening effectively quelled his desires. Without hesitation, he dropped to one knee and drove the hefty broadsword into the wilderness. The broadsword shattered, breaking into myriad fragments of light that swept toward Franca, Lumian, and the others, including the lifeless form of General Philip. 
Amidst a resounding crack, Franca, constantly shifting positions, remained enveloped by the hurricane of light, her body fracturing like a shattered mirror. Lumian and Jenna met the same fate. Only Anthony Reed, lacking mirror substitution, instinctively lunged to the ground, curling up to shield his vital parts. The luminous tempest rapidly dissipated before Lumian and his companions outlined themselves on the outskirts of the wilderness, facing the pale black stone bricks. They witnessed a brilliant white flaming spear hurtling towards the distant majestic city, covering more than a hundred meters in the blink of an eye. As soon as the fiery spear materialized upon impact with the ground, Gardner Martin, draped in silver armor, rose again, directing his focus towards the city veiled in a thin fog. After several consecutive attempts, Gardner Martin distanced himself from Franca and the others, sprinting towards the dilapidated structures at the city's periphery. Lumian chose not to pursue him. Instead, he sprinted to the edge of the sunrise gleam to check on Anthony Reed. The psychiatrist's body bore a multitude of bloody wounds, with the most severe on the left side of his back, revealing a glimpse of his beating heart. Lying on his side, curled up and bloodied, Anthony Reed forced a smile upon seeing Lumian. There was no fear of death in that smile, only relief, relaxation, and satisfaction. The taste of revenge was indeed sweet. Observing Anthony Reed's lips moving as if he intended to entrust something, Lumian scoffed and remarked, Do you wish to utter your final words? Do you want us to dispatch your belongings to your home on the west mid seashore coast? As he spoke, Lumian retrieved a silver earring, securing it to his left earlobe. Squatting down, he pressed his left hand against the gaping wound on Anthony's back. Abruptly, his palm slid upward, and the gruesome wound shifted to Anthony's shoulder. In the blink of an eye, the most critical injury on Anthony's body vanished, leaving him as good as new. However, the initially minor wounds on his shoulder deepened, revealing white bones and causing blood to seep out. This was Lai's damage transfer, capable of addressing one wound at a time. Anthony was taken aback, feeling as if life had been restored to him. Though the pain persisted, and his body weakened, at least the specter of imminent death had dissipated. Then, Jenna approached, placing him in a supine position. With a swift pft, Jenna thrust an obsidian arrow into Anthony's chest. The arrow of the bloodthirsty promptly absorbed the blood, turning Anthony's pupils red. The invisible flames in the sky seemed a bit blinding, and the scent of blood in the air proved enticing. Simultaneously, the smaller wounds on his body swiftly healed, and the more severe ones showed significant improvement. In a matter of minutes, they should close up on their own, ceasing to impede his movements. Anthony Reed, teetering on the edge of death, stood up, bewildered, examining his body with disbelief. I've nearly recovered. I'm all right just like that. As a spectator, his emotions visibly fluctuated. Not a bad combination, Frank appraised. As long as you don't perish on the spot and refrain from losing control and transforming into a monster, there's still a chance to save you. At most, you'll become weakened. Lies damage transfer, coupled with the formidable self-healing abilities bestowed by the arrow of the bloodthirsty, produced such a remarkable effect. Franca turned her gaze to Lumian, questioning, I thought you'd intercept Gardner Martin. In that critical moment, the others couldn't match Gardner Martin's speed as he fled. Only Lumian, capable of spirit world traversal, had the potential to catch up and effectively hinder him. Do you think I didn't want to? Lumian retorted, a note of mockery in his tone. However, he lacked the ability. Had he not been affected by Voisin Sanson's circle inhabitant during his first teleportation today, returning him to his original spot without expending his spirituality, Lumian wouldn't have maintained a stable state. He wouldn't even have been able to use life for damage transfer. He would have had to rely on Franca or Jenna. How could he possibly have caught up to Gardner Martin? Franca instantly grasped Lumian's meaning. He had engaged in battles before and after entering this place, and his spirituality was on the verge of depletion. All right. Franca shifted her attention to the two primordial demoness figurines, one black and one white, lying undisturbed on the ground, untouched by the hurricane of light. Frowning, she inquired, where should I toss these two? Them constantly causing abnormalities seemed like a scam. 
take them with you. Lumian considered for a moment before smiling. If it weren't for them, how could we have dispatched General Philip so effortlessly? We might need them to escape in the future. Yes, we can entrust both to one person. You take one, and Jenna will take the other. After a brief pause, Franca responded, I'll still take the white one. As a member of the Demonis sect, holding the orthodox primordial Demonis figurine was only natural. Observing Jenna pick up the pitch black primordial Demonis figurine, Franca muttered in confusion, Why is there such a figurine? According to the Purifier's dossier and information from other secret organizations, members of the Demonis sect only carry bone figurines. There's nothing that's so black. While Franca spoke, she scrutinized the charred primordial Demonis bone figurine, comparing it with her own. Soon, she discerned differences in the details. Aside from the stark white and pitch black hues, the eyes at the tips of the primordial Demonis snake like hair faced different directions. If one looked left, the other would undoubtedly look right. Like a mirror image, mirror. Is this the primordial Demonis in the mirror? Frank ventured a guess, amalgamating the abilities and traits of the Demonis pathway with her experience in the peculiar mirror world. This shouldn't be possible under normal circumstances. It wouldn't be easy for the Iron and Blood Cross Order to find such a figurine. She now comprehended the reason behind their encounters with Gardner Martin and General Philip. This was a manifestation of the law of Beyonder characteristics convergence. Except for Anthony, an unwitting psychiatrist brought in by his companion, everyone present was either a hunter or a demoness. Furthermore, Frank and Anthony had entered through the same method as General Philip. They would inevitably emerge at the edge of this wilderness, teeming with mirror fragments. Primordial Demonis in the Mirror Lumian found the description ominous. Without delay, he addressed Franca and the others, search General Philip's corpse and help me guard the surroundings. I'll set up a ritual to restore my spirituality. Jenna expressed surprise. There's a ritual that can restore spirituality? Her gaze naturally swept over General Philip's corpse, realizing it had been split into five or six pieces, each a gruesome mess. The Beyonder characteristics had yet to emerge at that moment. The boon from the evil god couldn't return to its source, slowly sinking back into the lifeless form. Lumian entered a dimly lit area with grayish-white stone pillars, found cover, and swiftly set up the altar. Franca could surmise who he was praying to, so she joined him to guard against any unforeseen incidents. Jenna contemplated for a few seconds before approaching the altar. Retrieving the lucky gold coin, she said to Lumian, This is the lucky gold coin that the boy gave me. I don't know if it's useful when given to others, but there's no harm in trying. She delegated the task of searching the corpse to Anthony Reed, who was rapidly recovering. Frank observed in silence for a moment before affirming, True. Lumian didn't hesitate. After all, Will had a close connection to the Tarot Club. Even if the lucky gold coin couldn't be lent to others, it wouldn't bring about any negative effects. Placing the low and gold pound on the altar, Lumian conjured a wall of spirituality, ignited all the candles, and took two steps back. Rather than proceeding with the boon seeking ritual, he attempted to recite Mr. Fool's honorific name. The fool that doesn't belong to this era, the mysterious ruler above the gray fog, the king of yellow and black who wields good luck. As Hermes reverberated, the lucky gold coin on the altar illuminated. A thin gray fog emanated from the wall of spirituality, enveloping the wilderness's periphery. The fog in the distant majestic city appeared to thicken. Before long, just as Lumian began praying for a boon, a frenzied and terrifying roar echoed from the area where the weather was chaotic and faint giant figures lingered. Despite the thin gray fog, the four of them felt dizzy. The blood in their bodies raced, and their hearts pounded. It's truly useful. It's genuinely lucky. Lumian gazed at the dazzling golden coin on the altar, sighing sincerely. Had it not been for the ritual and Mr. Fool's gray fog's protection, the roar could have inflicted severe damage, especially considering Lumian's nearly depleted spirituality. He might have lost control, putting Anthony Reed, still recovering from severe injuries, in jeopardy. Phew! 
Lumian exhaled and continued to recite in a deep voice under the watchful eyes of Franca and Jenna, Power of Inevitability. You are the past, the present, and the future, you are the cause, the effect, and the process. Chapter 480, Ascetic Amidst the frenzied and terrifying roars, a hurricane tore through the abnormally chaotic weather, shrouding the scene in smoke, flames, lightning, and hail. It spiraled into the sky, merging with the silent inferno. Not far from the apocalypse-like hurricane, two figures felt the impact of the roar simultaneously. One's head tilted back slightly, as if punched, while the other's wrinkles quivered, and his eyes grew sharper. The former was the man who had originally stood behind Olson, vice president of the Iron and Blood Cross Order, Tony Twain. The latter was aged, donning a blue military suit with a sash and medals. His neatly combed back dark red hair identified him as the mysterious president of the Iron and Blood Cross Order, known as Deist. Deist shifted his gaze from the hurricane to Tony Twain. The chance to become a conqueror is before us. If I can seize it, I'll find a way to separate the weather warlocks beyond her characteristic and bestow it upon you. As Tony Twain observed the violent hurricane, lightning, and torrential rain, his light blue eyes hinted at mockery. Can we really succeed? A weather warlock has already joined. Even if Vermanda Sauron loses control and transforms into a monster, he's still a Sequence 1 monster. Tony Twain's words showed no respect for a Sequence 2 weather warlock or a Sequence 1 conqueror, despite not being an angel yet. Deist's expression remained unchanged, and his aura surged. With his military attire, he resembled the commander in chief of all armies. Elsewhere, we'll surely fail. Even without interference, we'll need to embark on a lengthy hunt to stand a chance against the out of control Vermanda Sauron. But here, Deist spoke in a deep voice, we can harness that power for a brief period. As he finished speaking, the area between his brows turned red, as if something sought to emerge. Simultaneously, Deist retrieved a coin pouch from his waist, concealed beneath his suit. Filled with soybeans and a few palm-sized iron soldiers, Deist grabbed them and tossed them forward. Amidst the howling wind, the iron soldiers sprang to life and expanded. The soybeans swelled rapidly, transforming into giants with blurred faces and yellowish skin, as if soaked in water. Failing to bring his team here in time, Deist abruptly transformed into a blazing dark red, nearly purple flame, engulfing the newly created soldiers. A beam of light shot up, tearing through the sky and homing in on the giant figure within the hurricane. At the edge of the magnificent city veiled in a thin gray fog, Gardner Martin removed his helmet. His breastplate bore web-like cracks, revealing blood-stained clothes beneath. With one hand pressed against his head, he staggered forward, intermittently emitting crimson flames bordering on white. The terrifying roar had clearly taken its toll. Navigating through the ruins, Gardner Martin quickly approached the thin gray fog. Half-collapsed asymmetrical buildings stood within, seemingly frozen in time, struck by a devastating blow and sunk into the ground. Abruptly halting, Gardner Martin glanced to the side and asked in a deep voice, Who is it? Amidst the sound of gravel tumbling, Olsen, resembling a hungry bear, emerged from behind a collapsed black building, carrying a small brown suitcase. The supervisor, sporting a half-top hat, yellow vest, and black suit, looked at Gardner Martin and said, I didn't know who was coming, so I hid for a while. Where's Philip? Gardner Martin breathed a sigh of relief and replied, we encountered Lumian Lee and his team. They killed Philip. I was injured and barely managed to escape. Olson, with his thick beard, didn't delve into the details of the battle and sized up Gardner Martin. You're quite beaten up. Gardner Martin chuckled, saying, Fortunately, I had pride armor to shield me from most of the damage. Yeah, I blame it mainly on the angelic roar, it affected me to a certain extent. Fortunately, I was relatively far away, so the problem isn't that serious. Look, even the pride armor hasn't attacked me, indicating that I haven't weakened. That's good. Let's enter fourth epic trier now, Supervisor Olson nodded with an indifferent expression. Gardner Martin turned around, clutching the silver helmet with one arm, 
and walked towards the thin gray fog not far away. Olson carried a small brown suitcase and trailed behind the commanding officer of the Iron and Blood Cross Order. As the two advanced, Olson's eyes suddenly turned fierce and vicious. You'd used fortunately twice. You've already taken off the Pride Armor's helmet. Olson muttered silently to himself, his brownish red eyes reflecting Gardner Martin's staggering figure in the silver armor. At the edge of the wilderness, scattered with mirror fragments, Franca and Jenna couldn't hear the chants emanating from the Wall of Spirituality, but they observed the grayish white stone pillar and two candles of the same color mysteriously softening. Fist sized candle flames flickered in silver white and black, while an illusory pure black liquid oozed from Lumian's chest, enveloping him. As Lumian curled up on the ground, occasionally rolling, Franca sighed softly and remarked, It looks painful. This likely marked Seal's fourth encounter with such an ordeal. That's right. Despite standing outside the wall of spirituality, Jenna felt an inexplicable fear, goosebumps forming on her skin. While she had witnessed Seal's mental pain and confusion, this was her first time witnessing such intense physical suffering. Franca spoke sincerely, if Seal were to switch to the affliction potion now, he wouldn't have to worry about not reaching Sequence 4. It's too compatible. Sequence 5 of the Assassin Pathway was known as Affliction or the Demoness of Affliction. After another terrifying roar, the silver-black illusory liquid beads on Lumian's body seeped into him. His expression gradually relaxed, and his body ceased its curled-up state. He lay sprawled beside the collapsed grayish-white stone pillar, reluctant to move for a few seconds. While his spirituality had recovered and even increased, his body and mind were visibly exhausted. It was akin to the sensation one experienced after completing an exceptionally challenging task in their most focused state. Lumian, aware of the urgency, forced himself to his feet. He noticed that the silver-black candle flame had returned to normal, and the surrounding gray fog was gradually dissipating. His plan to rely on the gray fog's protection against the terrifying roar had failed before implementation. Mr. Fool's response had a time limit. Furthermore, he had to consider the interference of the celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings. As Lumian swiftly tidied up the altar, he scrutinized his transformation, the improvement in spirituality was evident with the ascetic boon. Lumian believed that even after using the spell of Harumph a few times, he could complete nearly eight spirit world traversals. Ascetic had also enhanced his endurance, making him more adaptable to extreme weather. Even if he encountered frost, he wouldn't be frozen. Similarly, he found himself better at enduring emotions and desires. While he still felt them, he could endure many things. This extended to an ascetic's core ability, compression. It could be used for the mind and also produced positive effects in the physical and mystic domains. The former involved emotions and desires, which were mostly tolerated. They didn't completely disappear but were suppressed. At critical points, they needed to be vented or relieved, or psychological problems could arise. The compression ability could accumulate these emotions and desires and erupt at critical moments for the desired effect. For Lumian, the negative effects of the contractee's three abilities and the corresponding effects of mystical items on him were more bearable. However, he needed to regularly break an enemy's neck as a way to vent. The latter aspect referred to spirituality, strength, and ritual steps. Through compression, Lumian could compress and store spirituality and strength beyond the average person when he had nothing to do, releasing them when needed. This allowed his spirituality to recover once and temporarily enlarge him. His strength, speed, and agility were sufficient to withstand a sequence six dawn paladin of the warrior pathway for a minute or two. Additionally, the accumulation of ritual steps enabled Lumian to use abilities like the Animal Creation spell and the Exorcism spell in actual combat. Furthermore, after becoming an ascetic, Lumian's previous boons had been enhanced. For instance, the number of contract abilities he could withstand had increased to three, although he didn't want to maximize them. He preferred choosing one or two suitable ones, as too many contracts brought too many negative effects. Even ascetics would suffer because of them, as evidenced by negative examples like Guillaume Benet and Bouvard. 
Of course, this wasn't an immediate concern, as summoning creatures from the spirit world was impossible in this location. Lumian swiftly stashed away the items and dispelled the wall of spirituality. Handing back the fortunate gold coin to Jenna, he spoke in a low, commanding tone, let's make our way to fourth epic trier. Ha! Huh. Jenna was bewildered. Seal had warned them to steer clear of the giant and the grand city. Franco looked back with contemplation and said, do you suspect that the fog shrouding the city belongs to Mr. Fool? Entering might provide some protection. We won't have to worry about getting taken out by that lunatic's roar or succumbing to the risk of transforming into a monster. Yes, it's dangerous, but there's a chance for us to defend ourselves and await further developments. Lumian inferred that the same fog enshrouded Fourth Epic Trier, drawing from the fog around the Samaritan Women's Spring and the lingering shadows of significant figures from the Fourth Epic. It emanated from Mr. Fool's powers. Franca wasted no time and nodded decisively. Okay. Jenna chose to trust her two companions without delving into questions. At that moment, Anthony Reed had finished clearing the battlefield and approached with the spoils. Chapter 481 The Thing in the Suitcase Anthony Reed clutched the items salvaged from General Phillips' lifeless form, wrapping them in a torn cloak. He avoided direct contact, a cautious move as he moved forward. Found these, he began to explain, but Lumian swiftly cut him off. Clear and rapid, Lumian outlined their plan, we're heading to the outskirts of the city enveloped by the Grey Fog. Wanna come with us? Anthony Reed's eyelids twitched. Okay. He knew going solo could mean a swift demise, especially if the terrifying roar echoed again. Lumian wasn't in a hurry to inquire about General Phillips' belongings. Gripping Jenna and Anthony, he signaled Franca to hold onto his collar. A dark light emanated from the black mark on his shoulder as the quartet disappeared, seemingly teleporting to the periphery of the majestic yet crumbling city, just before the thin gray fog. What they saw was where they arrived. Lumian attempted to step into the gray fog, but the seal on his chest remained dormant. Franca and the others could traverse it without his guidance. Resembling a hungry bear, Olsen fixed his gaze on Gardner Martin's head, devoid of its helmet. His brownish-red eyes flickered with a sinister light, pinpointing Martin's vulnerability. In mere seconds, Olsen identified Martin's weakest spot. Even if he couldn't deal a fatal blow, inflicting damage to the party again meant a high chance that the pride armor would betray its wearer and kill him. Silently, Olsen reached into his pocket, retrieving a yellow bullet held between his thumb and index finger. A crimson, nearly white fireball rapidly condensed in his palm, leading to a controlled explosion. The violent shockwave propelled the bullet towards the back of Gardner Martin's head with a thunderous boom. Gardner Martin staggered, narrowly avoiding the bullet. Nearly simultaneously, the surroundings were bathed in the bright and holy sunrise gleam. Black smoke billowed from Olsen's body as if a long-dead zombie had been exposed to the sunlight created by the purifiers. Instinctively, Olsen's eyes closed against the intense light. Meanwhile, Gardner Martin, no longer feeble, donned his helmet with a cold expression and sharp eyes. He ignited, transforming into a blazing white spear of flames, piercing Supervisor Olsen's forehead with a whoosh. Despite Olsen's formidable resistance to scorching flames, his skull suffered charring from the impact. As the flames dissipated, Gardner Martin's figure detached from the burning spear. Clenching his silver-armored fist, he swung it at Olsen's head from midair. As the flames dissipated, Gardner Martin's figure detached from the burning spear. Clenching his silver-armored fist, he swung it at Olsen's head from midair. Olsen's neck snapped, and his head flew up dragging along a bloody spine. Gardner Martin's skull-crushing punch missed, and he landed on the ground once again. However, a heavy and sharp broadsword of light materialized in his other hand at some point, ready for the next phase of the battle. Gardner Martin thrust the broadsword into the blackened soil, unleashing a terrifying storm. Countless light fragments filled the air, creating chaos in the vicinity. The pride armor swiftly condensed the Sword of Dawn again the hurricane of light forming with a much shorter interval than an ordinary sequenced six-dawn paladin. 
Only a minute or two had passed since Gardner Martin last wielded this formidable power. Olsen, reduced to just his head with a brownish-red beard, showed focus in his eyes and attempted to merge with a burning white spear for a hasty retreat. However, the storm arrived, its light engulfing him completely. As the hurricane of light subsided, Olsen's body displayed severe damage, riddled with cracks, some piercing through his chest and tearing internal organs. His severed head, carried by a bloody spine, bore the marks of destruction, eyes and nose obliterated, skull cracked, and blackened brain exposed. Gardner Martin, poised and composed, conjured ten to twenty crimson fireballs. They darted toward Olsen's nearly unconscious head, triggering a resounding explosion that shattered the head into fragments and liquid, splattering on the ground. With a chuckle, Gardner Martin raised his visor, surveying Olsen's headless corpse and the scattered skull. He remarked, I've always found you a little odd. This was a good opportunity to test you. I didn't expect you to really attack me. That's good too. Not only have I eliminated a hidden danger, but I've also counteracted the traitorous curse of the pride armor. Deliberately appearing fine while exposing some problems through the details was meant to bait Olsen, simple acts of vulnerability could easily raise the other party's vigilance and suspicion. With a sigh, Gardner approached the battered suitcase that had fallen to the ground and lifted it, on the verge of shattering. He had long been curious about its contents, as Olsen had always evaded the question. Now, Gardner could finally open it himself. Gardner Martin unlatched the suitcase and opened it in front of him. Inside was a head. The features were unmistakable, deep facial features, brownish-red eyes, slightly disheveled black hair, a few silver strands at the temples, and well-defined facial features. The head which wasn't considered thin was stained with blood. It was Gardner Martin. It was Gardner Martin's own head. Once Lumian and his companions traversed the outermost gray fog, the transition from morning to evening seemed to unfold before them. Darkness enveloped their vision, concealing the black asymmetrical buildings and houses that appeared as if splattered with blood. Everything silently melded into the obscurity. As they advanced, the looming, half-collapsed palace drew nearer. The city bore the brunt of colossal damage, as if a giant had delivered a devastating blow unleashing shockwaves that wreaked havoc on the surroundings. Details eluded Lumian's scrutiny. The lack of sufficient light and the considerable distance obscured the exact nature of the scene. Various houses obstructed their view, and only the excessively tall palace and surrounding structures, despite their partial collapse, allowed them a glimpse of the peripheral city. Let's find a nearby hiding spot, Franca suggested, her gaze scanning the area. She had no intention of venturing deeper into Fourth Epic Trier. The quartet found themselves on a narrow street, where the houses on both sides were so close that occupants could almost shake hands by extending their arms. The structures, resembling victims of a violent earthquake, teetered but refused to collapse, adorned with ghastly cracks. Jenna's attention fixated on a relatively intact house. Iron black in color, it featured an arched window on the left and a square on the right. Dark red graffiti adorned one side, while the other remained clean. Not a single weed grew between the rocks. Apart from the two obvious pots, the house exhibited various asymmetrical details, with centipede-like cracks mainly concentrated on the lower left side. Should we go there? Jenna inquired. Lumian shook his head. The more intact, the higher the likelihood of abnormalities. The current state of Fourth Epic Trier's citizens is unknown. Let's find a completely collapsed building to hide behind. At least, everything inside should be buried. Agreed, Franca concurred with Lumian's decision. In Fourth Epic Trier, she couldn't fully perform magic mirror divination. Lumian and his team swiftly reached the center of the dimly lit street. In a setting that could plunge into darkness at any given moment, they strategically maneuvered around the ruins of a dark red building, seeking cover. It wasn't until now that Anthony Reed seized an opportunity to extract the arrow of the bloodthirsty from his chest, returning it to Jenna. With the dark-stained black cloak spread on the ground, he showcased his findings. 
There were three items in total, the first, a blackened ulna punctuated by dark red holes, resembling a rough bone flute that had been kept in storage for ages. The second, a small wooden box painted in dark hues. Compact enough to fit into a concealed pocket, it featured large holes on both sides veiled by swaying, leather-like curtains. Lastly, a collection of gold, silver, and copper coins. Anthony Reed gestured toward the bone flute and explained, this formed from the convergence of light spots on Philip's Oma. It seems something formless has settled on it. Conspirer or Reaper Beyonder characteristic combined with his Ulma and the power of the deceased boon? Lumian nodded indiscernibly. Philip hadn't had a chance to retaliate before, leaving him uncertain about the general sequence, a sequence 6 Conspirer or a sequence 5 Reaper. What was clear, however, was the general's affiliation with the Hunter Pathway. This deduction was based on the creation of numerous crimson fire ravens, almost white in hue. Moreover, the general wasn't just a sequence seven. If it were the latter, Lumian would have been pleased to obtain the main ingredient for his advancement. The issue lay in the mixture of the power with an evil god's boon, rendering it unsuitable for direct use in potion concoction. What settled on it is the corruption of an evil god. It was a wise choice not to touch it directly, Lumian informed Anthony. Within the underground seal, the power of an evil god's boon couldn't return to its source. This was found on Philip's body. Anthony pointed at the dark wooden box. Before he could finish speaking, another frenzied and violent roar echoed from afar. This time, the four of them, having entered the gray fog, only experienced a slight dizziness and remained unaffected. Chapter 482 Bodies Chasing Heads Franca shook off the dizziness induced by the terrifying roar and sighed from the bottom of her heart. As expected, the gray fog here provides protection. Without it, facing a roar that could harm their spirit body and affect their minds would result in losing control, turning into monsters, or immediate death. Praise the fool! Lumian openly expressed his faith. He then reminded her in an icy tone but the hidden dangers here might be more terrifying than the previous roar. Franca fell silent for a few seconds before speaking in an encouraging tone, hidden dangers are preferable to those that have already surfaced. Let's avoid triggering them. If nothing else occurs, we'll stay in this corner and wait for help. While Jenna and Anthony Reed harbored doubts about the strategy of passivity, they hesitated to venture deep into fourth epic trier and reluctantly accepted the plan that wasn't really a plan. In the eerie silence, Anthony was the first to regain composure. He pointed at the dark wooden box and stated, I'm not sure of its purpose. A simple, temporary touch doesn't seem to have any obvious negative effects. As for the coins, their significance was apparent. A quick glance and rough calculation revealed a total of 312 verldor and 26 copet. Franca leaned against a collapsed pillar in the shadows her eyes fixed on the mysterious dark wooden box. What the hell is this thing? It was obviously no ordinary container, its appearance suggested it held some kind of mysterious power. Lumian and Anthony turned their attention to the demoness of pleasure simultaneously. Lumian chuckled, I should be the one asking you that. Frank exclaimed, there was nothing I could do. I couldn't spare time for spirit channeling, and this place isn't connected to the real spirit world. I can't perform magic mirror divination. To understand the abilities, effects, state, and potential drawbacks of these two items, I'll have to experiment with them myself repeatedly. Of course, if we encounter an artisan, many of our problems might be solved. She gestured towards Jenna, saying, just like the black primordial demoness figurine, it undoubtedly has other functions. For instance, it allows the holder to create mirror substitution. As for mine, apart from providing a certain anti-divination and early warning effect, it can only be used as a supplicant during rituals. They're both figurines, differing only in color and orientation. Why such a significant disparity? Franca avoided mentioning why she didn't employ various methods to gather information about the black primordial demoness figurine. 
the unspoken understanding among the group was clear, in their current situation, ensuring their safety took precedence over risking injury or adverse effects to test their spoils of war. Any mishap could lead to dire consequences, potentially even death in the experiment. As a heavy silence settled among Jenna and the others, Franka sighed inwardly. The black figurine clearly is problematic, and its mysterious origin is intriguing. It explains why the Demonist sect wants me to investigate what Gardner had smuggled in through the underground tunnels. If I hand it over, will the Demonist sect reward me with the affliction potion and pledge assistance for my ritual, or will they choose to silence me? Lumian stroked his chin, addressing Anthony Reed, in that case, keep the Verl door. We'll distribute the remaining spoils of war when we return to the surface. Anthony inquired further, should we wrap it in a cloak and place it on the ground before taking it when we leave? Lumian smiled and gestured at the charred bone flute, otherwise? You can also carry it with you. This way, we might witness the abilities of a deceased. Philip died in a hurry and didn't have time to show us. Of course, judging from his condition at the time of death, the holder of the item will most likely be the recipient of those abilities in the form of a curse. Anthony, unfazed by the mockery, pulled up the blood-stained and tattered black cloak, wrapping it around the bone flute and the small wooden box once more. Lumian, with a thoughtful expression, poked his head out and looked at the abnormally narrow street. If we encounter an enemy we find challenging to handle later, we can consider throwing these two items to him. It might have a miraculous effect. General Philip will be very pleased to know that he would still be of use after death. It might bring about a curse of fate. Despite the tense atmosphere, Lumian's constant mockery of General Philip brought a slight amusement to Jenna. Damn it, General Philip is already dead. There's no need to harp on about him. Before Lumian could respond to Jenna, two tragic screams pierced the air. The cries emanated from the same location, filled with undisguised fear. Soon after, two figures rushed into the narrow street, as if pursuing an unidentified flying object hovering in the air. Franca, alongside Lumian, peer out of the shadows, her expression freezing at the sight. The two figures, a man and a woman, were decapitated, their necks mangled, devoid of any signs of bones. Chasing them were two heads, displaying pure fear and dragging bloody, tail-like spines behind them. One head belonged to a man with puffed-up cheeks resembling a squirrel. He chewed on long, thick black hair that emerged from his dark brown eyes, nostrils, and ears. Similar hair grew from the headless body chasing him, denser and more exaggerated, resembling seaweed. The other head belonged to a beautiful woman with black hair and brown eyes. She flew forward frantically, coughing and shaking out resplendent starlight. Gravel in the surroundings, sent flying by the pursuit, swayed as if in slow motion. Suddenly, the two heads and bodies, about to climb over a collapsed building and exit the narrow street, froze. The heads shook in confusion, attempting to dispel a discomfort. The headless corpses raised their hands, clutching their left chests. In mere seconds, the two heads, with bloody spines trailing behind them, plummeted into the collapsed black house, their bodies crashing onto the stacked rocks. A heavy silence fell upon Lumian and the others. After a few seconds, Lumian scoffed, See, this is what happens when you venture deep into Fourth Epic Trier. Do you suspect their residents of the hostel? Jenna inquired thoughtfully. Lumian replied with a smirk, Otherwise? Where else could you find such fresh heads and bodies in an ancient ruin that's been buried for a millennium or two? This brought back memories of Supervisor Olson. He had been in this state when he first appeared. Now, Lumian was almost certain that Olson was a true monster, with a head and body that could be separated. Franca also recalled Gardner Martin's servants. She withdrew her gaze and pondered for a moment before stating, Why do bodiless heads still cough, as if they're sick? What happened to them at the end seems like a cerebral infarction. The two headless bodies show signs of cardiac arrest. Is this the work of the sick church's evil gods bestowed, or is there another murderer? Right, a sequence 5 of the Demonist pathway is called affliction. It can spread various illnesses, and I can enter this place with the primordial Demonist figurine and the ancient silver mirror. 
this place clearly has a lot to do with the Demonus pathway. Could the high-level power leaking out cause monsters to fall ill and die? Not bad. You still have some intelligence at critical moments, Lumian praised mockingly. Jenna, on the other hand, rejoiced. Fortunately, we didn't venture too deep. Otherwise, who knows when we'd fall ill and die? Lumian smiled at her. Why do you think we're not currently surrounded by disease? But, but we didn't cough. Jenna's voice trailed off as she glanced at the hidden pocket of her clothes. Inside was the pitch-black primordial Demonus figurine. Franca also peered into her pocket, as if she could discern the bone-carved primordial Demonus figurine through the fabric. Anthony turned to Lumian and sought confirmation. Are you suggesting that the fourth Epix Trier is plagued with illnesses, and we're unharmed because we're carrying the two figurines? Lumian spread his hands and said, I believe this explanation makes more sense. Beyond the gray fog, at the edge of the fourth Epix Trier ruins. In the small brown suitcase, Gardner Martin's blood-stained face suddenly opened, revealing Gardner Martin clad in silver armor, reflected in its eyes. It opened its mouth and expelled a blazing white fireball. The distance between them was so close that Gardner Martin couldn't dodge at all. All he could do was lean back, attempting to avoid the target's initial attack. Boom! Gardner Martin was sent flying by the massive explosion. The spiderweb-like crack on the chest of the silver armor shattered, tearing through the skin and flesh below. This strike was akin to hitting Gardner Martin's vital points. Had it not been for the pride armor, which absorbed most of the damage, he would have perished on the spot. However, this meant that the pride armor lost its protection over the chest for a period. Gardner Martin's bloodied head flew up, dragging along a bloody spine. On the other side, Olsen's headless corpse stood up once more. Gardner Martin's head aimed for the empty neck stump and inserted the ghastly white spine. Amidst a cracking sound, this Gardner Martin, seemingly from hell, twisted his neck and smiled sinisterly at Gardner Martin, who had already changed positions and condensed a large number of crimson fire ravens that were nearly white. Olsen is long dead. I've been controlling his head and body. In the future, I'll replace you. In the wilderness, the ground trembled violently, and blazing cracks slithered into the distance like fiery serpents. The figures of magician and justice appeared. Chapter 483 Hidden History Dressed in a white shirt with a knot and a beige dress, Magician fixed her gaze upon the menacing hurricane that bridged the gap between sky and earth. Her eyes glittered, as if concealing the vast cosmos. Vermanda Sauron is indeed a Sequence One conqueror. It's no wonder he could influence generations of the Sauron family after losing control and going underground. It's no wonder the Sauron family, once a royal lineage, swiftly declined, magician mused, sighing. Justice, inquisitive, asked, I wonder how the former leader of the secret order, Zeratul, and Emperor Roselle played a role in Vermanda Sauron losing control and entering the fourth epic trier. The Sauron branch, wielding grade zero sealed artifacts, obstinately believes that they harmed Vermanda, causing the conqueror to lose control. The former even left a prophecy to mislead generations of Sauron family members. Magician chuckled and replied, Based on the information Lumian gathered and my research into the seal, the issue deep within Red Swan Castle's underground maze doesn't seem like something Zeratul or Emperor Roselle could create. Only a weather warlock and a conqueror can resonate abnormally with Fourth Epic Trier day after day, creating dangerous changes in corresponding places. Zeratul and Emperor Roselle likely exploited the problems that Red Swan Castle and Vermanda Sauron already had. While she spoke, the Tarot Club's major arcana card holder shifted her gaze away from the hurricane sweeping through the world and focused on Fourth Epic Trier, veiled in a thin gray fog. The starlight in her eyes remained, as if she sought something to pinpoint her next target. She didn't abruptly halt and engage in conversation at a crucial moment. Justice nodded in agreement and remarked, if it were me, I wouldn't venture further into Trier after becoming an angel to minimize the abnormal influence the underground might have on me. Vermanda Sauron disregarded hidden dangers and stayed in Red Swan Castle for an extended period. 
he must have had a strong desire for something in Fourth Epic Trier. Didn't the Sauron family construct the White Maple Palace outside Trier? Previously, Vermana's royal family resided there and rarely returned to Trier. Magician brought up the fact that the Sauron family was aware of the issue before adding, Zeridal likely played a significant role in Vermanda Sauron's situation. As you know, he is an archangel of the Seer Pathway. Without his assistance, it wouldn't have been easy for Vermanda Sauron, even as a conqueror, to create a leak in the seal. He entered Fourth Epic Trier after losing control. Back then, the seal's effects weren't as potent as they were a few years ago. There was no need for modifications. Justice pondered for a moment and said, What I'm more curious about is who designed the hostile ritual. Their use of mysticism similarities and loopholes resembles that of high-level seer, apprentice, or marauder beyonders. Or perhaps they have had long interactions with these high-level beyonders and were adept at learning. Perhaps the corresponding pathway of the deceased excels in this as well. Perhaps it's secretly influenced by that celestial worthy, or perhaps that entity wants to use the temporary opening of the seal to do something. As you know, the Iron and Blood Cross Order used to believe in him. It's too easy for him to mislead us, Magician mused, uncertain of the right answer. Starlight flickered in her eyes, she found it challenging to observe and determine the situation in the thin grey fog. As Magician scrutinized Fourth Epic Trier, she informed Justice, the level of the catacomb seal corresponds to this location. At its heart lies the Samaritan Women's Spring, where Blood Emperor Alista Tudor met his end. The raised Imperial Palace and its surroundings harbor diverse dangers. The lingering divine power is unimpressive and consumable. Sigh, every time I bring up something of this sort, it feels like I should adopt a more vulgar vocabulary. Only then can I truly capture my sentiments about the Blood Emperor's lunacy. Hence, you won't unearth anything significant from here. Only upon approaching will you discern that Mr. Fool's gray fog has grown denser, thicker, and more palpable. The catacombs' fourth and third levels correspond to fourth epic trier, excluding that specific area. Corruption and divine power still linger abundantly. Navigating certain areas demands adherence to specific rules. Otherwise, even angels may meet their demise. The two levels above the catacombs correlate with the wilderness beyond the gray fog. Humans can traverse them to a certain extent, but with Vermanda Sauron lingering, the danger rivals that of the fourth epic trier. Just as Magician concluded her words, a frenzied and terrifying roar echoed from the area where the weather had dramatically shifted. The formless flames that illuminated the surroundings and shrouded the entire sky seemed to be influenced, coalescing into a massive vortex. Within the vortex, shapeless and translucent flames descended from above, striking the wilderness like a colossal sword that pierced through heaven and earth. Amidst this chaos, the ground quaked even more violently. Fiery crevices extended further towards Fourth Epic Trier, concealed within the gray fog. Magician remained unperturbed as she observed the splendid yet dilapidated city for a while. Then, she said to Justice, let's enter. Justice tersely acknowledged, offering no objections. Both of them tacitly avoided mentioning Vermanda Sauron, an archangel who had lost control, a conqueror. They had no intention of joining the battle or seizing the Beyonder characteristic. For them, the Tarot Club's primary goal in this matter was to prevent the evil gods bestowed from approaching the innermost seal, ensuring they couldn't leak the danger within which would affect Trier above ground and the entire world. Furthermore, they sought the lost minor arcana card holders to guide them out. As for the Conqueror Beyonder characteristic, symbolizing an archangel in Sequence 1, as long as it didn't fall into the hands of heretics, obtaining it wasn't a particularly grave issue for anyone. Magician didn't mind observing and, if the opportunity arose, pilfering the gains. However, she wasn't a high-level beyonder of the Marauder pathway capable of dividing herself and participating in every battlefield. Despite achieving a similar effect by moving back and forth, she had to respect Mr. Fool's gray fog and the core seal of Fourth Epic Trier. Corresponding restrictions were undoubtedly in place. Starlight blossomed, and Magician and Justice vanished. The thin gray fog enshrouding Fourth Epic Trier undulated. As soon as Gardner Martin's head, 
nestled over Olson's headless corpse, finished speaking. A multitude of blazing white fireballs materialized around him, hurtling towards Gardner Martin, who had suffered a chest wound. In the midst of the rumbling explosion, Gardner Martin's figure in the silver armor suddenly vanished. After the shockwave subsided, he reappeared in a corner of the ruins. Then, he witnessed the other emerge with the blazing white flaming spear, which burrowed into the thin gray fog and disappeared into the randomly scattered buildings of 4th Epic Trier. Gardner Martin's pupils constricted, and he was about to give chase when a violent and furious roar echoed from afar. His entire body froze. Blood vessels beneath the visor on his face appeared, dark red as if flowing with flames. Instinctively, Gardner Martin turned and prepared to sprint towards the distant apocalypse-like hurricane. The space between his eyebrows twitched, and a faint red dot appeared. Gardner Martin finally regained control of himself. He took a deep breath and returned to normal. He gazed in the direction the other M had fled and muttered in a self-deprecating tone, were those harsh words and all-out attacks meant to make it easier for him to escape? As expected of me. Do you realize that failing to assassinate me means staying here means I'll inevitably kill you? As Gardner Martin muttered to himself, he produced a canister made of dark glass, its liquid a green hue reminiscent of grass. He unscrewed the cap and downed half the canister. The wound on his chest began to heal at a visible rate. It was a healing agent concocted by a madam of the night's talkers, obtained by Gardner Martin through Philip. Philip, who had united numerous evil god cults, had no shortage of similar items, but under the hurricane of light, the fragile canister shattered. After stowing away the remaining half canister of the agent, Gardner Martin, clad in silver white full body armor, ventured into the thin gray fog in Fourth Epic Trier. In the cover of a narrow street, behind a collapsed building, Franca hissed in agreement with Lumian's conjecture. That's right. This is a true relic from a divine war, and it's even more dangerous. It's entirely possible that the entire city is riddled with ailments. She suspected that the closer she got to the place where Blood Emperor Lista Tudor had met his end, the more peculiar and horrifying the ailments became. Some seemed to have sprouted from the decaying corpses of deities. Ignoring low sequence beyonders whose bodies didn't fundamentally differ from ordinary humans, even saints and angels would likely succumb to the disease and perish. Franca paused for a moment before suggesting to Jenna, why don't you give the black figurine to Anthony for safekeeping? It might be dangerous for you to hold it, and he can use that item to create his own mirror substitution, effectively increasing his chances of survival. Franca couldn't shake the feeling that it wasn't a wise decision for a female demoness like Jenna to possess a primordial demoness figurine, whether it was the genuine article or the mirrored version. Without waiting for Jenna's response, Lumian spoke in a deep voice, it's better if Jenna holds it. She has the lucky gold coin. That's true. Just as Franca finished speaking, she suddenly heard a chime not far away. It resembled the bell of a bicycle, yet it was clearer and rang out for a longer duration. Chapter 484 Mockery Franca wasn't surprised at all, even though she wondered why so many things were happening in this damn place. This was Fourth Epic Trier. Even if it wasn't a land of a fallen god, it wouldn't lack abnormalities. Lumian and the others cautiously emerged from their concealment peering from different vantage points toward the source of the chimes. The location wasn't distant, yet the fog in that direction seemed unusually dense. The structures loomed faintly, as though just a fragment of history had materialized. Within the fog's depths, a contraption reminiscent of a steam locomotive glided by without a fuss. It sported only two carriages, lacking a smokestack. Peculiar frames extended from the top, linking it to something suspended in midair. Ding ding ding. The train ventured into a zone of even thicker fog, disappearing from view. Although Franca and her companions couldn't discern the details clearly, an unexplained dread seized them, akin to standing on the precipice or treading on blades piercing their skin. Before they could contemplate the ramifications of the fog's metamorphosis and the arrival of these peculiar objects, their surroundings plunged into a profound darkness. Dusk gave way, and night loomed. A dense fog cloaked the area. 
Lumian, sensing an unsettling disturbance, yearned to evade it, but the abnormal fog, tainted with a dark hue, obstructed any attempt to teleport to an unaffected area. Beyond the fog, the wilderness they came from eluded his senses. The cold fog permeated their skin, prompting involuntary shivers from Franca and Jenna. Almost simultaneously, the narrow street came alive with the flickering of candle flames and oil lamps. Laughter, cries, and voices erupted, transforming the once silent surroundings. Fourth Epic Trier burst into vibrant life, resonating with clamor in the pulsations of existence. Anthony, without conscious thought, surveyed the diverse houses and narrow streets, catching sight of an asymmetrical, pitch-black building. Candlesticks dangled from above, casting light upon the figure standing at the window. The figure donned a black bonnet, with one side sunken and the other protruding. Dark clothes adorned him, with buttons haphazardly fastened, and a smooth wound diagonally sliced his body from shoulder to waist. Evidently caused by a sharp broadsword. In that moment, the man's diagonally cleaved body resembled a child's stacked building blocks, not properly assembled. He nonchalantly nibbled at a meat pie, chewed morsels falling from the wound to the ground, yet he remained oblivious. Additional figures emerged in other habitable houses. Some appeared like melted candles that had solidified once more, their flesh viscous and indistinct. Others had pale white skin, and greasy white feathers sprouted from their pores, oozing yellowish pus. Some had tiny holes in their bodies, with black insects flying in and out. There were those reduced to white skeletons, with only a mismatched human skin mask covering their faces. Some had degenerated into black shadows, as if burned. On the narrow street, a yellow, blue, and red sphere, about half the height of an adult human, rolled forward. An inverted clown, dressed in exaggerated clothes, stood atop it. The clown's ears were unlike those of a human, dog-like and slightly pointed. Dark gray hair covered his red-yellow painted face. These are the long-dead citizens of Fourth Epic Trier? Lumian's eyelids twitched. He, Franca, and the others also observed the bloodstained faces and cold expressions of these figures. Very similar, very similar to those mirror people. Franca muttered to herself before exclaiming in horror, could the Grey Fog's transformation have transported us to the Fourth Epic Trier in the mirror? The citizens of Fourth Epic Trier in reality are dead, but the ones in the mirror are still alive? Before she could finish, Lumian and Anthony's gazes turned toward her and Jenna. Could it be that it's the problem with those two things again? Franca's scalp tingled as she said, did they cause us to be devoured by the mirror's Fourth Epic Trier after the Grey Fog transformed? That's not it. I believe it's a universal abnormality. Apart from a few special individuals who enter this place, they all arrive in the mirror ruins after being enveloped by the expanding gray fog. Lumian observed the narrow street brimming with vitality, pondering for a moment. The most likely possibility is that the two figurines triggered Fourth Epic Trier, causing changes like the gray fog's expansion. Jenna fell silent for a moment before frowning. But we've been here for a while. Why did something only happen now? We didn't do anything just now. That's right. Franca suddenly realized. Those hostile residents must have triggered something while wandering around after their entry. As soon as Franca finished speaking, a hoarse and terrified shout echoed nearby. Help! Save me! Lumian and his companions turned their attention toward the voice and witnessed a man in a black formal suit, his hair neatly combed like a prominent figure's secretary, sprinting down the narrow street. His face was marred by abscesses, oozing mucus. Occasionally, he turned his head 180 degrees, his eyes filled with fear as if a formless and terrifying entity pursued him. Save me! Amidst his cries, the man's body suddenly froze and he involuntarily retreated. His retreat accelerated until he lifted off. Ah! Amidst intense screams, he plunged into the dense gray fog and the shadowy buildings. In the next moment, the voice abruptly ceased, and silence enveloped that area. Lumian and the others' hearts pounded with a strong sense of danger. 
despite the man in the black suit not being an ordinary person, suspected to be the bestowed of an evil god from the order of all extinction or the sick church, and having been corrupted by this place to a certain extent, allowing him to turn his head 180 oh, Lumian, Anthony, and their companions still felt the terror lurking in the depths of the grey fog. It was as if they could already envision themselves being dragged into the grey fog and vanishing. However, at that moment, they had no idea what to do or how to hide. Dense black grey fog surrounded the suspected mirror ruins, and unknown dangers loomed in the shadows, quietly approaching. At that moment, Termoboros's majestic voice resonated in Lumian's ears, Keep running until you reach that pillar. Don't stop on the way. Don't turn back. Don't teleport. Don't pull your companions. Isn't. Isn't that the direction where the monster was devoured? If we take the initiative to approach, wouldn't we be sending ourselves as food to its doorstep? Lumian grappled with uncertainty, unsure if Termoboros had sensed real danger and planned to intervene or if he was exploiting the opportunity to advance his own agenda. You can choose not to believe it, Termoboros's deep voice added. Despite his suspicions, Lumian's gaze remained fixed on the spot where the evil god bestowed's figure had been devoured. Deep within the gray fog, amidst looming, collapsed, and towering buildings, a hazy black pillar stretched into the sky. Suddenly, Lumian recalled something. At the entrance of the fourth level of the catacombs, Chrismona Knight Pillar. As for Chrismona, she was a high ranking demoness who had perished during the War of the Four Emperors and Fourth Epic Trier. She was even a child of God, a true child of the primordial demoness. This place is suspected to be the mirror's fourth epic trier. Lumian surveyed the surroundings and saw that the situation elsewhere was similar. He gritted his teeth and said, Let's move forward. To the black pillar. The sense of danger intensified, pushing Lumian to make a decisive gamble. Move forward. Franca, Jenna, and Anthony were brimming with questions about Lumian's choice. Everyone had witnessed the chilling fate of the man in the formal suit. Lumian stood tall and declared in a commanding voice, Jenna, carry the spoils of war. Don't stop, don't turn around, and don't pull any of our companions. Upon finishing his sentence, he darted out of his hiding spot. Given the specificity of Lumian's instructions, Franca cast a glance at him and chose to trust his judgment. Jenna tightened her grip on the lucky gold coin, hoisted the cloak containing the spoils of war, and followed suit. Anthony, having exacted his revenge, harbored no regrets or obsessions. Lumian had proven his correctness multiple times, so he didn't question him and trailed closely. Thud. 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 The quartet sprinted down the narrow street, passing by the inverted clown, who rolled forward on the ball at a deliberate pace. They plunged into the depths of the gray fog, heading towards the black pillar. In a corner of Fourth Epic Trier, in front of a black iron like house adorned with a red pattern, a wilderness overgrown with weeds had been condensed to the size of an ordinary square. Within a dark red open carriage in the wilderness, Lady Moon, draped in a loose white robe and a light colored veil, queried Madame Puales, who stood beside her, What's wrong? Madame Puales, dressed in black with her head covered by her right hand, replied, I can hear my child crying again. Lady Moon nodded gently and offered reassurance, that's unavoidable. Rest here and catch up when you've recovered. Are you sure you can handle it alone? Madame Puales's facial muscles twitched and distorted intermittently. Lady Moon smiled and responded, my child left me a gift. Don't worry. She didn't consider Madame Knight to be of much help in this matter. Madame Knight could enter because she needed to stay at the Sacred Heart Cloister to draw attention and couldn't remain in the hostel. All right, Madame Puali said regretfully. After Lady Moon's carriage and the wilderness departed, Madame Knight's expression quickly returned to normal. Lady Moon's carriage, pulled by two demon-like creatures, advanced for a while before the gray fog thickened and expanded. Her eyes narrowed as a blood-stained umbilical cord materialized in her hand. The umbilical cord emitted a brilliant golden sunlight, warding off all corrosion and influence. Thus, Lady Moon successfully reached the periphery of the land of a fallen god. The grey fog here stood as dense as a wall. 
Attempting to approach, she found herself blocked, akin to an ordinary person encountering an impenetrable barrier. Lady Moon felt a compelling force but couldn't proceed any further. She whispered in surprise and confusion, how could this be? As she pondered to herself, Lady Moon surveyed her surroundings. Suddenly, her gaze froze. On the surface of a nearby half-collapsed palace-like structure, a flamboyant red color seized the wall, outlined in a bloody state. Didn't anyone tell you that there's another seal here? Chapter 485 Night Pillar The intensifying gray fog at the core that spread to every corner of Fourth Epic Trier didn't phase Gardner Martin, wrapped in sleek silver-white full-body armor. Instead of alarm, delight surged within him. Since the invasion of the power from Building 13 on Avenue du Marque, and being able to hear the great voice, such scenes had frequented his dreams. It felt like returning home, the door wide open for him. Without hesitation, Gardner Martin sprinted toward the heart of Fourth Epic Trier, heading for the land of the fallen god. Through a street so narrow that the residents in the houses on both sides could almost reach out and shake hands, Lumian and his companions sprinted forward. After only a dozen steps, Lumian sensed an intangible force emanating from the pitch-black gray fog. It was like the countless arms of a terrifying entity, gently and methodically caressing every living being to determine its prey. Lumian's scalp tingled. Even with his clothes providing cover, goosebumps erupted where the formless entity touched him. Instinctively, he wanted to resist, but then he remembered Termoboros's words. Don't stop. Don't turn back. Don't teleport. Don't pull your companions. While this didn't explicitly mention resisting, defending, or attacking, Lumian felt it wise to observe and wait for developments. Suppressing the urge to incinerate the formless entities, he compelled himself to move forward. Jenna, by his side, and Franca and Anthony behind him, closely monitored Lumian. If he didn't act, neither did they. If he did, they would quickly follow suit. Observing Lumian refraining from confronting the formless entity in the dim gray fog, they braced themselves, enduring the intense and danger-filled caresses. In the midst of this, Franca found the formless object somewhat familiar. Recalling the suspicion that this place was the mirror's fourth epic trier, closely linked to the Demonus pathway, she quickly had an answer. It bore a striking resemblance to a Demonus of Pleasure's spider silk. Could it be left behind by a high-level Demonus? Franca imagined a scene, a colossal pitch-black, half-human spider, nestled silently in the depths of the gray fog, extending spider silk that seemed to possess a life of its own, attempting to locate and capture its prey. After covering more than ten steps in a sprint, Lumian was pleasantly surprised to notice the formless entity slowly retracting. It no longer actively caressed him, but given their dense presence, occasional brushes or touches were inevitable. This change appeared to be a response to his proactive approach towards the source of the formless entities. These formless entities seemed to single out those attempting to escape. Upon breaking free from the narrow street and delving into the thick gray fog, Lumian suddenly felt his hair stand on end, a chilling sensation running down his spine. His intuition warned of immense danger ahead, a threat capable of obliterating them all. The consequences of getting closer were beyond imagination. Franca and the others involuntarily slowed down. The horror felt palpable, like a loaded revolver pressed against their foreheads, poised to fire at any moment. Lumian clenched his teeth and pressed on. Having chosen to trust Termoboros's advice, he needed to endure until there was evidence to the contrary. Otherwise, he might as well do something else from the beginning. He didn't halt, and Jenna and the others didn't dare to either. They resembled fools aware of an impending cliff, understanding their insignificance, yet choosing to rush forward, like an idiot. At that moment, Lumian caught sight from the corner of his eye of black flames erupting over Jenna's body. Pain etched her face, fear mirrored in her eyes. Crack! Jenna shattered like a mirror, only to reappear, still engulfed in black flames and frost. Her eyes pleaded with Lumian. Instinctively, Lumian raised his left hand, as if to aid Jenna. However, a brief moment of hesitation swept over him, 
and he withdrew his hand, fixing his gaze ahead. Don't pull companions. Despair, surprise, and resentment filled Jenna's eyes instantly. She coughed and came to a standstill. Swiftly ensnared by the formless entities, she was dragged deeper into the gray fog. Franca, witnessing this, had an immediate change in expression, ready to offer assistance when Lumian's instructions flashed through her mind. She hesitated. In that moment, Jenna's expression transformed into one of pure hatred, blood seeping from the pores on her face. A shrill scream escaped her lips, akin to a curse echoing towards everyone. Seeing this, Lumian and the others experienced a strange sense of relief. This Jenna seemed more like a mirror person. Amidst the shrill scream, Jenna vanished into the depths of the gray fog, her voice abruptly silenced. Almost simultaneously, Lumian caught Jenna in his peripheral vision, sprinting beside him with an anxious and nervous expression. As expected, Lumian roughly comprehended why Termoboros had cautioned against pulling companions. In this realm, a companion could seamlessly switch with their mirror counterpart at any moment. Assisting the mirror person risked harm to their true companion, leading to complete assimilation into this place, becoming food for the entity at the source of the formless objects. Damn it. Couldn't you be more explicit? These reasons aren't particularly intricate. You insist on us experiencing them ourselves and overcoming them. Cursing Termoboros inwardly, Lumian pressed on with even more determination. In the subsequent encounters, similar challenges arose multiple times. Yet, armed with experience, they refrained from resisting or attempting escape. They resisted the impulse to aid their companions. Lumian and the others, focused on their path, ran straight using the Black Pillar as a guide. Occasionally, they bypassed obstacles. Finally, the Black Pillar loomed not far ahead. Simultaneously, Lumian, Anthony, and the rest were astonished to find that the imminent danger, on the verge of colliding with them, had mysteriously vanished. No, it hadn't disappeared. It was now behind Lumian and the group, distant. Running toward danger results and moving away from it. Just like the pale black stone brick area in the wilderness, the direction here is twisted and chaotic. Amid Lumian's surprise, he didn't glance back, nor did he pause to celebrate. He persisted, sprinting toward the black pillar. Had he not set a resolute example, Franca and Jenna might have turned around. Nonetheless, they pressed forward, a sense of relief mingling with lingering fear. After covering dozens of meters, the quartet reached the square where the black pillar stood. The ground was paved with pale black stone bricks, and numerous grayish-white stone pillars lay in ruins, only a few remnants remaining. Compared to the black pillars, these surviving grayish-white stone pillars were as inconspicuous as ants. The colossal black pillar surpassed even the Chrismona Knight Pillar Lumian had witnessed on the third level of the catacombs. It stretched into the sky, seeming to burn with formless flames, its destination shrouded in mystery. The scene brought to Lumian's mind the pale black stone bricks in the wilderness outside and the numerous grayish-white stone pillars in the vicinity, but nothing akin to the black pillar. Had the night pillar in the wilderness collapsed and been destroyed? Did that event lead to the old bones crawling out, causing the corruption in Building 13 on Avenue du Marquet? Was it then mended by constructing the catacombs and relocating countless corpses? Lumian ventured a guess based on these thoughts. Franca and Jenna surveyed the square ahead, observing that the area surrounding the black pillar had sunk into the ground. Below, there seemed to be white magma flowing, and faint black tentacles lurked. Though there were no explicit warnings of danger, Lumian and the others sensed that this might be even more dangerous than the entity they had previously encountered. Next to the black pillar stood a 1.78 meter tall snowman. Its frosty face, cracked to form eyes, nose, and mouth, lacked ears. As Lumian's gaze nonchalantly swept across the snowman, it abruptly froze. He noticed a dark stain on the snowman's right eye, as if it wore a monocle. Amon? Lumian startled, a desire to flee taking hold. At that moment, Termoboros's majestic voice echoed in his ears. It's dead. Dead. Lumian breathed a sigh of relief. It made sense. 
Amon, a nobleman of the Fourth Epic's Tudor Empire, wouldn't be exempt from the casualties of the Divine War. It was plausible that dozens, even hundreds of avatars perished back then. Retrieving them might not have been feasible in the circumstances. For some reason, Lumian detected a trace of joy in Termoboros's concise words. Observing the snowman, Anthony suddenly felt his forehead heat up, and his breath turned hot. His spirit body rapidly weakened. I'm infected, he calmly informed his companions. Ailment. Lumian glanced at the black pillar again. Could this be the true form of the Chrismonite pillar? Even the figurine of the primordial Demonis can't stem the corruption of ailments in this place? Franca's heart skipped a beat as she instructed Jenna, take out that figurine. Simultaneously, she reached into her pocket and pulled out the primordial Demonis figurine crafted from bone. After Jenna handed her the black one, Franca motioned for Anthony to come closer and observed his expression. How do you feel now? It seems better. I'm... I'm getting better. Anthony scrutinized his physical condition earnestly. Franca smiled. I knew it. How could Jenna and I be fine, but you're sick? Looks like we have to maintain a certain distance from the figurines. As soon as she finished speaking, blazing white fire ravens soared out from behind the black pillar, hurtling toward them. Then, a figure emerged. It was Gardner Martin, attired in a black formal suit and yellow vest, an unusual sight. His gaze fixed on the black figurine in Jenna's hand and the bone statue in Franca's, revealing a longing expression. Chapter 486 The Mirror People's Conspiracy As the blazing white fire ravens erupted from behind the black pillar, Lumian's reflexes kicked in. While Franca, engrossed in deciphering the cause of Anthony's ailment, Lumian seemingly engaged in the discussion. Yet, beneath the facade, he, a hunter, maintained a vigilant stance, keenly aware of his surroundings. In this dangerous and ominous setting, he couldn't afford to focus solely on conversation. Lumian thrust his palms towards the oncoming blazing white fire ravens. In a swift motion, a colossal crimson fireball materialized, hastily intercepting the impending assault. However, before it could reach its target, the unstable structure caused it to detonate. Amidst the explosive chaos, a shockwave, laced with flames, surged forward and sideways, engulfing nearly all the blazing white fire ravens like a torrent. Confronting the fiery wave head-on, the fire raven staggered, losing stability in the storm. They prematurely blossomed, transforming into a dazzling display of fireworks. The fire ravens circling from the side were also affected by the explosive waves, deviating from their intended trajectories or being partially extinguished. Hunters, particularly those at higher sequences like Pyromaniac and Conspirer, proved unparalleled in defending against the swarm attacks of fire ravens. Thanks to this interference, Franca and Jenna, both assassins, along with the psychiatrist, Anthony Reed, effortlessly dodged the tracking capable, blazing white fire ravens. They observed as these dangerous projectiles landed on the ground, setting off fiery eruptions. In the blink of an eye, Franca vanished, and Jenna swiftly moved toward the nearest grayish white stone pillar. She scattered fluorescent powder and chanted the invisibility incantation in Hermes. Anthony, seemingly back in the fray, rolled and sprinted, encircling another relatively intact grayish-white stone pillar in an attempt to find cover. Lumian maintained his position, hands poised to push forward. His golden-black hair swirled in the ordinary gust of wind that followed the massive fireball's explosion. Looking at Gardner Martin, unusually tall and face marked with bloodstains, Lumian taunted, Is this your way of greeting? Sending a swarm of fire ravens to welcome us? Hey, what's with the change in appearance and the missing armor? Are you the mirror's Gardner Martin? Gardner Martin, donned in a black formal suit and yellow vest, ceased his attack. Instead, he paused and sneered, sooner or later, I'll become the real Gardner Martin. Observing the situation, Lumian didn't rush to teleport behind Gardner Martin. He chuckled and remarked, so, you're admitting to being a counterfeit? His aim was to provoke and incite the other party, unraveling the motives of these mirror people. 
Surely, their purpose wasn't merely to replace genuine forms and return to the real world for a serene life. It had to be one of the objectives, but not the sole or primary one. The actions of a mirror person were too intricate for such a straightforward motive. Mirror gardener Martin scanned Lumian's surroundings, as if seeking the invisible Franca and Jenna. In response to Lumian's mockery, he sneered and stated, Counterfeit? We, the counterfeits, might be the only ones to secure victory and survive. Look at the fourth epic trier, destroyed and reduced to ruins. Yet, it persists within the mirror. All its citizens remain alive. You call that living? Lumian Lumian refrained from interrupting the mirror gardener's resentful narrative. The formidable beyonder with a peculiar form chuckled. Counterfeit? Countless members of the Iron and Blood Cross Order you usually encounter are already on our side. They've emerged from the mirror, spawned since the unexpected seal incident decades ago and the ensuing power leak. We've been covertly engaging in similar activities. Otherwise, how would Gardner Martin, Tony Twain, and Deist have known about Vermanda Sauron's underground entrance into the seal? How would they have recognized it as a sequence one conqueror beyond her characteristic? How could they have been so focused on exploring the underground and inadvertently influenced, dot? Lumian was taken aback. So, this involves the plans of your mirror people? Damn it, how many factions are entangled in this, and how many conspiracies are woven together? While Gardner's words in the mirror shed light on the murky situation, making many details more plausible, Lumian still found it absurd. Aren't there too many factions and conspiracies? And behind these conspiracies, even more conspiracies, as intricate as spiderwebs. Mirror Gardner's expression returned to normal as he smiled and said, Ever wonder how the Iron and Blood Cross Order discovered the Black Figurine? How did they realize they could exploit the uniqueness of this mirror world to bypass the seal? Do you dare to keep carrying that figurine? It holds no practical value for you. Why not hand it over to me, and I'll let you leave this mirror world? Don't worry, you're not Gardner Martin. I can't replace you. I harbor no insurmountable malice towards you. So, were the fire ravens from earlier merely a greeting? Lumian laughed and inquired, essentially, that figurine holds great value for you? What do you people intend to do with it? Lumian suspected that the Iron and Blood Cross Order's discovery or acquisition of the Black Primordial Demonus figurine was orchestrated by these Mirror people. Their plan was undoubtedly intricate. Mirror Gardner's lips curled as he replied, Did you think I'd tell you? Whom do you people serve? Lumian interjected. As the Mirror Gardener's mouth opened, his expression suddenly darkened, and his eyes brimmed with hatred. That's all the answers. Observing the Mirror Gardener's sudden shift, Lumian had a profound realization that these Mirror people could maintain normalcy most of the time and seamlessly replace the originals. However, when certain matters arose, they couldn't suppress their monstrous side. Mirror Gardener seemed poised to convince Lumian and the others to surrender the black primordial Demonus figurine when a figure materialized behind him. Franca, lacking an assassin suit, revealed a hidden blade from her left wrist. Enveloped in black flames, she thrust it into Mirror Gardener's back, causing the blood-stained figure to shatter like a mirror. He reappeared on the other side of the black pillar, on the fringe of the collapsed area, wearing a sinister smile. He declared, you're stalling for time and completing preparations. Me too. As he finished speaking, a man emerged from the debris of a crumbled grayish-white stone pillar outside the collapsed area, dripping with magma. His face bore bloodstains too, and his short flaxen-colored hair, along with slightly thick brown eyebrows, framed aqua-blue eyes and thin lips. Despite his unremarkable appearance, he uncannily resembled Franca. Witnessing this figure, a phrase flashed through Franca's mind, it's over. It was her past self, her former identity as a man. Ever since Franca began suspecting that this area represented the mirror's fourth epic trier, she harbored concerns that her past self would surface, exposing his true identity to Jenna. Now, her fears materialized. It's over. Social death. Franca's mind raced as a woman emerged from behind another intact grayish-white stone pillar. Adorned in a white shirt, 
a black vest, and dark pants, her pure black hair cascading over her shoulders, she exuded an imposing beauty. Despite her deep and delicate facial features, her blue eyes betrayed a sense of mockery. Ah, the, this is eerily similar to Seal. The mirror version of him is a woman? Franca swiftly scanned her surroundings, concealing herself again. Behind different grayish-white stone pillars, two more figures emerged. One donned mercenary attire, with handsomely styled flaxen-colored hair, reminiscent of Jenna. The other wore military green tops and bottoms, exuding a mature charm with a slightly plump figure. Beautiful with eyes as deep as an ancient forest pond. Damn it. A male version of Jenna and a female version of Anthony. Anthony looks even more handsome and charming. This is different from the mirror world outside. Franca felt puzzled yet relieved. This could provide a plausible explanation for his former appearance to resurface. Lumian, equally perplexed by his mirror counterpart having a different gender, and the others weren't experiencing the same thing as Franca. Even if the mirror reflected their past selves, it shouldn't manifest like this. If this was a fusion of a demonist mirror world, the stacking of feminization, and one's past, Jenna should be a woman, no matter what. As Lumian's thoughts raced, he considered the Hunter Pathway's ability to transform women into men, which was adjacent to the Demonist Pathway. Could it be that this mirror world is influenced by the Blood Emperor's corpse or residual divine power? Is it akin to Mr. Fool and the Celestial worthy of heaven and earth for blessings, a power controlling these two pathways leaked, forming a unique mirror world that causes an overall reversal? Lumian didn't delve too deeply into it as Mirror Gardener and his four helpers attacked. The mirror person in a black formal suit and yellow vest didn't conceal his hatred, excitement, and desire. In the wilderness, the entire ground seemed to sink two to three meters. Deest's massive iron soldiers and yellowish-skinned giant entourage stood at the edge of the hurricane. Occasionally, one of them would self-destruct, reducing to fragments. Despite the wary standoff between the President of the Iron and Blood Cross Order and Snarner Einhorn, they directed their attention to the mildly intelligent monster that appeared to have lost control and was more challenging to deal with. In the intense battle, they managed to restrain or knock Vermanda Sauron to the ground two or three times, but they themselves were also affected, in a dire state that hindered them from seizing the opportunity. In the current moment, they found themselves temporarily disabled. Suddenly, a surge of knowledge materialized into a beautiful woman wearing a brown captain's coat, with long chestnut hair and eyes resembling the blue sea. Snarner, Deest, and the others' hearts tightened, fearing that the newcomer would take the initiative and ultimately claim the conqueror beyond her characteristic. They all recognized the woman, the eldest daughter of the deceased Emperor Roselle, Bernadette Gustav. She, too, was an angel. Holding a pale golden lamp, Bernadette observed the angel's battle without direct involvement. Transforming into a torrent of knowledge once again, she surged towards the gray fog-shrouded fourth epic trier. It was as if she had casually glanced at them while passing by. Dot. Snarner and Deest were initially taken aback by her actions, but they swiftly regained their composure and resumed their battle. Chapter 487, Self-Confrontation In fourth epic trier, shrouded in a dense gray fog, Voisin Sanson, with thick blonde locks, a well-kept beard, and deep-set features, yielded to the whims of destiny. He threaded through the chaotic streets, drawing nearer to the faintly discernible Grand Palace. Abruptly, the stone slab beneath his feet shattered, and with swift precision, a skeletal hand shot up, seizing his ankle. At the same instant, a knight adorned in jet-black armor charged on horseback. Wielding a broadsword ablaze in ghostly white flames, he slashed diagonally at Voisin Sanson. Voisin Sanson's form swiftly morphed into an ethereal state, resilient against the onslaught of the pitch-black knight. However, with the passage of time, it gradually faded until it dissipated entirely. His true self materialized almost twenty meters distant, fixating on the adversary. Beneath the black visor of the night, two dark red flames flickered like candlelight. A grotesque wound, with pale white intestines protruding, adorned its chest and abdomen. 
perched on a desiccated white horse resembling a skeletal corpse, the knight presided over a vast square wilderness. Within this expanse, myriad figures roamed. Some draped in white linen, their faces pallid and vacant. Others reduced to mere skeletons, while some concealed their visages behind masks of white paper. On the fringes of the wilderness, a dark red cradle-shaped carriage advanced, drawn by two abyssal, demon-like creatures boasting goat horns. Seated within the carriage was the regal Madame Puales. Adorned with a flower crown and a green dress, her long brown hair was elegantly tied high. Bright brown eyes gazed forth as she held a small bowl crafted from green jade in one hand and an oak branch entwined with mistletoe in the other. What do you want? Voice in Sanson inquired with a calm, resonant voice. Madame Puales responded, her smile unwavering, revenge, naturally. Her eyes, once warm, gradually turned cold, but the grin on her face endured. Revenge. Voice in Sanson echoed the word, a note of confusion in his voice. After a brief pause, he furrowed his brow and questioned, for Aurora. In that moment, the undead and several death knights scattered across the wilderness withheld their attacks on Voice and Sanson, as if anticipating the emotional release sought by the madam they served. Seated within the carriage, Madame Puales offered a self deprecating smile. For a villain, one sided love is destined to be fleeting. Passion inevitably wanes quickly. Yet, she met her end during that brief period, becoming a thorn lodged deep in my heart, unextractable. The mere thought of it is painful, fueling my anger and resentment. And all of this was caused by you. I desired to strike when we crossed paths earlier, but the circumstances weren't conducive. Lady Moon had yet to make her entrance, and I couldn't afford to delay the Great Mother's affairs for a personal vendetta. But now, in this quiet moment, Voice and Sanson narrowed his eyes. After receiving the Great Mother's boon, Shouldn't these delicate and easily shattered emotions be eradicated? Aren't you worried about undermining the grand objectives of the great entities? Madame Puales chuckled and replied, there are more fitting and potent individuals for that task. Like Lady Moon. As for me. Her expression softened, revealing a trace of wistfulness. In the past, I put my faith in the Great Mother to attain strength and break free from the constraints of the antiquated churches. I didn't have to concern myself with moral judgments or public opinion. No need to fear being attacked by some past victim at any moment, free to do as I pleased. Now, what I desire is vengeance. As Madame Puales concluded her words, a pair of ethereal wings unfolded behind her, adorned with brown feathers of human size. Ah! A sharply discordant and anguished scream escaped her lips. The remaining glass in the nearby structure shattered. Voice in Sanson's mind reverberated, as if he could sense his spirit body wailing. In the rundown square, suspected to be the whereabouts of Chris Mona Knight Pillar, Lumian zeroed in on his feminine mirror self. Only he comprehended the extent of the trouble he posed. He might not be the most formidable presence among the gathering, but his unique skills and array of items could swiftly tip the scales in his favor. It was imperative to neutralize him in advance. As for the mirror version of Gardner Martin, it was suspected that he possessed mirror substitution, proving challenging to dispatch swiftly. Lumian's strategy was to eliminate the auxiliary threats first before zeroing in on him. When the moment arrived, the combined effects of psychiatrists' frenzy, flog strikes, and the arousal triggered by Beatrice's necklace would exploit the psychological vulnerabilities of the mirror people. Their abundance of negative emotions and the potent desire to achieve and supplant made them susceptible. A dark mark on Lumian's shoulder illuminated, and his form abruptly vanished, reappearing behind the heroic-looking female Lumian, similarly attired but with black hair. Almost simultaneously, the blue eyes of the female Lumian gleamed with a mocking glint. Then, she vanished. Her figure materialized behind Anthony Reed mostly concealed by the grayish-white stone pillar. Spirit world traversal. She knew the technique as well. Damn it. Lumian cursed inwardly. The dark mark on his right shoulder emitted another shadowy glow. He had to hurry to his aid. 
While he had considered the possibility of his mirror self possessing teleportation abilities, he had anticipated that the other party would target him, prioritizing his elimination, the most significant threat. At worst, they might exchange positions. However, he hadn't expected the female Lumian to focus on Anthony Reed. In that critical moment, Lumian pieced together the rationale. Primarily, the mirror person harbored an intense resentment toward the original counterpart, driven by a desire to supplant them. Given their profound psychological issues, these could be effectively countered by psychiatrists' frenzy and similar abilities. Secondly, Anthony Reed lacked proficiency in evasion and lacked diverse substitutes. His defense wasn't substantially superior to that of an ordinary person, rendering him susceptible to swift elimination, thereby reducing their team's strength. As Lumian engaged in discourse with the mirror gardener Martin, Anthony Reed remained concealed behind a nearby grayish-white stone pillar. He observed his surroundings and assessed the enemy's mental state, strategizing his actions for the impending battle. He had noticed the appearance of his feminine version, as well as the mirror gardener, male Jenna, and male Franca to either hide in the shadows or vanish. The complexity of the situation intensified, and he instinctively sensed the impending challenge posed by these formidable adversaries. As the figure of the female Lumian vanished, Anthony Reed, familiar with Lumian's spirit world traversal, quickly discerned the monster's intentions and thought process. She was employing teleportation, with him as her target. Her primary focus was dealing with the psychiatrist. As these realizations raced through his mind, Anthony didn't attempt to evade to either side. Given the proximity and his limited physical abilities, escaping the danger zone before female Lumian unleashed her subsequent onslaught was an impossibility. Instead, he opted for an offensive approach, intending to disrupt any forthcoming storm of attacks with his own strikes. Anthony forcibly twisted his body, his eyes widening in silent determination, a faint golden hue tinting his gaze. Then, he confronted the captivating and seemingly welcoming figure of female Lumian. The other party harumphed. Spell of harumph. Two beams of white light shot out from female Lumian's nostrils, striking Anthony. As the white beams reflected in Anthony's eyes, he made no attempt to dodge or evade. Instead, he invoked frenzy. With a thud, he crumpled to the ground, unconscious. Female Lumian's facial muscles contorted and dark red blood vessels emerged beneath her skin, resembling tiny fire serpents coming to life. Her blue eyes radiated violence and madness, while crimson flames bordering on white emanated from her body. Lumian materialized beside her and the unconscious Anthony. Choosing not to employ the spell of her umph, he clenched his right hand, enveloped in almost blazing white flames, and delivered a punch to his mirror self's head. With a cracking sound, female Lumian's body shattered like a mirror. She, too, possessed mirror substitution. Upon witnessing this, Lumian cursed inwardly once more. Dogs hit. Despite anticipating that these mirror people were closely related to mirrors and might have multiple mirror substitutions, thus opting for a flaming punch instead of the spell of harumph to conserve spirituality, the confirmation left him frustrated and angered. Only by facing it personally did he realize how repulsive abilities like mirror substitution and paper figurine substitutes were. Now, there were a total of five enemies with mirror substitution. Four of them had even replicated their team's abilities. How could they possibly prevail in such a situation? In that moment, the flames dissipated from Lumian's fiery fist, precisely as expected, landing on Anthony Reed. The scalding pain abruptly snapped the psychiatrist out of his stupor. Reacting instinctively, he rolled to smother the flames. Suddenly, Mirror Gardener Martin's cold, smiling voice echoed from an unseen location. How does it feel? Are my aids proving stronger than you expected? Unfortunately, they hail from profound mirror images, and their genders have been reversed. They can't replace you and return to the real world. What do you say? Surrender the figurine in exchange for my friendship and an opportunity to depart this place? It's of no use to you. If you're so powerful, why don't you just kill us and take the figurine? Are you wary of something? For example, Termoboros's escape? 
Or are you deliberately using such words to weaken our resistance and ensure your own safety to the greatest extent? Or are you actually not strong and are stalling for time for some development? A series of guesses raced through Lumian's mind. Meanwhile, Anthony Reed, having extinguished the flames, rose to his feet and coughed. Lumian's throat itched as he heard that. Soon, Franca and Jenna emerged from invisibility amid uncontrollable coughing, having intended to encircle the female Anthony. The voice of the mirror gardener resonated, accompanied by evident laughter. I neglected to mention that the fire raven I initially employed carries an affliction disease. Igniting and detonating them only aids the spread of the disease. Those two figurines can only suppress non-conscious diseases, but this, this is under my control. Chapter 488 Mutual Provocation Fire Raven fused with an affliction disease? Is that even possible? Will I pull off something similar when I switch to the Hunter Pathway? Is this the merging of different abilities through pathway switching? It's more unique and bizarre. As Franca coughed, surprise, solemnity, and a touch of anticipation painted her expression. Even though she was compelled to break her invisibility, Franca found herself in close quarters with the female Anthony. Her left hand rose, directing the ring of punishment, snug around her thumb, at the mirror person. Yet, Franca refrained from employing psychic piercing. It was a calculated move to confound the target and any hidden foes. Having observed Lumian's skirmish, Franca suspected that female Anthony also possessed mirror substitution. Psychic piercing wouldn't yield the desired effect. In that case, why not afflict the opponent with a negative state that wouldn't trigger mirror substitution? Beatrice's necklace, dangling from Franca's chest, reflected the engulfing flames, stirring female Anthony's ambitions to life. Franca had long discerned that these mirror people harbored resentment and animosity toward their authentic selves. Their burning desire to prove themselves was their weakness. The longing for success served as their greatest vulnerability. As two coughs reached female Anthony's ears, she, being a psychiatrist, mirrored the choice made by her male counterpart. Unable to evade the ensuing assaults, she swiveled halfway around, locking eyes with Franca and Jenna, who had already materialized. Her pupils turned vertical and shifted to a pale golden hue. Ah! Unlike her male counterpart, female Anthony opted for awe considering the presence of two assailants. This ability had the potential to influence both targets. The aura of a dragon, the pinnacle of the food chain, swiftly descended. Franca and Jenna couldn't help but tremble in fear. One of them found themselves immobilized, while the other sought refuge behind the nearest grayish-white stone pillar. Before female Anthony could unleash awe, Jenna, still coughing, seized the moment. She flung a half-blood-stained cloak, causing the bone flute and wooden box to tumble toward the target's feet. With her other hand, Jenna pulled the trigger of her revolver, propelling a yellow bullet engulfed in black flames towards female Anthony. However, in that critical moment, awe took effect. Jenna's right hand quivered, causing the bullet to veer off course. Amidst the gunfire, the shadowed mirror gardener narrowly evaded the bullet's trajectory. Swiftly moving, he leaped to the ground, dodging the projectile, and rolled into another shadow, vanishing from sight. Unarmed, female Anthony's eyes seemed to blaze with flames. She abandoned the idea of casting frenzy on Franca, who succumbed to the effects of awe, redirecting her focus to the coughing and moving male version of herself. Thud. 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 She charged forward, determined to prove herself by defeating the male Anthony. At that moment, figures materialized behind the frozen Franca and the fleeing Jenna. They were male Franca and male Jenna, who had previously concealed themselves with their abilities. The former aimed his hidden blade at Franca's back and struck with all his might. The latter fixed a glare at Jenna's back and pulled the trigger. With two cracking sounds, Franca and Jenna's bodies shattered like mirrors, allowing them to escape the effects of awe. However, their throats remained irritated. They had no choice but to endure the discomfort and occasionally cough as they faced off against male Franca and Jenna. Lumian's throat itched, and his head, accustomed to enduring high temperatures, still radiated warmth. 
As an ascetic, this level of illness couldn't challenge his endurance. He glanced at female Lumian, not far away, and crimson flames enveloped him, transforming into a fireball that shot forward. Female Lumian, her face still marked by blood vessels, sneered and vanished from her spot once more. Spirit world traversal again. Her figure reappeared behind the rapidly moving Anthony, as if she wouldn't stop until she had vanquished the psychiatrist. Just then, the fireball that had just shot out dissipated prematurely, morphing into a stream of light. In the stream of light, Lumian's figure flashed as he teleported to Anthony's side. He had been feigning an attack, anticipating female Lumian's use of spirit world traversal. He seized the opportunity to closely follow and block her. To achieve this, Lumian not only destabilized the fireball's structure in advance but also utilized Lai's ability to strengthen his control over flames. Appearing beside Anthony as swiftly as female Lumian, he promptly raised his iron black boxing gloves and unleashed a flurry of chain punches. Simultaneously, Lumian conjured the desire he longed to witness in his mind. The desire to replace a real person. This desire proved easier to trigger, and its detonation even better. Having already adorned the flog boxing gloves, Lumian aspired to exploit this state, potentially immune to mirror substitution, to impact the target and temporarily incapacitate his mirror self in combat. With a resounding bang, Lumian's left and right punches met the resistance of female Lumian's raised hand. However, she lacked boxing gloves and her forearm bore several bleeding punctures from flogged short thorns. Her eyes brimmed with escalating resentment and malice, as though she yearned for Lumian's demise in the very next second. She had entirely forsaken her pursuit of Anthony Reed. Bam! 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 Lumian unleashed a barrage of punches, incessantly thwarting his mirror self's attempts to employ other abilities. He persisted in taunting his counterpart. Hey, no flawed boxing gloves? Are you so feeble that you can't even mirror a mystical item below the demigod level? On the one hand, Lumian sought an emotional release. On the other, he aimed to use provocation to incense his female self, heightening the likelihood of the flawed boxing gloves triggering the other's desires and emotions. Female Lumian didn't hide her anger. Blocking Lumian's punches, she taunted with provocation, imbecile. If you had detected Aurora's anomaly earlier, the issue might have been resolved. Imbecile. If it were me, I would have undoubtedly handled it better than you. Lumian's mind buzzed. Even as an ascetic, he found himself affected by provocation. This frustration and guilt had long been buried deep in his heart, one of the root causes of all his pain. His eyes turned bloodshot, a blend of embarrassment, anger, and a compelling urge to self-destruct surged from the depths of his being. His attacks intensified as he sought to infuse the thought into his right hand. He wanted to witness the outcome if he unleashed the Blood Emperor's aura here in the mirror's fourth epic trier. When the time came, everyone present, Voice and Sanson and the other gods bestowed from different regions, would meet their demise together. Just then, Lumian's thoughts abruptly cleared. His emotions and impulses felt as though caressed by a gentle breeze. The melodious melody his sister Aurora used to hum seemed to echo in his ears, swiftly calming him. Placate! Psychiatrist Anthony reads Placate. Seizing the opportunity while Lumian relentlessly pounded female Lumian with punches, Anthony distanced himself. As he eluded the pursuit of his female self, he circled back to Lumian's vicinity. Sensing his companion's volatile mood, he promptly cast Placate. Affected by Beatrice's necklace, female Anthony only had eyes for her true self, indifferent to the fate of female Lumian. Suppressing the urge to self-destruct, Lumian witnessed female Lumian teetering on the verge of collapse under his relentless onslaught, her expression contorted. Franca and Jenna's coughing intensified, hindering the use of their abilities. Their male counterparts seized the moment, forcing them to employ mirror substitution once again. Franca was still okay, but Jenna likely had only one mirror substitution remaining. Observing this, Lumian, his forehead ablaze, felt a mix of concern, nervousness, and confusion. Where was Mirror Gardener? In such a chaotic scenario, any attack, whether directed at Franca, Jenna, 
himself, or Anthony, would prove highly effective. He might even succeed in eliminating them one by one. After all, he was a reaper. Yet, Mirror Gardener refrained from attacking. Only the echoing, mocking laughter signaled his continued presence. He persisted in persuading Lumian and the others to surrender the black figurine and cease resisting. Mph. Seizing the opportunity when Lumian's assault momentarily slowed, female Lumian, pushed to her limits, invoked the spell of Harumph. Two beams of white light struck Lumian's body. His vision darkened, and he experienced the same sensation as his previous adversaries. Crack! A mirror shattered on Franca's body, and Lumian materialized beside her. As Lumian's thoughts returned, a flurry of ideas raced through his mind. After spreading the disease with the sick ravens, Mirror Gardener refrained from employing any other offensive abilities. Instead, he chose to hide in the shadows or conceal himself. Wait, it didn't begin with the disease spread by the sick ravens. It began with the emergence of male Franca and the other mirror people. Why didn't he attack? Considering my mirror self's lack of the flawed boxing gloves, she probably doesn't possess the Blood Emperor's aura, Mr. Fool's seal, or Termoboros. The flawed boxing gloves were crafted from the branch of the Tree of Shadow. The mirror world, despite its apparent danger and terror, shouldn't be incapable of mirroring the flawed boxing gloves. Suddenly, Lumian had an epiphany. These four mirror people weren't naturally formed in the mirror's fourth epic trier. Mirror Gardener Martin had utilized his unique connection to this place to create them. It was akin to an ability. Mirror Gardener's decision not to attack stemmed from his concerted effort to sustain the four mirror people. He couldn't engage in direct assault, his only recourse was to conceal himself and use words to interfere with the enemy, disrupting their combat will. As these realizations coursed through his mind, Lumian couldn't help but smile. Dodging male Franca's attack and anticipating the teleportation of female Lumian, he retrieved the Eye of Truth obtained from Bouvard. Lumian then adorned the peculiar monocle, seemingly fashioned from flesh and blood. It had the ability to pierce through illusions, perceive reality, and discern the light of spirituality. Chapter 489 Greed Despite the severe corruption of the Eye of Truth, its ability to hear the voices of a hidden entity at any moment, and the risk of encountering uncontrollable negative effects, Lumian trusted that fourth epic trier, with its potent seal isolating external influences, provided a safeguard. Even the boons of evil gods couldn't trace back to their source, making it unlikely for him to hear the hidden sage's ravings. In this realm, there should be no adverse effects when using the Eye of Truth, especially within the mirror's fourth epic trier. However, Lumian acknowledged the potential presence of a fallen angel from the mystery prior pathway or remnants of corresponding divine power. Even with the Eye of Truth, there was a chance of hearing voices he shouldn't. Consequently, Lumian didn't plan to use it extensively. He intended to locate Mirror Gardener Martin and remove the mystical item when the opportunity presented itself. Through the lens affixed to his eye, Lumian discerned nearly invisible spider silk swaying around Franca, subtly influencing male Jenna and the other mirror people. Similarly, male Franca had created a plethora of spider silks, utterly unaffected by the constraints of the term witch. Lumian also took note of the fine snake-like black hair covering the area. They manifested and disappeared, delicately caressing every living being they touched. Their origin seemed to be the black pillar extending into the sky. Concurrently, Lumian's left eye reflected Mirror Gardener Martin. Concealed beside a grayish-white stone pillar, he seemed invisible. Without hesitation, Lumian activated the black mark on his right shoulder, the fifth time since becoming an ascetic. With the Eye of Truth in place, he instantaneously vanished, reappearing behind Mirror Gardener. The corners of Lumian's mouth curled up as he swung his right fist at his exposed foe, who had just realized his concealment had been shattered and had no time to react. His hands were encased in iron-black boxing gloves adorned with multiple short thorns. Flog! In the midst of Mirror Gardener's attempt to lunge forward and transform into a burning white spear, flying to the opposite side to distance himself, Lumian landed a punch behind his ear. 
In a haste, Mirror Gardener could only duck, abruptly contorting as if he were boneless, attempting to somersault away. Bang! Lumian's right fist connected with Mirror Gardener's right shoulder. The impact distorted the other's shoulder, causing his body to stagger, nearly losing balance. Mirror Gardener's combat prowess proved formidable. Despite tumbling to the ground, he seized the opportunity to pivot. He was unfazed by the potential of the white beams or being shot in the head, he still possessed mirror substitution. Confronting Lumian, who lunged at him with blood still dripping from his iron-black boxing gloves, Mirror Gardener smiled, his eyes reflecting blatant greed. This time, Lumian opted to trigger greed. In an instant, Mirror Gardener ignited with blazing white flames morphing into a spear charging at Lumian. At this range, he doubted that Lumian could evade the impending attack. Having committed to close combat, he had to bear the consequences, rendered unable to fully utilize spirit world traversal. Lumian didn't attempt to dodge, nor did he plan to. He swiftly adjusted his posture, watching as the blazing white spear collided with his right chest. His defense against flames was robust. The blazing white spear took nearly two seconds to burn through his skin and flesh. Yet, Lumian maintained a smile on his face. The pain only contorted his countenance, a testament to the resilience of an ascetic. Anthony Reed's placate had indeed restored Lumian's composure, but the psychological issues brought to light lingered for the time being. With two resounding bangs, Lumian seized the opportunity to deliver a left and right punch to the burning white spear. He exploited every chance to kindle Mirror Gardener's desires and emotions. Ultimately, the blazing white spear pierced Lumian's right chest, propelling him more than ten meters through the air. Lumian's smile retained a touch of frenzy. Adorned with a silver earring, he withdrew his right palm, pressed against the grievous wound on his chest, and slid downward. The injury swiftly spread to his abdomen, and almost white crimson flames erupted from Lumian's palm consuming his mangled flesh. He willingly accepted increased risk in the future to mitigate the impact of his injuries. With that, his figure melded into the void. Just as Mirror Gardener emerged from the dissipating blazing white flaming spear, Lumian materialized behind him. Bang! Bang! Lumian swung his fists again, targeting Mirror Gardener's arms, denying him a chance to catch his breath. He opted not to strike vital points, fearing that excessive damage might trigger mirror substitution. As Mirror Gardener transformed into a blazing white spear to assail Lumian, female Lumian, intending to teleport over to assist, stood stunned, as if temporarily losing autonomy. Likewise, both male Franca and male Jenna exhibited similar reactions, as if their resemblance to real people had momentarily waned. Franca and Jenna, in dire straits, seized the opportunity to catch their breath. Although they didn't immediately comprehend the reason, they keenly sensed that Mirror Gardener held the key to the problem. Lumian's assault on the leader had brought about such a change. Franca, relying on her experience, swiftly instructed Jenna, Give me that. Cough. Arrow. She needed the potent self-healing abilities of the Arrow of the Bloodthirsty to withstand the infectious disease and recuperate to a relatively healthy state within a specific time frame. Franca aimed to delay female Lumian and the other Mirror people, creating an optimal environment for Lumian to confront Mirror Gardener solo. Her only hope rested on Lumian catalyzing positive changes before the infection and illness exacerbated, outpacing the effectiveness of her self-healing abilities. Jenna had intended to use the arrow of the bloodthirsty herself. Despite having used it twice already, with another use risking a collapse of her body, she was willing to disregard the consequences in the current dire situation. However, upon hearing Franca's request, she hesitated momentarily before tossing the obsidian arrow to Franca. From Jenna's perspective, Franca, a Sequence 6 demoness of pleasure armed with numerous mystical items, possessed significantly more strength than herself. Thus, Franca's temporary recovery held greater benefit for the ongoing battle. Franca caught the arrow of the bloodthirsty and plunged it into her chest. Observing that female Lumian and the other mirror people had regained their composure, becoming lively once again, Franca's lake blue eyes silently transformed to a fiery red. 
The rubber band securing her ponytail snapped as if corroded, allowing her flaxen-colored hair to billow in the air, enhancing her enchanting allure. Her increasingly frequent coughs momentarily subsided, and the invisible spider silk surrounding her ceased its gradual, silent encroachment on male Franca, male Jenna, and female Lumian, no longer tightening and ensnaring them layer by layer. Like mirror images, Franca and Jenna felt their bodies grow heavy, their limbs constricted. From the outset, male Franca had been covertly using spider silk. Only when there was no way to further ensnare them layer by layer in secret did he reveal it. In an instant, Franca and the others were immobilized. Female Lumian, who had just teleported over, was the least affected by the spider silk and was skilled in using flames. She swiftly activated spirit world traversal in a crimson light, heading towards Lumian and Mirror Gardener's battlefield. Taking advantage of the momentary pause in female Anthony's actions, Anthony could finally counterattack. Enduring the terrifying cough, dizziness, and fever, he raised the revolver purchased from the black market and pulled the trigger at the mirror person, clearly more charming than him. At that moment, no one interrupted their internecine attacks. Amidst the gunshots, female Anthony shattered into numerous fragments. Upon reappearing nearby, she didn't immediately rush to rescue Mirror Gardener. Instead, she continued pursuing Anthony amidst her soaring desire for achievement. Amidst the sounds of flesh colliding, Lumian landed multiple punches on Mirror Gardener, sending waves of pain through the powerful Beyonder's head and stoking his anger. His greed made him reluctant to abandon the other four Mirror people and the advantage his side enjoyed on other battlefields. However, if he didn't give up, he wouldn't be able to focus on dealing with Lumian. He found himself restricted in every way and faced a disadvantaged situation. This was why Lumian had chosen to trigger his greed. Bang! Lumian tightened his fists, delivering a powerful blow to Mirror Gardener. Mirror Gardener crashed to the ground, instinctively summoning a swarm of crimson, almost white fireballs for protection. This caught female Lumian off guard as she had just teleported over. Unfazed by the nearly white crimson fireballs, Lumian swiftly teleported toward Mirror Gardener. The safest spot was, of course, where the caster stood. Amidst the explosive chaos, Lumian gritted his teeth against the searing pain in his back and landed another punch on Mirror Gardener's face. The short thorns on the iron black boxing gloves pierced through skin and flesh. Suddenly, Mirror Gardener Martin's gaze froze, blood streaming from his eyes, nose, and other wounds. The intense greed within him erupted, not killing or knocking him out but weakening and disorienting him. In this dazed state, whether it was female Lumian, male Franca, male Jenna, or female Anthony, they all froze in place. Their bodies rapidly faded, growing more translucent until they vanished. Witnessing the scene, Lumian straightened up, removing the flawed boxing gloves. He tossed them to Franca and Jenna, ensuring each had one. Franca noticed the residual blood and grasped Lumian's intent immediately. Dipping her hand into the blood, she retrieved a mirror, ready to cast the curse. Lumian had three reasons for opting for the flawed boxing gloves. Firstly, the ability to stir desires wouldn't trigger mirror substitution. Secondly, as a mystical item, it could attract the attention of dangerous entities, causing unpredictable changes that might lead to opportunities amid the chaos. Thirdly, it provided a chance to collect a curse's medium, the target's blood. Even if his triggered greed couldn't be controlled, leading to Mirror Gardener's mirror substitution, Lumian planned to seize the moment when the other mirror people were temporarily affected. He would throw the flawed boxing gloves to Franca and Jenna, aiding them in intercepting the attacks. Repeatedly cursing with the possession of the blood, Lumian aimed to challenge how many times mirror substitution could be used and find an opportunity to sever the connection. Flames erupted around Lumian as he transformed into a fireball, distancing himself from Mirror Gardener. Just as he was about to remove the Eye of Truth, a peculiar sound caught his attention. Chapter 490 Sounds the strange sounds Lumian heard echoed from a far-off realm, an elusive destination beyond his grasp. His heart tightened as he quickly removed the Eye of Truth, but the sounds remained. Bam! 
Bam. Bam. The sounds reverberated as if two massive rocks collided. Lumian witnessed sparks flying, and dried leaves and branches catching fire. In the midst of the flames lay scattered bones. The cave, shrouded in darkness with an unknown depth, echoed with distant howls resembling wolves. Thud. 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 A leather drum's beats and ancient musical instruments resonated, creating a solemn, holy, and magnificent atmosphere for Lumian. The scene in his mind shifted to a vast wilderness with a towering altar. A figure, his face veiled with beaded coverings, a splendid headdress, and a flowing black robe, ascended to the highest point. Around him, people with demon-painted faces danced frenziedly to the drumbeat. Suddenly, the sky darkened, and a face appeared from the ominous clouds. The ritualist, with beads sliding aside, revealed a terrified expression. A distant, haunting voice pierced the clouds, resonating through the desolate land. Lumian felt a profound shake in his mind and body. Before him stretched vast highlands, with withered trees, sparse grass, and yellow soil and rocks exposed. Gullies crisscrossed like wrinkles on an old man's face, separating silent towns. A massive river surged, majestic yet tainted with turbid yellow. Ding! Dang! Ding! Dang. The sound, like pearls on a porcelain plate, was crisp and gentle, emanating from a peculiar wooden pavilion. The surrounding buildings burned fiercely, and shouts echoed from the river. Amidst the pleasant melody, the pavilion collapsed in flames, yet the performer continued unabated. In the midst of the gentle singing, a woman in a peculiar dress stood on the platform, captivatingly expressing herself. Below her, people sat at various tables, savoring drinks under dim lights. Gunshots, like firecrackers, echoed outside what seemed to be a bar's dance floor, as citizens collapsed on the street. Fierce soldiers rushed in, stabbing the struggling ones with bayonets attached to their guns. Distant buildings burned, and flames soared into the sky. These voices and images surged into Lumian's mind like a torrent, causing his eyes to redden. His head felt unusually swollen, as if it were on the brink of exploding, and his thoughts became a chaotic jumble. Franca and Jenna, engrossed in their battle against Mirror Gardener Martin, remained oblivious to Lumian's unsettling state. Franca took the lead, pressing the black flames against the mirror stained with the target's blood. She successfully saw the enemy, weakened by the eruption of desire. He succumbed to the engulfing black flames, inflicting damage to his spirit body. Crack! Mirror Gardener shattered, and his figure materialized nearby, his dazed eyes now alert. Seizing the opportunity, Jenna, moving with remarkable speed, adjusted her makeup mirror stained with Mirror Gardener's blood. Pressing the black flames in her hand against it, S. Mirror Gardener was once again ignited by the demoness black flames and subjected to another fatal curse. He shattered anew, reappearing beside the black pillar. His right hand reached into his pocket, as if he wanted to take out a mirror and use nails, hair, blood, and other media to sever the connection between the source of the curse and himself. However, Franca, who was also moving at high speed, leaned back and raised the mirror in her hand. It made contact with her other hand, holding the flawed boxing glove ablaze with black flames. The flames erupted within the mirror, thwarting Mirror Gardener's attempt at curse-evading mirror magic. The duo, Franca and Jenna, continued their intricate dance, one advancing, one retreating, one cursing, and the other awaiting their turn. It was a mesmerizing duet, a choreography of combat. After enduring six curses, Mirror Gardener froze in front of a grayish-white stone pillar, not shattering like before. In the silence of the black flames, he rapidly weakened, teetering on the brink of unconsciousness. Seeing this, Franca discarded the flawed boxing gloves, opting for her cannon gun. She drew the weapon, pulled back the hammer, and took aim at the target. Bang! The iron black bullet tore through Mirror Gardener's skull, shattering it into fragments. His nearly headless body swayed briefly before collapsing to the ground. As the corpse faded away, it left behind a peculiar mirror fragment, its surface nearly lightless as if coated with black paint. Meanwhile, Anthony Reed, ever proficient at observation, detected Lumian's abnormal state. 
racing towards him, the psychiatrist attempted to placate him. However, Lumian remained unresponsive, his face contorting further, blood vessels on his forehead bulging ominously. There's a situation here. Anthony, noting Mirror Gardener's demise from the corner of his eye, swiftly informed Franca and Jenna. He hoped that the two demonesses could find a way to address Lumian's unsettling condition. However, an instant later, the pitch-black mirror fragment emitted a faint light. The surroundings plunged into instant darkness, transmuting into a bizarre transparency, as if the entire world had transformed into a mirrored container. Within the dark and shadowy confines of this mirror container, an unseen force seethed with rage, materializing the air and exerting pressure from every direction. Though Franca, Jenna, and Anthony witnessed no visible or audible phenomena, an overwhelming fear gripped them. Their bodies felt as if plunged into an icy cavern, freezing instantaneously. A faint sigh, distinctly feminine, resonated suddenly. Nearby, the black pillar radiated a dim light. The tiny snake-like black hairs concealed in the void retracted, coalescing into a massive black-haired sphere, forming a protective barrier around the square. Franca and the others experienced an immediate sense of tranquility. Fear released its grip on their bodies and minds, allowing them to move freely. Meanwhile, Lumian's consciousness wrestled with an onslaught of voices and scenes, his rationality gradually eroding. Suddenly, he heard a voice. It was a male sigh. Then, he saw a face and a figure, a man seated cross-legged in a serene room, adorned with a headdress and a blue robe. Though handsome, the man's eyes betrayed profound sorrow and pain, lending him a withered appearance. His gaze fixed on Lumian, comprehending the scenes unfolding, and he picked up a brown rod adorned with numerous white silk strands at one end, resting beside him. As the sigh persisted, the myriad sounds and images Lumian perceived vanished, replaced by overlapping shrill cries akin to curses. While Lumian couldn't comprehend the language, the phrase echoed in his mind, infused with the purest knowledge, enabling him to grasp its meaning. The voices converged into a torrent, laden with resentment and hatred. Celestial Master At the base of the Deep Valley Quarry, the once busy hall now stood in partial ruins. The tumultuous activity had taken its toll, leaving many members of the machinery hive mind injured. Conscious of the need to avoid hindering their comrades' battles, these individuals strategically retreated. Claude, the mechanical giant, abruptly halted his movements, his colossal ears resonating with overlapping roars. Amidst the roars, a sigh descended from above, casting an eerie atmosphere upon the indistinct wilderness. In that wild expanse, numerous ethereal figures lingered, occasionally gazing at the sky and emitting haunting screams. Observing this mysterious transformation, Archbishop Hormick refrained from seizing the opportunity to attack Claude directly. Instead, he swiftly withdrew from the crumbling hall, leading the remaining members of the machinery hive mind away from the illusory wilderness. The cybernetic eyes of the mechanical giant, with one resembling a ruby and the other an emerald, suddenly dimmed. It appeared as if intelligence had deserted him. Slowly turning around, Claude stepped into the surreal wilderness, seemingly intent on joining the lingering figures. Midway through, the mechanical giant turned to regard Archbishop Hormick and his companions, gears spinning wildly. An indescribable smile graced the face comprising multiple metallic components. In the next instant, the mechanical giant retracted his gaze, resuming his forward journey. His figure gradually took on an illusionary quality, merging with the mysterious wilderness until both vanished into the unknown. In the depths of the fourth epic trier, adjacent to the wall-like grayish-white fog, magician and justice materialized, their intense gazes fixed upon Lady Moon. She had lost her veil, revealing a vacant expression. The bestowed of the Great Mother, the lady who had nurtured a deity, stood in front of the gray fog, her shadow tainted by char. Magician and justice were surprised to see this. Almost simultaneously, the wall-like grayish-white fog expanded, pulsating like a beating heart. Almost simultaneously, an imposing aura, one that seemed to look down upon all existence, permeated the surroundings. It quelled the earlier sigh that had echoed through the air. The grayish-white fog in the vicinity heightened its intensity, spreading in all directions once more, 
thickening the gray fog throughout the entirety of Fourth Epic Trier. Him? So it's him? Justice and Magician exchanged silent whispers. Unaffected by the adverse consequences targeting others, they persisted in their actions. The dazed Lady Moon immediately found herself shrouded in resplendent starlight. In the wilderness, Snarner Einhorn and Deest, the president of the Iron and Blood Cross Order, continued their struggle to restrain Vermanda Sauron, a calamity giant, an angel who had lost control. Their efforts, however, were met with fierce counterattacks, forcing them into a gradual retreat, unable to capitalize on the situation. Amidst the chaos, the gray fog shrouding the ruins of Fourth Epic Trier stirred violently, as if the very city had awakened. The turbulent fog swiftly coalesced into a spear-like form, a weapon capable of shattering mountain peaks. It hurtled towards the captive Vermanda Sauron. In an instant, the spear, crafted from the gray fog, erupted into violent flames, taking on a violet hue. It exuded an aura of supremacy, as if it aimed to conquer all in its path. Witnessing this surreal phenomenon, whether it was Snarner Einhorn, Deist, Vermanda Sauron, or their allies, it was as though they beheld a city enshrouded in fog. A sense of awe overwhelmed their bodies and minds, dissuading any inclination to resist. The majestic purple flaming spear traversed a significant distance, impaling Vermanda Sauron, the calamity giant yet to regain mobility. His chest rent open, the colossal being was pinned to the wilderness. As the purple flames dissipated, a figure stood up from a genuflecting position. Clad in blood-stained black armor, adorned with long red hair, the youth exuded a handsome yet haunting presence. Rotting wounds marred both sides of his face, and a vivid red mark resembling a banner flag adorned his forehead. Chapter 491 Unexpected Helper The gray fog encircling Fourth Epic Trier extended into the wilderness, as if intercepting and obstructing an unseen force. In the midst of the tempest, Snarner, Deist, and the other formidable beings felt a high and formidable aura. An instinctive urge to bow in submission washed over them. It was as if the Blood Emperor Lista Tudor, who had met his end deep in Fourth Epic Trier, had returned from the abyss. However, he wasn't as unhinged or violent as before. Instead, a veiled sense of danger and calamity lingered. Fighting the impulse to surrender while stepping back, their eyes fixated on the figure of a young man clad in blood-stained black armor, adorned with long red hair and a conspicuous red mark between his brows. Their nerves tensed as a name echoed in their minds, Medici. Red Angel Medici. He was a king from ancient times. As early as the fourth epoch, or even during the catastrophic demise of the third epoch, he held the title of King of Angels. Kings of Angels were Archangels beyond Sequence 1, yet they hadn't attained the level of a Sequence 0 true God. Through the consumption of multiple Sequence 1 potions or the possession of the key to deity status, however, having something missing prevented them from taking that crucial step. The Red Angel was among the eight Kings of Angels who had once served the ancient Sun God. Though he met his end at the hands of Alista Tudor during the fourth epoch, leading to the latter's ascent as Blood Emperor, the King of Angels hadn't completely perished. Transformed into an evil spirit in a hidden sanctuary, he survived and re-emerged a few years ago, resuming his activities. As Angels of the Hunter Pathway, Snarner and Deist grew increasingly apprehensive about the situation. They suspected that Medici might have already acquired a conqueror beyond her characteristic, ascending once again to a Sequence 1 Archangel. While devising a plan to obtain Vermanda Sauron's conqueror beyond her characteristic, Snarner and Deist remained cautious of the possible involvement of the ancient king. When Albus Medici disclosed his name, their vigilance heightened, and they kept a constant watch on him. Only when the operation was unexpectedly hastened, and the Red Angel showed no signs of breaching the seal, nor did Albus Medici display any abnormal behavior, did they finally ease up. But just at that critical juncture, Red Angel Medici appeared. With a terror-inducing aura that subjugated everything, he soared majestically from the depths of Fourth Epic Trier. Seizing the opportunity, he dealt a severe blow to Vermanda Sauron with a single strike. Medici's disdainful gaze swept across Snarner and Deist as he casually tossed an item to the struggling calamity giant, Vermanda Sauron. 
It was a blood-stained umbilical cord. The moment the umbilical cord left Medici's hand, it burst into flames, emitting a golden light resembling a miniature sun. Above surface trier, the sun, engulfed by hurricanes, lightning, and torrential rain, suddenly emitted a blinding light, tearing through the calamitous scene. A chubby baby, seemingly crafted from pure sunlight, soared out of the tear, transforming into a golden sun hurtling towards Red Swan Castle in Cartier Arrest. The scorching sun tore through the sky, liquefying the spires, walls, and floor of the ancient castle. It plunged into the depths of the underground maze and into the bronze coffin. Wherever it passed, darkness dissipated, and the withered hearts turned to ashes. Elros Einhorn, stationed outside the underground palace, instinctively shut her eyes, her body trembling uncontrollably. High in the sky, the hanged man didn't pursue the self-destructing sun. Instead, he hovered above the storm, his gaze fixed on Red Swan Castle, which bore a massive wound. It remained unknown what he contemplated. Danitz, leading his team in Cartier Arrest's battle against the mutated soldiers and the monstrous Carbonari army, couldn't help but curse under the intense sunlight. The people around him and the mutants shared a similar reaction. In the outer seal of Fourth Epic Trier, an invisible flame burning silently in the sky formed a massive vortex, tainted with a golden hue. The sun descended from the vortex, illuminating the entire wilderness and fourth epic trier as if it were daytime. It caught up to the burning umbilical cord and enveloped the severely injured archangel, Vermanda Sauron. Sunlight erupted, and darkness vanished. The calamity giant, formed by a conqueror's loss of control, emitted a tragic cry and swiftly dissipated, undergoing profound purification. The infant that had transformed into a sun ceased to exist. Only the remnants of its power burned fiercely, emitting light and warmth. Snarner, Deest, and the other powerhouses turned sideways, steeling themselves to withstand the impact of the sunlight. In the brilliantly lit fourth epic trier, Voisin Sanson and Madame Puales, entangled in intense combat, simultaneously closed their eyes, as if unaccustomed to the direct sunlight. Upon reopening their eyes, they found themselves separated, no longer able to see each other. One stood in a square adorned with stone pillars, while the other perched on a collapsed black building. W.H. The two bestowed, who had already tasted the power of godhood, were momentarily taken aback before realizing that fourth epic trier had undergone a transformation due to the impact of the golden sunlight, leading to a shift in direction and spatial disarray. Gardner Martin, donned in a full-body silver armor, could already discern the dense grayish-white fog ahead, resembling an impenetrable wall. A surge of joy coursed through him. What he desired, what he sought, was within reach. Suddenly, sunlight pierced through, illuminating the nocturnal environment. Instinctively, Gardner Martin shut his eyes and decelerated. Then, a cracking sound reverberated. It emanated from his neck. In surprise, Gardner Martin lowered his head, acclimating to the sunlight. Accompanied by an intense and peculiar pain, he witnessed the widening gap between his head and chest. Blood spurted from the stump of his neck, staining the area crimson. He also beheld his white, bloody spine. How could this be? This thought flashed through Gardner Martin's mind, a mix of shock and fear. He had always believed himself to be the favored one, the special one. Hence, under the watchful eyes of the Great Will Deep within Fourth Epic Trier, even upon entering 13, Avenue du Marque, he assumed he would only suffer minor corruption. He could wield a certain power from Fourth Epic Trier to a limited extent without transforming into a terrifying monster like Olsen, whose head and body had been severed. Yet now, his head had detached from his body, dragging along his spine. Just as he was on the verge of approaching the Great Will, Lady Moon, adorned with brown wings and bird-like claws, crumpled amidst cascading silver lightning. Initially, she descended into madness, morphing into a bewildered monster. This marked the onset of the plague storm from the spectator pathway, succeeded by magicians' nine attacks from nine directions. As sunlight bathed the scene, magician instinctively closed her eyes. With a sweep of her right hand, the void contorted, shaping into a sealed dark sphere that encased her, Justice, and the swiftly fading Lady Moon. 
together, they withstood the ensuing anomalies as a unified entity. Within the sphere woven from thick black hair, Jenna, Franca, and Anthony felt the tumultuous storm and various catastrophes outside, causing the ground to quake and the sphere to sway. In an instant, time slowed, and the snake-like black hair composing the dark sphere swiftly split open, revealing a beam of sunlight above. In the sunlight, Jenna and Franca seemed to discern an ethereal female voice. Reconcile with your mirror self. With these words, the snake-like black hair disintegrated entirely, no longer coalescing into a sphere. It retreated into the void. Franca and the others found themselves surrounded by a layer of dark glass, silently shattering and falling under the sunlight. The lights and figures in the nearby buildings vanished, and Jenna and the others returned to the dead silence reminiscent of when they first entered the ruins. After adjusting to the sunlight, Anthony immediately looked at Lumian and noticed that the blood vessels on his companion's face had faded. His contorted expression gradually eased. Are you all right? Anthony inquired, employing Placate. Upon hearing the roars, Lumian's mind was filled by the man's size in the dark room. The overwhelming knowledge that gripped him in corruption had subsided. He no longer felt like his head was about to burst or lose his rationality. He quickly returned to normal, no longer hearing the sigh or seeing the withered man in strange attire. I survived, Lumian replied to Anthony's question. Simultaneously, he thought, is that the celestial master the armored shadow mentioned? Using the eye of truth here is even more dangerous than the outside world. Franca gathered the items, picked up flog and other belongings, and threw out the arrow of the bloodthirsty. What happened to you just now? The aftereffects of using the eye of truth. Lumian took the arrow of the bloodthirsty and stabbed it into his chest. Surveying the area, he said, let's quickly collect our items and relocate. Previously, he had used flog, hoping to attract the attention of dangerous entities, thereby creating chaos to find an opportunity. Now that Mirror Gardener had been dealt with, it was crucial to move to avoid new threats. Jenna, with no time to ponder the meaning of reconciling with her mirror self, placed the bone flute, wooden box, and other items in the blood-stained cloak. Following Lumian, Franca, and Anthony, she sprinted in a random direction around the black pillar. Beneath the blistering sunlight, the purple flames constituting Vermanda Sauron's flesh and blood flickered out one by one. The anguished faces representing the diverse Sauron family members disappeared sequentially. The Red Angel's form abruptly expanded, resembling a diminutive mountain peak. Brandishing a broadsword condensed from purple flames, he advanced with a step and swung it at the dying Vermanda Sauron. Having regained their composure, Snarner, Deest, and the other formidable beings were not inclined to yield. They acted in unison, intervening to impede him. Chapter 492 Pride Red Angel Medici stood unfazed amidst the onslaught from Snarner, Deest, and the other formidable adversaries. His focus unwavering, he channeled his conquering will to subdue Vermanda Sauron, wielding a broadsword ablaze with purple flames, ready to cleave through the menacing foe. Seizing the opportune moment, with the uncontrollable calamity giant at its weakest, Medici aimed to deliver the final, fatal blow. Suddenly, a radiant light burst forth before the eyes of Snarner, Deest, and the rest. It was pure sunlight, banishing the darkness and cleansing the surroundings of filth and the stench of blood. The two angels, now in their mythical creature forms, appeared as if exposed to the brilliance of the sun at close range. From within the luminous glow emerged a holy and beautiful woman, draped in a white robe adorned with golden threads, Trier's guardian angel, Saint Vive. She shielded the Red Angel from the relentless attacks of the other powerhouses. Simultaneously, Medici, clad in blood-stained black armor, descended like a mountain. Plunging the purple broadsword into Vermanda Sauron's skull, which showed signs of melting under the intense sunlight, Medici marked the decisive moment in the battle. Boom! The implosion absorbed the surrounding flames, hurricanes, lightning, hail, and sunlight into the calamity giant's colossal form. The once tumultuous wilderness now stood cleansed, except for the remnants of invisible flames in the sky and a vast golden vortex. Boom! 
Reaching its limit, the implosion rapidly expanded, unleashing a barrage of projectiles. A violent hurricane tore through Vermont Sauron's charred skeleton, casting darkness upon the once brightly illuminated landscape. A torrential downpour accompanied by countless bolts of lightning and thunderclaps ensued, marking the demise of an angel, a conqueror. Snarner, Deist, and the other powerhouses, breaking through St. Vive's obstruction, witnessed the scene unfold. Vermanda Sauron's body disintegrated, and Red Angel Medici, now in the form of a mythical creature, brandished his purple-flamed broadsword. He turned disdainfully, mocking those who dared challenge him. Snarner Einhorn narrowed his eyes, evaluating the situation. Swiftly transforming into a blaze, he ascended into the air, disappearing into the colossal vortex of formless flames. Realizing that even with the support of the Iron and Blood Cross Order, victory against Red Angel and Saint Vive was unattainable, he chose to retreat. The former was undoubtedly a sequence one conqueror. Moreover, in this unique setting, he appeared capable of tapping into the formidable power hidden within the fourth epic trier to some extent. In that situation, he'd fall back and escape if needed, otherwise, he could meet his end right here. Snarner dashed into the massive vortex in midair, while Deist morphed into a beam of light and shot into the sky. He raced out of the wilderness with Tony Twain, chasing after the Einhorn family's weather warlock. As angels of the hunter pathway, their judgments and choices were strikingly similar. Red Angel Medici, observing their departure, chuckled and muttered to himself, the heroic escape of your descendant is reminiscent of yours many years ago. His attention then turned to St. Vive with a smile. Now, we can proceed to the final part of the plan and eliminate the bestowed of the outer deities. St. Vive nodded in agreement, emitting a blazing light as she flew towards Fourth Epic Trier, enveloped in a shroud of gray fog. In the depths of Fourth Epic Trier, alongside a wall like grayish white fog, Bernadette Gustav, the eldest daughter of Emperor Roselle, fixated her gaze on a seal adorned with countless mysterious symbols. In her palm, a faint golden figure materialized once more through the viscous light emanating from a golden lamp that resembled a miniature lamp. It said to Bernadette, take another step forward and find a monster to replace your wish using the method I told you. I can use under the table transaction to help you obtain something from here to counterbalance the corruption affecting your father. Bernadette remained steadfast, not advancing. Calmly, she responded, I entered this place to analyze the seal and understand how the various corruptions have intricately balanced themselves through years of mergers and confrontations. That sigh was merely an unexpected bonus. Time is of the essence. If you don't act more assertively, once the mother goddess of depravity breaches the barrier, your father will truly transform into a monster, warn the distorted, blurry, pale golden figure. Undeterred, Bernadette continued absorbing knowledge related to the seal, her focus unwavering. The pale golden figure fell silent and retreated into the peculiar lamp without making further persuasion. Gardner Martin's head, donned with a silver-white helmet, soared into the air, carrying his blood-soaked spine with it. Glancing down, he witnessed a broadsword of light materializing in his hand. He, no, his body could use the pride armor's hurricane of light again. However, this time, the target appeared to be him, specifically, his head. Is this the traitorous curse? My own body turning against my head. Why another betrayal? Could it be linked to constant wearing of the pride armor? Gardner Martin's pupils dilated, fear gripping his heart. In a desperate attempt to mitigate the impending impact of the hurricane of light, he condensed numerous crimson, almost white fireballs. The explosions around him aimed to lessen the force of the onslaught. Simultaneously, he sank his consciousness into his glabella, seeking a connection with the Great Will, praying for its protective intervention. Beside the shattered corpse of Vermanda Sauron, Red Angel Medici extended his right hand observing as a beam of light, reminiscent of iron and blood, emanated from the conqueror's body. It landed on the damaged skull cradled in his palm. In that moment, Gardner Martin's desperate shout and plea reached him. Red Angel chuckled dismissively, paying no heed to the pawn that had served its purpose and was now deemed expendable. Gardner Martin had not submitted to the Great Will from the depths of Fourth Epic Trier but to Red Angel himself. 
Over the past few years, Red Angel Medici had lurked in the shadows, orchestrating a scheme to obtain the Sauron family's lost sequence one conqueror beyond her characteristic. Leveraging his uniqueness and level, he assisted numerous members of the Iron and Blood Cross Order in maintaining their lucidity and rationality in the face of corruption at 13 Avenue du Marquet. They did not transform into monsters but were only slightly affected. Using his uniqueness, Menachi disguised himself as a great wolf from the depths of Fourth Epic Trier. He manipulated the Iron and Blood Cross Order members to grasp the underground situation and pinpoint Vermanda Sauron's exact location. During this process, he uncovered the issue with the Mirror People but refrained from interference, pushing the plan forward. His intention was to involve Trier's evil god bestowed and utilize them to divert the attention of other factions while extracting corresponding special value and uncovering hidden problems. As the plan unfolded, Philip informed Gardner Martin about Lumian Lee, who had undoubtedly prayed to the Great Will. Seizing this opportunity, Red Angel Medici refined the plan, bestowing Gardner Martin with a divine vision. This allowed him to acquire significant mysticism knowledge and conceive the hostile ritual. The ritual, designed to create minimal disturbance and increase the chances of success, aimed to fool Trier's most formidable evil god bestowed into fourth epic Trier. The ultimate goal, capture them all and purify them in one fell swoop. Observing the Beyonder characteristic rapidly condense in his hand, Red Angel Medici raised his gaze to the gradually shrinking golden vortex. The smile on his face, adorned with decaying wounds, deepened. Whether it was the hostile plan or the original strategy involving the special mirror world, both required the cooperation of a faction and the assistance of a true god. Enter the eternal blazing sun. Indeed, how can the sun, intolerant of darkness, filth, and humbleness, genuinely collaborate with the mother, the symbol of depravity and evil? Having ascended to godhood and abandoned his original lord in the past, he had chosen this path precisely because he refused to submit to another deity. Why would he now bow to the mother goddess of depravity, an outer deity, a different entity altogether? His needs and acknowledgments were reserved for a collaborator. And I willingly embraced this role. Even if I were to become a great old one in the future, I vowed to honor this agreement and stand together in defense as a collaborator. With the ruler of war's divine spot vacant and cheek in dire straits, I emerged as the most likely candidate to ascend to true godhood and attain the status of a great old one in a short span. The son didn't repent or return to the original lord's side, nor did he submit to the mother goddess of depravity who reigned above the gods. Instead, he chose the path of enduring pressure and facing the worst possible outcome to support a new great old one. This decision may have seemed nearly the worst, yet he embraced it wholeheartedly. Because he is the proud son. Through the golden vortex, the red angel's gaze surveyed the gradually calming storm above Trier, noting a significant decrease in the frequency of lightning. His smile grew even more smug. As expected, Tyrant and the old dragon have grasped the entirety of the situation. They are no longer seizing the opportunity to confront the sun, rendering the entity that had inherited most of the original lord's legacy effectively useless. They, too, yearn for the emergence of a new great old one. Red Angel Medici directed his gaze to his palm, where an iron-black object, resembling a blood-stained crown, was on the verge of taking shape. Recollections of past events and the betrayal he had only comprehended a few years ago flooded his mind. It all stemmed from his unwavering loyalty to that lord of 2,401 years. His choice was unforgiving. He chose to collaborate with the eternal blazing sun. This was because he was also a proud king of angels, once the most loyal red angel. As the sequence one conqueror beyond her characteristic fully condensed, Medici chuckled and declared, the curse of your useless descendants can end now. He pressed the blood-stained iron crown, formed by the broken skull in his hand, between his eyebrows and devoured it without concocting a potion. Vermanda Sauron's blood and shattered corpse, scattered across the wilderness, seemed to come alive, pouring into the Red Angel's body like a torrent. Chapter 493 Crimson Hell Sprinting through the silent, desolate, and dilapidated fourth epic trier, Lumian's abdominal injuries came under control, 
thanks to his potent self-healing abilities. It seemed they wouldn't worsen any time soon. Beneath the sunlight, the direction in which Lumian, Franca, and the others were heading appeared to be in complete disarray. They traversed narrow, partially destroyed streets only to encounter magnificent red buildings, and attempts to reach landmarks led them further away, regardless of the directions they took. Fortunately, the four of them remained relatively close, avoiding the perils of getting lost or separated from the group. As Lumian contemplated finding a place to hide, a large number of violent fragments of light materialized in front of them. It was evident that the power emanating from the fourth epic trier had been transferred from a distance. Lumian and the others were no strangers to this terrifying storm of light. They had encountered it once in the wilderness, courtesy of Gardner Martin's silver-white full-body armor. Gardner Martin? Lumian halted in time, wisely refraining from rushing into the weakened but still perilous storm of light. Franca's expression became complicated, uncertain whether this encounter was luck or misfortune. As the light subsided, she witnessed Gardner Martin's head, a long, blood-stained spine trailing behind. His armor was incomplete, his face covered in charred and hideous wounds. The helmet had caved in, revealing his grayish-white brain faintly. His eyes appeared empty, unfocused, and filled with dizziness as if he had experienced an exaggerated shock from the intense impact. Gardner Martin's adversary stood as his silver-white armor-clad body, lacking a head. The neck stump was drenched in blood. Raising his hands, he condensed a massive axe made of light. Though incapable of unleashing the hurricane of light, it proved sufficient for ordinary combat. Franca gazed at the familiar yet unfamiliar tragic face and exhaled. She took out a mirror and reflected it. In that moment, Gardner Martin's thoughts returned to normal. Aside from his headless body, he saw Franca's beautiful lake-colored eyes, appearing calm. Franca placed her right hand, engulfed in black flames, on the mirror reflecting Gardner Martin's head and whispered, I'll liberate you. Gardner Martin, still reeling from the immense blow to his body, found himself instantly enveloped by black flames, his spirituality igniting from within. Struggling to scream, he discovered his voice stifled. Desiring aid from the Great Will and attempting to utilize his uniqueness to summon forth Epic Trier's bestowed power, he encountered only silence. With a whoosh, the headless Gardner Martin wielded the radiant axe, striking the head's face. The missing visor shattered, and the axe cleaved into the skull. Lumian, having taken a few steps to the side, raised his right hand, unleashing a crimson fireball, almost white like a cannonball aimed at Gardner Martin's sunken skull. The fireball landed on the crack, exploding and tearing apart the unprotected grayish-white brain. Under the relentless assault from his body, lover, and subordinate, Gardner Martin's head and eyes bulged, filled with hatred and pain. With a snap, the head detached from the helmet, falling to the ground in a half-broken state, devoid of vitality or movement. As the silver helmet landed, Gardner Martin, still clad in armor, spun around, raising the glowing axe and charging at Lumian and the others. Observing the unfolding scene, Lumian subtly arched his body and advanced confidently. With each step, his stature appeared to expand, and by the time he stood near the headless Gardner Martin, his clothes and pants strained against his growing form. The Power of an Ascetic during his time at the edge of Fourth Epic Trier, Lumian had strategically compressed some of his strength. Now, he was unleashing it. Although the accumulated strength wasn't overwhelming, it had visibly transformed him. Coupled with the enhanced speed, agility, and physique granted by the Arrow of the Bloodthirsty, Lumian was confident in withstanding the impending attack from the silver armor-clad Gardner Martin. Just as the collision became imminent, Lumian deftly sidestepped, allowing the axe of light to cleave through the air. He swiftly punched the headless gardener's wrist. With a resounding bang, the headless gardener discarded the radiant axe, clenched his metal-gloved fist, and delivered a forceful strike against Lumian. Lumian's body swayed slightly, while the headless gardener stood like an unwavering mountain peak. Retracting his left fist, Lumian released it, swinging it in the air to alleviate the pain as he prepared to strike with his right fist. At that moment, Franca, having vanished while Lumian approached the headless gardener, reappeared behind the enemy clad in silver armor. 
raising the iron black ring on her left thumb, her eyes illuminated like lightning. Unsure if the headless body could still be affected by psychic piercing, Franca believed it should be possible. As long as there was a spirit, psychic piercing could exert its influence. In an instant, the headless gardener froze. The exposed skin and flesh on his neck and chest twitched. Jenna, who had been slower due to reciting incantations and using materials, arrived as well. Revealing herself at a distance from the headless gardener, she caused black flames to condense and fly out, landing on the enemy's bloody neck, unprotected by the silver armor. This ignited the spirit in a state of pain. Thud. 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 Anthony Reed sprinted past Jenna, closing the gap between him and the headless gardener. Then, his pupils turned vertical, a faint golden hue coloring them. Frenzy. Suddenly, flames erupted from the headless body in the silver armor, scorching its flesh. Upon witnessing this, Lumian leaned back kicking the ground with his right foot to fly away from the headless gardener. Simultaneously, he condensed crimson fireballs, nearly white, around him. The fireballs whizzed through the unprotected neck and into the body, detonating from the inside out with a resounding rumble. The silver armor trembled violently as the headless body was reduced to charred flesh and blood, painting the inner layer of the armor. Boom! Lumian, propelled backward by the explosion's waves, landed on the ground. Simultaneously, the silver-armored mountain collapsed to the ground. Just as Lumian rose and prepared to commend Franca and the others for their coordinated effort, he suddenly sensed the sky transforming into a deep shade of blood red. Raindrops began to descend from above. However, it wasn't rain. It was flames, blazing white flames. Within this fiery deluge, droplets of blood accompanied the falling fire. Franca swiftly rolled towards a nearby building, utilizing its extended roof as cover from the scorching white fire rain. Lumian, Jenna, and Anthony followed suit. White hot flames and drops of bright red blood fell at an increasingly rapid pace, painting the surroundings in hues of red and setting buildings ablaze. The burning structures melded into a sea of flames. Contemplating whether to activate the Blood Emperor's aura for potential solutions to the unfolding horror, Lumian's eyes caught sight of Madame Magician, clad in a knot shirt and beige dress. A sigh of relief escaped him. Resplendent starlight illuminated the scene, and they vanished from the street, taking with them the pride armor, Gardner Martin's corpse, and various items scattered on the ground, all converging into the diminishing golden vortex in the sky. Blazing white flames, mixed with blood, cascaded down, but they passed through Bernadette Gustav's form, unable to ignite her. It was as if the angel existed beyond their reach. Her focus remained on the dense gray fog and the diverse corruptions within the city. After a moment, her body transformed into transparency, eventually disintegrating into a pile of bubbles that mirrored the flames. As the bubbles dispersed, so did Bernadette, departing from Fourth Epic Trier. Two elegant women with captivating eyes approached the wall like grayish-white fog, only to realize that the sky above was tainted with blood, and dense white flames, resembling raindrops, descended. Just as they considered seeking shelter, a golden sun suddenly reflected in their eyes. In the blink of an eye, they were entirely purified. Elsewhere in Fourth Epic Trier, the hostile residents who had ventured within were already undergoing abnormalities. Some perished, transformed into monsters, others were engulfed in incandescent white flames, and a few caught sight of the sun. Madame Puales discovered a relatively intact asymmetrical house amidst the chaos. Observing distant sunlight and blazing white flames setting nearby buildings ablaze, she hesitated to seek refuge within the door due to the deep, terrifying darkness within. Suddenly, her head throbbed violently, and she heard an almost illusory cry of a baby. It was the cry of her child, a fragment of memory echoing nearby. Driven by the mystical sensation, Madame Pulius ventured into the infinite darkness beyond the door. Amidst the incandescent white flames that descended, Voisin Sanson, positioned in the collapsed square, was set ablaze. However, he promptly reverted to his original state. Soon after, he witnessed his impending purification by the sun. 
In that moment, his peripheral vision captured a figure emerging from behind a grayish-white stone pillar at the square's edge. It was a diaphanous, indistinct lizard-like creature. The creature's cold eyes silently observed him. In Fourth Epic Trier, numerous buildings were engulfed by incandescent white flames, their facades now tainted red by rainwater transformed from blood and charred black by the inferno. Red Angel Medici, donned in blood-stained black armor, emerged from the wilderness into the resplendent city, now permeated with the air of destruction. He navigated through the charred and collapsed houses, moving amidst falling white flames and beneath blood-like raindrops, a visible smile gracing his face. The two decaying wounds on his face, exposing the bones beneath, had already started to heal, leaving behind marks resembling a mouth. Splash! Flames and blood cascaded from the sky, casting a fiery glow upon Fourth Epic Trier and shrouding the ruins, transforming it into a crimson hell. After 2,081 years, Medici had once again ascended to the title of King of Angels. Chapter 494 Stolen Information The looming dark clouds over Trier had vanished, replaced by the glow of the crimson moonlight that bathed every nook and cranny of the city, casting reflections in the calf deep puddles below. On the rooftop of an unknown building, Lumian and Franca materialized at the edge. Before them, Magician hovered in the void, accompanied by a stack of items. Jenna and Anthony, encased in what seemed like dark glass, fixated their gazes elsewhere. Without prompting from Lumian, Magician let out a weary sigh and divulged, Medici has ascended once again to King of Angels. Once hailed as the most formidable conspirer, he has returned. The Red Angel who once served the ancient sun god and met his demise at the hands of the Blood Emperor, Medici. Lumian's reaction was a mix of surprise and inevitability. How could the Angel of the Hunter Pathway not be entangled in the affairs of the Sauron family's secrets and Fourth Epic Trier? The existence of Albus Medici was irrefutable proof. Lumian, previously under the impression that the clandestine nature of the hostile ritual and its premature commencement had prevented the Red Angel from exacting influence, now realized Medici was apparently the ultimate victor. Madam Magician, in a relatively composed manner, chuckled and remarked, no need for the latter half of that statement. It makes it sound like you're provoking him, especially with the Blood Emperor's aura marks still imprinted on your right hand. Franca, having heard Lumian's mention of the Medici family, inquired out of curiosity, what did the Red Angel do? As she spoke, her eyes flitted towards Jenna and Anthony, only to realize they were oblivious to the conversation with Madame Magician, as if trapped in another dimension. Behind Franca, the water that had pooled on the rooftop began its gradual retreat, the drain's sloshing sounds echoing. Magician sighed. When the Einhorn family's angel, the powerhouses of the Iron and Blood Cross Order, and the sealed artifacts, along with the unique powers of the Fourth Epic Trier, were on the brink of killing the out of control Vermanda Sauron, he seized the moment to terminate the entire battle and acquire the sequence one beyond her characteristic. The blood colored sky and the fiery rain you witnessed were the aftermath of his return as a King of Angels in Fourth Epic Trier. That explains it. Lumian, Recalling the situation, gained a first-hand understanding of the dread and power wielded by a king of angels. At that moment, his feet were bare, lacking shoes and socks, the consequence of being transported to the painted world while asleep. The painted footwear he later wore was evidently short-lived. Pondering the recent events, he inquired, was that roaring giant the out-of-control Vermanda Sauron? No wonder the roar had nearly rendered them unconscious. Thankfully, Mr. Fool's gray fog had provided protection. That's correct. Vermanda Sauron's loss of control and descent into the sealed underground marked the beginning of the Sauron family's downfall. While many details remain shrouded in mystery, the overall picture is becoming clearer. Angel of the Einhorn family Lumian connected the dots, realizing that one of Elros Einhorn and the Iron and Blood Cross Order's primary objectives was to break the seal, hunt the out-of-control Vermanda Sauron, and obtain the sequence one beyond her characteristic. Lumian nodded thoughtfully and asked with uncertainty, did these powerhouses enter Fourth Epic Trier through the hostile ritual? Most of them accessed it through the underground leakage of Sal de Ball Breeze triggered by the hostile ritual. 
the representative from the Einhorn family entered through the leakage deep within the underground palace of Red Swan Castle, but it's essentially a result of the chain reaction caused by the hostile ritual. As for how the Red Angel entered, that remains unknown to me. Magician's expression turned serious. However, there's reason to believe that the hostile ritual was orchestrated by the Red Angel. He manipulated the Iron and Blood Cross Order in Gardner Martin, truly befitting the entity that once guided and watched over Amon. Lumian felt a surge of enlightenment, finding that many previously confusing details now made more sense. Franca's emotions were a mix of complexity. Madam Magician, glancing at them, offered consolation, regardless of the circumstances, our actions accelerated the hostile ritual, mitigating the damage this plan inflicted on Trier. In the entire market district, only a handful of night duty personnel from places like Le Marque du Cartier du Gentleman and Rist docks bore the brunt of the disaster. Some soldiers lost their lives in other areas. Overall, the impact was mainly financial. Our efforts were not in vain. She smiled self deprecatingly and gazed up at the sky. The only unexpected thing was that they chose to cooperate. They. Lumian and Franca thought inwardly. Eager to uncover who the Red Angel collaborated with, they realized that Madame Magician had no intention of revealing that information. The lady's eyes traveled over the silver-white full-body armor, Gardner Martin's remains, and the items Jenna had discarded during the battle. She smiled and offered. I'll assist you in handling the corresponding corruption and throw in specific usage information as a bonus for this mission. By the way, I recommend you temporarily overlook the corruption on the bone flute. It can produce peculiar effects. With Gardner Martin's Beyonder characteristics, you don't necessarily need Phillips. Plus, your unique attributes can effectively counteract the negative effects of the bone flute. The last sentence was directed at Lumian. Observing Lumian's nod, Magician continued, this wooden box serves as an under-the-table transaction. It's not meant for combat, but it can resolve many issues that violence can't under specific circumstances. I'll jot down the details and have the messenger send them over. The mirror fragments left behind by Mirror Gardener are closely tied to the special Mirror World and Fourth Epic Trier. My intuition suggests it might be linked to the current state of the primordial Demonus. As for this armor, it's quite special. Wearing it will lead to some fortuitous encounters. Heh <laughs> heh, ever thought of transforming into a beautiful woman or a handsome lad four to five meters tall? After playfully providing basic information about the various items, Magician nodded slightly and added, Once I'm done, I'll send them back along with the information, and you'll receive an official reward. Seven of Wands, it's time for you to leave Trier for a while. The Iron and Blood Cross Order's mission has concluded. Your only task is to inform that mister. I'm confident he'll comprehend and accept it. Recalling his involvement in two consecutive catastrophes in Trier, Lumian concisely acknowledged and stated, I share the same sentiment. I intend to track down the remaining April Fool's members. Magician shifted her attention to Franca. Your next steps will hinge on the Demonist sex reaction. Remember to report to your major arcana card holder when the time comes. After Franca acknowledged, Magician glanced at Anthony and Jenna. When the aftershocks settle, inquire if they'd like to draw a minor arcana card and join the tarot club. If they decline, don't push it. I'll ensure they keep it a secret. Franca asked cheerfully, will they become minor arcana card holders under you? Magician smiled. Not necessarily. It's a matter of fate. Addressing Lumian, she advised, no need to rush your departure. You can lay low for a few days. Head back to Aubert's du Coke door for now. I sense a fortuitous encounter of fate awaits you there. Fortuitous encounter of fate? Lumian was puzzled, but it was evident that Madame Magician had no intention of providing specifics. Perhaps she had glimpsed something but not the full details. In the next moment, Madame Magician and the objects around her dissolved into starlight and disappeared. How surreal. Franca remarked genuinely. Turning to Lumian with a pensive expression, she mused, Do you think Madame Magician might be the Angel of Stars from the Church's Bible? 
No way. Lumian instinctively responded before sinking into contemplation. Rue Anarchy, Aubert's Ducoke door. As Lumian ascended to the second floor, he noticed a figure crouched outside his door. It was a chubby, earnest-looking seven- or eight-year-old boy, toting a dark red school bag. Ludwig? Baron Brignese's monstrous adopted son? Lumian furrowed his brows and approached. What's the matter? Ludwig, with his yellow hair and brown eyes, stood up and implored, Can you help me leave Trier? I don't want to stay in the Church of Knowledge any longer. I don't want to be under Brignese's control. I don't want to deal with homework or tests. I can reward you. Reward? Lumian arched an eyebrow. Could this be the fortuitous encounter of fate Madame Magician mentioned? Ludwig vigorously nodded. Yes. Without hesitation, he unzipped the dark red hard school bag, revealing a stack of papers. I stole this from the Church of Knowledge. No, I brought it here. Lumian extended his hand, accepting the papers, and quickly scanned the front page. Number, 01. Name, Deity's Fallen Banner, Salinger's Blood Banner. Danger Grade, 0, Extremely Dangerous. It's of the highest importance and of the highest confidentiality. It is not to be inquired, disseminated, described, or spied. Information on Grade 0 sealed artifacts? And it's 0-01. Lumian's forehead and eyelids twitched simultaneously. He was aware that the churches had sealed numerous mystical items with significant harmful and negative effects, categorized into four grades. Three was the lowest, and zero was the highest. A one often indicated a threat to saints and the potential for a catastrophic event. The implications of zero were evident. Lumian's gaze shot up to Ludwig, realizing that the boy's face betrayed nothing out of the ordinary, only pleading. He lowered his head swiftly absorbing the rest of the content. Security clearance, only messengers of God. Sealed method, place it in an underground mausoleum with a large number of soldier mannequins. Construct a cemetery with more than a million corpses above it, supplemented by a real city with a population of more than 100,000. The exact execution and ritual arrangements are. Description, this is a charred banner. The flagpole is iron-black metal, and there are a large number of dangerous blood spots on the banner. Beyonders with strength surpassing sequence 5 are forbidden from approaching. Warning, beyonders with strength surpassing sequence 5 are forbidden from approaching. The experimentalist responsible for changing the soldier mannequins must be blindfolded and carry a lantern. If the lantern is extinguished, the experimentalist will vanish. Everyone who knows him will believe that he's long dead. If he's not blindfolded, the one who leaves the mausoleum will be a monster resembling him. The city of exiles, Morora, on the surface often encounters extreme weather, including but not limited to hurricanes, torrential rain, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions. There were originally no volcanoes around Morora. The inhabitants of Morora are unusually belligerent. There are numerous duels with fatal casualties every day and protests and riots occur more than six times a year. The residents of Morora have no intention of leaving this city. At any moment. According to ancient texts, it has witnessed the demise of at least two true gods. Damn it, can I even read this? The more Lumian read, the more alarmed he became. He looked at Ludwig in bewilderment and questioned once more, Did you really steal it? Could information of this gravity be stolen so easily? Ludwig, looking like a child, wanted to retort, but he nodded sincerely. Yes. Frowning at the boy, Lumian fell into a profound silence. End of volume, Conspirer. Chapter 495, Distribution Oh, merciful father, I implore your mercy for the transgressions I've made. In apartment 601, 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches. Lumian, Franca, Jenna, and Anthony fell silent as they stared at the gleaming full-body silver armor before them. Before delving into the details, they had already sensed the power emanating from the sealed artifact. The brief yet potent hurricane of light it unleashed was a deadly force. 
Even Gardner Martin, a Sequence 5 Reaper, was willing to trade other mystical items for its might. However, upon scrutinizing the information provided, their initial enthusiasm waned, and they instinctively distanced themselves from the armor named Pride. Within the sealed artifact information was a stark warning in red ink, the curse of betrayal originates from a deity's intense aversion and hatred before their demise. Even angels can't fully escape its grasp, only mitigating the negative effects to a certain extent. The sole solution is to shatter the armor and restore it to a pure beyonder characteristic. However, this means losing its uniqueness. For instance, the ability to use Hurricane of Light again in just two minutes without delay. Moreover, those beyonders who advance by consuming a potion derived from that beyonder characteristic will endure reasonable but not too severe betrayal for an extended period. Recalling Gardner Martin's tragic end, Franca, initially skeptical, now felt an unexplained fear. The betrayal curse seemed more formidable than she had imagined. Lumian observed the hesitancy in Franca, Anthony, and Jenna, realizing none were eager to claim the particular spoils of war. With a smile, he declared, I'll go first. Pointing at Gardner Martin's remains on the coffee table, he stated, I choose Reaper. The Beyonder characteristic had fused into a finger, creating an unusually sharp, bone blade emitting an icy glint. The holder needed to be cautious to avoid accidental injury. Immediately afterward, Lumian shifted his gaze to the charred bone flute originating from General Philip. I'll trade the hypnotist beyond her characteristics and the decency brooch for this. You guys wouldn't be able to handle it anyway. Per Madame Magician's intel, while the bone flute held significant power and uniqueness, it carried the risk of bringing misfortune in the form of injuries, death, and other grisly calamities. Only Lumian possessed the resilience to withstand these negative effects and mitigate them without succumbing to excessive misfortune. In truth, if General Philip's grudges before his demise hadn't been so potent, and if the curse of misfortune stemming from the deceased pathway's boon hadn't been so exaggerated, Lumian might have struggled more to endure it. After all, enduring perpetual misfortune wasn't anyone's wish. Even if it wasn't lethal, it would still lead to considerable trouble. Experiencing excessive bad luck was akin to tempting the fate intertwined with Termoboros, a fate deeply connected to Lumian. The potency of the bone flute wasn't sufficient to affect an angel. As per Madame Magician's detailed description, Lumian, naming the bone flute the Symphony of Hatred, discovered it possessed three abilities. With a simple blow, it emits a sharp, ear piercing sound. This not only damages the spirit body, inducing dizziness, nausea, and convulsions in the target, but it can also directly impact beyonders with weaker physiques, those equivalent to ordinary adults. They might suffer temporary blindness, paralysis, or internal organ damage. It appears that a symphony resonating from the depths of the river of fate inflicts a weakness on the enemy's mind. Those with unstable minds may experience symptoms akin to madness. Those with psychological issues might have latent problems triggered. There's even a chance that excessive desires could cause them to explode on the spot. Individuals with illnesses or old injuries will inevitably face severe consequences. Those less fortunate may find themselves extremely unlucky. Of course, the player needs some knowledge about musical instruments to play the bone flute effectively, otherwise, they'll only create noise, similar to the effect of a simple blow. While this bone flute is brittle and can't be used for blocking, wherever it stabs is equivalent to hitting a vital point. If it strikes a true vital point, the enemy will either be killed in a single blow or face the fate of social death for an extended period. Frank observed as Lumian placed the colorless colloid with numerous bubbles and the decency brooch, crafted into a scotch broom, on the coffee table. She nodded imperceptibly. That seems like a fair trade. Observing the lack of objections from Anthony and Jenna, Lumian produced a deep black cloth bag resembling a coin pouch. He carefully placed the Reaper Beyonder characteristic and the Symphony of Hatred bone flute inside. This was one of Madame Magician's true rewards for him, Traveler's Bag. Crafted personally by Magician, it was a Beyonder item devoid of characteristics. At first glance, it seemed to hold only up to 200 coins, but it concealed another dimension within, equivalent to the entire apartment 601. 
It could accommodate a vast array of items, including the pride armor. Magician had also placed a specific seal inside the item. While within the back, Beyonder characteristics didn't require regular relocation, and the negative effects of mystical items would significantly diminish. The traveler's bag needed resealing and reinforcement every six months, otherwise, it would lose its mystical abilities and become ordinary. In such circumstances, if the items inside weren't retrieved promptly, they would be lost to the spirit world and nearly impossible to recover. Similarly, Franca received a traveler's bag as her reward. After claiming his share, Lumian turned his attention to Anthony Reed, indicating for the psychiatrist to make his selection. Anthony smiled wryly. I contributed the least. I'll take this hypnotist main ingredient. I feel that my psychological problems have been alleviated. I can contemplate advancing. In his interactions with Lumian, Franca, and the others, he often heard words and sentences infused with mystic knowledge. Though he refrained from direct inquiries, over time, he vaguely grasped various patterns and the essence of things he wouldn't have considered before. It was as if a new world had unfolded before him. No problem, Franca replied, not insisting on Anthony choosing another item. She turned to Jenna and said, I want the mirror fragment left behind by the fake Martin. Madam Magician referred to this item as the Mirror World Fragment. It served as a crucial clue for Franca's subsequent investigation into the state of the primordial demoness, and it possessed a unique quality, using it to reflect a target allowed the user to create a corresponding mirror person. However, they couldn't replicate entities with godhood, and the mirroring effect could only be maintained for a maximum of five minutes. The fragment produced two types of mirror people. The first was a shallow mirror image, replicable in ten seconds. The second was a deep conversion that took a minute to complete. The former retained the original body state, as long as the body hadn't undergone a gender change, similar to those Franca and Lumian had encountered before. However, these mirror people were relatively weak, equivalent to the original body at a certain past stage and lacked abilities like mirror substitution. The latter was a nearly perfect replica, akin to the ones recently encountered, possessing special traits. Of course, for a demoness of pleasure, this wasn't practical. If she could already capture the other party's figure with a mirror, why not directly cast a curse instead of creating a mirror person? Lumian interjected, you can take another one, Franca. No need to be modest. Your contributions in these battles are second only to mine. What do you mean second only to you? Franca scoffed, pushing the decency brooch in her direction. The only remaining spoils of war were the small dark painted wooden box, each side adorned with a membrane curtain, and the pride armor. Jenna swiftly made her choice and selected the authority holders under the table transaction. According to Lumian, her lucky gold coin no longer carried any additional luck. Its usefulness was now limited to specific situations. Recognizing this, she didn't believe she could resist the betrayal curse of the pride armor. Jenna understood the importance of not being overly prideful and blindly relying on luck, taking Gardner Martin's fate as a sobering lesson. The usage of authority holders under the table transaction involved grasping valuable items with one's hand, inserting them into the dark wooden box through the side curtain, handing it to the outstretched palm-like object, and stating one's requirements. This process simplified complex matters and eased difficult transactions. However, one needed to have a clear, achievable target, no vague requests were allowed. For example, directly stating a desire for a specific beyonder characteristic or mystical item was useless. Users had to find the corresponding beyonder characteristic or mystical item, fail to reach a deal, and then make their request. This approach involved changing the seller's mind, with a high chance of securing a steep discount. The under-the-table transaction had various applications, even allowing two individuals with deep grudges to reconcile by shaking hands inside the box, though the individual shaking hands wasn't actually the other party. Authority holders under the table transaction was an active remnant of boon powers, and without beyonder characteristics, it could only be used nine more times. The downside was that each use increased the likelihood of encountering evil creatures like demons in future transactions. 
As Jenna stowed away the authority holders under the table transaction, Franca smiled and said, I wish to use the decency brooch to exchange for the black primordial demoness figurine, or would you prefer to zero your debt as an exchange? Following Madam Judgment's suggestion, Franca intended to use this unique figurine to gauge the demoness sex reaction and potentially exchange it for their rewards. The, this is everyone's spoils of war, Jenna responded in confusion. Franca grinned and explained, no, it's yours. Back then, only you with the lucky gold coin could hold it, so it's rightfully yours. To put it simply, this is a gain from luck. Jenna glanced at Lumian and Anthony, finding their nods of agreement. She muttered, damn it, you're making me feel embarrassed. I want the decency brooch. Only by personally paying off a debt does it become meaningful. As she spoke, Jenna handed the black primordial demoness figurine to Franca and stowed away the decency brooch, carved into a scotch broom. Finally, the group directed their attention to the silver-white pride armor, and a contemplative silence ensued once again. After a lengthy pause, Franca exclaimed, Seal, keep it. Treat it as a communal item that anyone can use. Only the both of us can carry it conveniently now. Besides, you're about to head to Port Santa in Faina Potter's Gaia province. You can't borrow my mirror substitution anymore. This armor will be very useful in critical moments. Lumian had already made the decision to investigate the sea prayer ritual in Port Santa, Faina Potter Kingdom's Gaia province, and search for traces of the April Fool's key members, Bard and Ultraman. Chapter 496 Sin Lumian commented nonchalantly towards Franca's suggestion, that works too. In the future, if anyone wants to use this armor, I'll teleport it to you. What's this called? It's called Seal Postal Service. It'll be delivered immediately. After joking, he approached the pride armor standing beside the coffee table and began stuffing its silver-white glove into the opening of the traveler's bag. With this motion, the towering full-body armor shrank into the small black cloth bag. As long as one part of an item could enter a traveler's bag, it could pass through the opening regardless of its size, as long as it didn't exceed the space within. Typically, flesh and blood infused with vitality couldn't be stored in a traveler's bag. Considering these factors, Lumian's initial thought upon obtaining the Beyonder item and its explanation manual was that it could be used to conceal a corpse. How magical. Jenna watched the scene unfold with envy. Despite attending numerous mysticism gatherings, she had never encountered such an item. The closest thing she knew was the world inside a painting. Lumian concealed his traveler's bag beneath his clothes, a smile playing on his lips. Addressing Anthony and Jenna, he remarked, After this incident, you ought to know Franca and I are backed by a secret organization. It's not the Iron and Blood Cross Order or the Demonus Sect. So, what do you say? Interested in joining? If not, I'll need you to sign a confidentiality agreement or swear a binding oath of secrecy. Having heard Lumian and Franca discuss the secret organization and knowing that they genuinely believed in Mr. Fool, Jenna was familiar with the tarot card code name. Having received the Fool's response, her decision was swift. I'm in. Anthony Reed pondered in silence for a moment before inquiring, does your organization follow some hidden entity? It's an orthodox god, Lumian responded, addressing Anthony's unspoken concerns. If you doubt me, I can show you the cathedral. Observing Lumian's expression, Anthony confirmed the sincerity. The psychiatrist let out a bitter laugh and admitted, then I don't have an issue. My past experiences in this incident have taught me that I'm still too feeble to prevent such a catastrophe. Even if it stands right beside me, I can only watch as myself and those around me plummet into the abyss. For Anthony, joining a secret organization seemed like a pragmatic choice to strengthen himself, especially one that followed an orthodox god. As a believer of the god of steam and machinery, Anthony had carefully considered it. He realized that the church's scriptures lacked any mention of animosity between orthodox gods, unlike the eternal blazing sun church, which perpetually preached hatred towards the Lord of Storms and the God of Knowledge and Wisdom. In other words, his faith wouldn't hinder Anthony from joining such a secret organization. 
Without waiting for Lumian and Franca's response, Anthony grinned self-deprecatingly and admitted, I originally planned to head back to the West mid seashore coast, live in the countryside, but now I'm worried I can't escape the looming catastrophe. Just like those in the market district, who'd willingly dance on the edge of life and death amidst repeated abnormalities. Yet, their wills and desires are futile. From what I've seen, catastrophes are becoming more frequent. Lumian mocked his companion. You've turned into a nag after your mental illness got sorted. He continued, we'll hash out the details once you confirm your major arcana card and get your mission assignment. Jenna pursed her lips, a dark expression crossing her face. I actually kinda like living in the market district. It seemed like she needed to leave this place. A soft chuckle escaped Lumian's lips. This is, in fact, protection for the market district. Hunters and demonesses always bring catastrophe. Always bring catastrophe, even if they don't do anything? Jenna's eyes narrowed as she sank into deep thought. Fuck off. You're the only one like this. Frank accursed, a mix of irritation and amusement. In the past few months, most catastrophes in the market district had orbited around Seal. What did it have to do with Jenna and me? Wouldn't that prove that 007 was right? After discussing other matters, Lumian and Franca stepped out of three Ruda Blouse's blanches into the morning sun. One headed for Psychic's headquarters on Rue Sheeran Avenue du Boulevard, while the other made her way to Trocadero. Lumian opted for a four wheeled, two seater rental carriage instead of the usual public carriage. Outside the carriage window, street vendors hawked whiskey sour, meatloaf, freshwater fish, onion bread, spicy sauce, soybean paste, and various other items. Passers-by either paused to make a purchase or briskly moved on. Some were clad as clerks, others in an array of differently colored workers' uniforms. After the riot of the previous night and the apocalyptic downpour, this place was once again alive with activity. For Lumian, it was reminiscent of the market district of the past, but now, he was a wanted criminal again, in his identity as Seal Du Bois, a member of the Iron and Blood Cross Order and a leader of the Savoy Mob. Sal de Ball Breeze and the other establishments had undoubtedly been seized by the police headquarters. The Iron and Blood Cross Order's grip on the market district had almost been eradicated. Lumian found it regrettable as it meant losing a stable source of income. However, after taking Ludwig in the previous night and informing Madame Magician about the information, he intentionally returned to Sal de Ball Breeze before the chaos settled. He secured 30,000 Vroldor from the safe, bringing his total to 75,000 Vroldor and 1,000 gold. Lumian's mind wandered as he observed the passers-by and listened to the vendor's pitches. After reporting the previous night's matters to Mr. K and obtaining the Aurora Order Oracle's approval, he planned to leave Trier for the Potter Kingdom. Before embarking on his journey, he had three priorities. Firstly, he needed to locate Lugano Toscano, who had lost his job again, and inquire if he was willing to accompany him to the Potter Kingdom's Port Santa. This Sequence 8 doctor, often journeying to the Potter Kingdom, was fluent in Highlander. Lumian, knowing only in Tijan and ancient Faisak, risked communication challenges without him having to resort to body language. Secondly, he awaited Jenna and Anthony's major arcana card missions to see if they could collaborate and assist each other. Thirdly, he planned to use the messenger-related spirit world creature information that came with the Reaper formula from Madam Magician to attempt gaining a messenger. This would make future communication with Franca and others more convenient. Additionally, he had to perform a ritual to acquire one or two more contractual abilities. On Avenue du Boulevard, at 19 Rue Chier, beneath the luxurious beige house, Lumian met Mr. K once again in the basement. The oracle, his face concealed in hooded shadows, occupied a red armchair, his profound gaze fixed on Lumian. Last night, I entered Fourth Epic's trier, Lumian got straight to the point, hoping to capture Mr. K's attention. Mr. K's hooded head nodded. I know. Tell me the whole story. You know? Lumian was surprised. He recounted capturing Bouvard Pont Perrault during his revenge, 
and the subsequent events of how he, Franca, and company defeated Mirror Gardener using the special Mirror World to escape Fourth Epic Trier. Throughout the entire narrative, he shared only his experiences, avoiding any mention of Jenna and the other's encounters or his speculations. For instance, he omitted details like the fortunate gold coin or Jenna's prayer to Mr. Fool, stating only that he had inexplicably entered the world in the painting. Similarly, he left out many specifics. Mr. K listened attentively without interrupting Lumian's account. After Lumian mentioned the elimination of the Iron and Blood Cross Order's market division and his exposed identity, Mr. K stood up and spoke in a hoarse voice, no problem. Feel free to seek my assistance at any time. Without awaiting Lumian's response, the Aurora Order Oracle turned around, knelt, and prostrated himself on the ground. Mr. K's face pressed tightly against the floor tiles as he muttered to himself, his thoughts incomprehensible. Lumian waited in silence, refraining from interrupting Mr. K. The shadows around him deepened, as if unseen eyes were fixed on him, sending shivers down his spine. Yet, he remained unfazed. It seemed normal for individuals from the Aurora Order to suddenly exhibit erratic behavior. After an indeterminate period, Mr. K coughed violently, and blood spurted from the ground. He looked up and spoke in a deep, frenzied voice, Oh, merciful Father, I implore your mercy for my transgressions. After repeating this three times, Mr. K's face pressed against the ground again, emitting sounds of chewing and devouring. After performing these peculiar actions, he stood up and tapped four times, top, down, left, right, on his chest. What happened? Why the repentance? Lumian asked curiously. Mr. K rasped, our Aurora Order failed to react in time to last night's catastrophe. Failing to cooperate with you in destroying the ritual was my dereliction of duty. It's not your responsibility, Lumian replied, his lips twitching. The Tarot Club's actions had primarily propelled the hostel's plan forward. It was already commendable for the Aurora Order to swiftly discern what had occurred. There was no need for Mr. K to repent and shoulder the blame for the lapse. Mr. K shook his head. No matter the reason, failure to act is a sin. Do you have to be so responsible? You're just a secret organization, not fanatical believers of the eternal blazing sun. Lumian muttered silently. As if sensing Lumian's thoughts, Mr. K spread his arms wide and spoke with abnormal fanaticism, because our Aurora Order is born to bear all sin. I think you're being too extreme. Lumian struggled to control his expression. Chapter 497 The Fragment's Origins Mr. K didn't impose any specific requests for Lumian's journey to Fainapotter. He merely reiterated that Lumian could utilize the finger any time he faced challenges. As long as he wasn't in a unique environment, the Aurora Order Oracle could sense it through the blood connection and offer prompt assistance, sensing it over quite a long distance. As expected of being a part of your body. I wonder if demonesses can complete a curse after obtaining this finger. Lumian bade farewell to Mr. K, his thoughts drifting, and exited the opulent beige house at 19 Rushir. In Trocadero Town, at the entrance of the manor surrounded by grapevines, Franca caught sight of Brown Sauron, her long orange-red hair cascading down like a waterfall. The demoness smirked mockingly and said, I heard your lover is dead. Did you just drink the provoker potion? Franca retorted without backing down. Could it be that members of the Sauron family carry a provoker trait from birth? Without waiting for Brown's response, Franca walked past her, chuckling. Yes, Gardner Martin is indeed dead. I killed him myself. Brown's pupils dilated as she turned her head in surprise to gaze upon Franca's side profile. She saw that the new demoness had a faint smile on her face, but her eyes were deep and dark, a mix of pleasure and pain, solemn and ruthless. Franca considered adding, I was even present to hear your ancestors scream while being killed but that would expose her grasp of extensive secret intel and mysticism knowledge that she ought not to have at her level. It would arouse the demoness sex suspicion, so she abandoned the idea. As she advanced, she smiled and said, then, 
I found the item Gardner Martin and his collaborators smuggled into Trier through the catacombs. You found it. What is it? Browns hadn't expected Franca to complete this mission, a mix of surprise and a tinge of jealousy crossing her features. Franca didn't hide anything. This was her purpose in coming to Demonis of Black Clarice. She produced the pitch black figurine with its hair facing the opposite direction of the orthodox version and waved it in front of Browns. Browns's expression froze, as if she had seen something terrifying. Wah, why? How is it appearing here? The demoness of pleasure's voice trailed off, her tone filled with unconcealable shock. Franca seized the opportunity to ask, you know what it is. Browns snapped out of her daze, her eyes flickering as she said, my teacher will tell you. Franca didn't press further and changed the subject with a smile. Why does your teacher call herself the demoness of black? Wouldn't any ordinary person consider a demoness a derogatory term? Everyone has different aesthetic standards. Some like to call themselves sanuses, while others find demonesses cool. They have a unique and unorthodox flair. Browns appeared more inclined to the latter. Franca pondered seriously, men retain their youthful spirit even in death. Is there such excessive self-awareness? Even if they were once men. She realized that if someone called her a demoness of XX, she would probably feel a strange sense of smugness despite her embarrassment. However, if it were Saintus, she would definitely have goosebumps, her toes cringing so bad that they could dig a hole and bury herself in it. Before long, Franca encountered the demoness of black at the circular pavilion amidst the grapevines and numerous vines. Clarissa's dark gray eyes, tinged with melancholy, swept across Franca's face and the black primordial demoness figurine in her hand. Her gaze lingered on the latter for a few seconds before she said, Did you obtain this from the Iron and Blood Cross Order? Yes, I did. Franca took the initiative to recount the previous night's encounter. She recounted from the moment she failed to tail the Carbonari member until how she and Anthony Reed mysteriously entered the sealed fourth epic trier under the influence of the primordial Demonis figurine and the ancient silver mirror despite clearly being in apartment 601 at 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches. She didn't hide the existence of the ancient silver mirror anymore. She only said that she had accidentally obtained it underground a few months ago. This time, it had some effect but disappeared without a trace after they sank underground. Everything she said was the truth, every word the truth. Demoness of Black Clarice interrupted Franca's account and asked thoughtfully, Did you run into Gardner Martin as soon as you entered? Although she hadn't seen it with her own eyes, she seemed to foresee the development. Yes, there was also that Carbonari member. He's General Philip, who faked his death. This strange figurine was found on him, Franca replied truthfully. At that time, Anthony and I nearly died at Gardner and Philip's hands. Fortunately, Seal and Jenna inexplicably entered and were hidden nearby. She briefly recounted the battle and deliberately redirected Jenna's ability towards vampires. After listening for a while, the demoness of Black raised her right hand and gently stroked her face. You said that there was an area in the wilderness with chaotic weather in the distance, and there was a giant figure surrounded by hurricanes and thick fog? Yes, we also heard his roar and nearly lost control. Fortunately, we entered the gray fog-shrouded city in time. The commotion outside became very muffled. Franca hadn't expected the demoness of Black to be so concerned about the giant. Clarice listened quietly and let out a soft sigh. She felt a mix of sorrow disappointment, and indescribable relief, making her feel exceptionally pitiful. Browns looked at her teacher with a puzzled expression, as if she didn't understand why the demoness of Black had such a reaction. Franca was puzzled at first, but then her heart skipped a beat. Browns belongs to the Sauron family. Could it be the same for the demoness of Black? Could they be a branch of the Sauron family that had pledged allegiance to the demoness sect? However, the demoness of Black's hair and eyes don't resemble those of a genuine Sauron family member. If they are all from the Sauron family, could the demoness of Black be Bronze's relative, or even her father or mother, leading to Bronze's current state? Had the demoness of Black heard about Vermonda Sauron's current situation and understood the Iron and Blood Cross Order's scheme? 
Is that why she's so emotional? As these thoughts raced through Franca's mind, she continued to recount the battle between the four of them and Mirror Gardener. Finally, she took out the pitch black Mirror World fragment. Your Excellency Demoness of Black, what's this? And what's this figurine? Demoness of Black Clarice gazed at the Mirror World fragment and the Black Primordial Demoness figurine and said, In conventional mysticism, the Mirror World isn't a true world. It's an amalgamation of the concept of doors, connected to mirrors and alternate spaces. However, many members of our Demoness sect are aware that in certain special places, for specific reasons, there are a few Mirror Worlds with monsters. You encountered one of them, and this is a fragment of that world. She briefly recounted what Franca already knew about the Mirror World fragment. Finally, she said, this should have been handed over to me for a reward, but according to your description, many underground Mirror people have already infiltrated Trier. This fragment can help you track them, find them, and eliminate them. You can keep it for a while until the mission is completed. Hmm, this is your next mission. Clean up Trier's mirror people and gather any similar fragments that might be on them. The origins and effects are the same as what Madame Magician said. From the looks of it, Clarice wasn't lying to me. Sigh, my next mission is in Trier. I can't follow Seal to Faina Potter to search for Bar and Company. At critical moments, I can get him to teleport me there to provide help. Franca sighed inwardly and said, Yes, Your Excellency Demoness of Black. The Demoness of Black continued, This figurine originates from one of the special mirror worlds. We believe in the primordial one in reality. The mirror people believe in the mirrored primordial one, but it's actually just a projection of the primordial one in the mirror. Just as I suspected. The primordial Demoness projection in the mirror underwent an abnormality and gained self awareness causing her condition to worsen? Or is Clarice not telling the entire truth? Under the demoness of Black's instructions, Franca handed over the special figurine. Clarice nodded slightly and said, You completed the Iron and Blood Cross Order mission better than I expected by retrieving this special figurine. What reward do you want? Franca didn't hesitate and answered, The potion formula for affliction, or perhaps a mystical item that allows me to traverse the spirit world. The Demoness of Black revealed an inconspicuous smile. This time, I'll give you the potion formula for affliction. Once you complete your next mission, you can choose a mystical item with the Spirit World Traversal ability. Does that mean I can't exchange my contributions for teleportation type items this time, but they surpass the value of the Demoness of Affliction formula? I can save a portion and exchange them together when I make other contributions? Franca pondered for a moment and said, Okay. Demoness of Black Clarice raised her right hand and swiped at the void. Franca immediately noticed numerous Dark Hermes words outlined on the watery surface at the edge of the circular pavilion. Affliction Potion Formula, Sequence, 5, Main Ingredient, Flower-Faced Bat's Head, Two-Tailed Black Snake's Gallbladder, Supplementary Ingredients, 30 milliliters of Flower-Faced Bat Blood, 50 milliliters of a seriously ill human's blood, Tail tip of the two tailed black snake, 10 drops of Enfinita's eucalyptus essential oil, ritual, without substitutes, be burned at the stake for 15 minutes and survive without going mad. Hiss. Just reading the description hurts. Franca couldn't help but shrink back. After memorizing the potion formula, she left the manor with Browns. Demoness of Black Clarice watched her silently as she retrieved an item from a hidden pocket in her black court dress. It was a pitch-black mirror fragment. It bore a striking resemblance to Franca's mirror world fragment, albeit with an irregular fracture at the edge. Chapter 498 Suspicious Attitude Lugano Toscano, a burly man with brown hair, brown eyes, and sharp features, donned a budget-friendly black formal suit. He lowered his head as he navigated through the lively crowd, his top hat shading his face. After a series of turns, the Beyonder, now a Sequence 8 doctor, entered Rue de Paves beside Le Marque du Cartier du Gentleman. He ascended a creaking wooden staircase to the top floor of an ancient house. Upon waking that day, before having breakfast, his companion informed him of being wanted, 
due to his role as Seal Du Bois's trusted subordinate managing a dance hall. Despite Lugano's confusion about the Savoy mob's motives and his certainty of non-involvement, as a wild beyonder, merely existing rendered him guilty. Reluctant to seek clarification from the purifiers and machinery hive mind, he packed his bags and moved to the safe house without notifying his companions. His plan was to observe for a few more days before deciding on his next move. During the factory's lunch break, making the market district bustling, Lugano descended and surveyed the area. True to his expectations, he discovered he was indeed wanted, with a bounty of 2,000 Verldor. Considering his perceived lack of importance, Lugano hoped to fade from the official Beyonder's attention in due time. Entering the room, not much larger than an attic, Lugano used a brass key to open the dark brown wooden door. Amidst the creaks, a figure caught the doctor's eye. Seated at a simple wooden table, Seal Du Bois displayed golden black hair, a silver earring, a white shirt, a dark jacket, grayish blue pants, and leather shoes. How did he find this place? Besides me and the landlord residing in another Cartier, no one knows about this safe house. Officially put to use for the first time today. Lugano's pupils dilated, as if he wanted to scrutinize the figure in the dim room. At some point, the open curtains had been drawn. Lumian grinned at Lugano and remarked, Why? Am I not welcomed? Lugano instinctively forced a smile, replying, It's an honor to have you here. I just didn't expect you to know about this doghouse of mine. He spoke with humility but also subtly hinted at Lumian, I haven't forgotten that I'm your dog. As Lugano spoke, he entered the room, closing the wooden door behind him. The space darkened, and a snap echoed. The candles on the simple wooden table suddenly ignited, casting a yellowish flame. Lumian lowered his raised right palm and nodded slightly, asking, Any questions? Lugano didn't delve into the crimes of the Savoy mob's brass that had made him a wanted man. Instead, his concern was elsewhere. Monsieur Seal, how did you know about this safe house of mine? Lumian chuckled. I can find anything if I put my mind to it. W.H., Lugano's eyes narrowed, sensing the formidable confidence in the other party. Seal's actions also validated his words. Of course, Lumian wouldn't tell Lugano that he had followed him multiple times, determining the locations of his three safe houses. As a hunter, Lumian often roamed the market district during his free time, honing his tracking skills. He was well acquainted with the area. While he randomly chose targets for ordinary passers-by and residents, Lugano Toscano, a beyonder seeking to join his ranks, was a crucial subject of investigation to prevent betrayal. Lumian kept a close eye on him to avoid being blindsided by any potential treachery. Without waiting for Lugano to delve into further inquiries, Lumian got straight to the point. I need your help with something. It's my honor. Lugano didn't seek details and acted as if he was unquestionably on board. Isn't this too toady? I'm now a wanted criminal. Without Sal de Ball Breeze and other businesses, it's impossible for me to provide any more resources. Lumian stroked his chin with his right hand. I need to make a trip to the Faina Potter Kingdom. I wish for you to be my translator. Lugano promptly responded, No problem. Is that so? But I have a problem. Lumian, a conspirer, grew suspicious of Lugano's unquestioning loyalty, given the lack of inquiry or discussion about returns. He instantly became highly focused. Could it be that this fellow, like Ludwig, has been sent by some faction to interact with me? Lumian raised his eyebrows and smiled. I thought you'd refuse. After all, you've already become a doctor. Even without taking any risks, you can lead a very good life. Doctors could use superpowers to treat illnesses and injuries, easily sustaining themselves in any country or city. Lugano said sheepishly, I'm also wanted. I'm planning to find a place to hide before returning to Trier. Besides, I believe you'll reward me handsomely. Although doctors can treat illnesses, we can't use Beyonder powers openly. That would attract the attention of official Beyonders unless we only dabble in the black market. The best choice is to forge a doctor's license and open a clinic. Add on Beyonder powers while providing regular treatment. 
However, it will require a large sum of starting funds and sufficient medical knowledge. I already have the latter. As for the former, I've just exchanged all my savings for the main and supplementary ingredients for the doctor potion. As he spoke, Lugano's smile ingratiated. Once I become a renowned doctor and trier, I'll earn at least 200,000 Vroldor annually. That way, I won't have to adventure anymore. Even if I don't want to become too famous and attract the attention of official beyonders, it'll be easy for me to earn 40,000 to 50,000 Vroldor a year. You're quite familiar with Trier's doctor incomes. Lumian gazed at Lugano's face, his doubts dissipating but still lingering. He quickly made up his mind and stood up slowly. Excellent. Wait three days for me here. I'll come to you after I'm done with other matters. When the time comes, I'll pay you a 5,000 Vroldor advance. When I don't need your translation services, I'll give you another 5,000 Vroldor. If there's a battle midway, you can divide the spoils of war according to rules between adventurers. I'll provide further compensation later, no less than 5,000 Vroldor. All right, Monsieur Seal. Lugano escorted Lumian out of the room with a smile. Throughout this process, Lumian observed doctors' expressions and actions from the corner of his eye, but he didn't detect any abnormalities. Is this really how he is? There's nothing abnormal about him, or is his acting skills good enough? Lumian looked ahead and descended the stairs steadily. Jenna didn't linger in apartment 601 at 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches. She swiftly packed her belongings, intending to transfer to Franca's safe house in Cartier de la Cathedral commemorative. Despite being a leader of the Savoy mob and Gardner Martin's mistress, Franca strangely hadn't become a wanted criminal. However, the demoness of pleasure anticipated that she might face arrest by official beyonders at her residence soon. Therefore, Franca had prepared to move to Trocadero Town, having packed her own belongings and Jenna's luggage into a traveler's bag for a quick escape. Carrying a brown suitcase, Jenna entered Rue de Blouse's Blanches and noticed peculiar symbols in a side alley, resembling child's graffiti, a sign of the purifier's request for a meeting. Jenna hesitated as she walked forward. Although she had discussed with Lumian, Franca, and Anthony what to say about the previous night's encounter, meeting official beyonders still felt risky. The unease lingered. After nearly ten minutes of contemplation, Jenna let out a soft sigh and turned onto Avenue du Marquet, making her way towards the alley behind Eglise St. Robert, the designated meeting venue. Her brother Julian was still in Port Le Sur and would return to try her in a few months. Jenna aimed to avoid implicating her remaining relative and wanted him to live free from hiding in fear. Her plan was to establish a positive relationship with the purifiers and entrust them with her brother's safety. I'm already a witch who can bring about a catastrophe. I'll shoulder these dark and dangerous matters, Jenna silently muttered to herself, lowering her eyes and quickening her pace. This time, Valentine and Imra weren't the only ones in the back alley of Eglise St. Robert's Cathedral. There was also a man with blonde hair, golden eyebrows, and a golden beard, dressed in a brown double-breasted coat. This is our deacon, Monsieur Angoulême, Imra introduced. He attaches great importance to last night's catastrophe and wants to know what information you have. From their perspective, Celia Bello had close ties to Seal and Franca. One of them was Gardner Martin's subordinate in two aspects, while the other was his mistress. They were expected to be aware of the riots and anomalies in the market district. Jenna's role as an informant had prompted the purifiers, on Angoulême's suggestion, to hold off arresting Franca in apartment 601 at 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches. For now, their focus was on making Seal Du Bois, confirmed as a soldier of the secret organization, a wanted man. Jenna averted her gaze from Angoulême's golden buttons and suddenly smiled. Are you referring to the catastrophe triggered by the unsealing of Fourth Epic Trier last night? Imra and Valentine were initially dazzled by Jenna's smile, but then their eyes widened in shock at the information she revealed. Angoulin was taken aback and sighed inwardly, as if he had anticipated this. Jenna tilted her head slightly and added with a smile, Would you believe me if I said that I witnessed the beginning of the problem and the ritual's process with my own eyes, and I entered Fourth Epic Trier yet managed to escape? 
Valentine and Imra's eyes widened as they remained silent, unsure of how to respond. Is it related to the hostel you previously reported? Angulim asked in a deep voice. Jenna tersely acknowledged and nodded. Where are Franca and Seal? Angulim inquired. Jenna replied truthfully, they've left the market district. They probably won't return. Angulim breathed a sigh of relief and said, tell me more about your experiences. Chapter 499, Minor Arcana Card Jenna briefed the three purifiers about their investigation of Hostel, emphasizing the encounter with a cyborg monk from the Deep Valley Cloister Underground, who carried a load of paints and brushes. As they subsequently investigated, Seal and she stumbled upon a tunnel collapse during an earthquake-like upheaval, leading them to fall into the painting's world. Imra couldn't hide his disbelief, interrupting Jenna with a skeptical tone. You just fell into the painting world like that? Seems too coincidental. The coincidence seems so unreal that even best-selling authors wouldn't concoct such a plot twist. Valentine muttered to himself, could it be a miracle from God? Jenna nodded, recalling her initial disbelief when she first laid eyes on the painting's market district. Yes, it was hard to believe at first. Angulim, with a subtle gesture of his right hand, signaled Imra and Valentine not to press further, allowing Celia Bello to continue. Jenna shifted her focus to Seraphine and Gabriel's detailed description of Hostel, delving into her and Seal's harrowing escape, encounters with pixies, and the relentless attacks from the other rooms. Upon grasping the significance of Hostel and rooms, Valentine's mind churned with contemplation, making a vital connection. Each room harbors a resident, akin to concealing immense power within one's body, allowing a portion of it to leak out. Where have I seen such a state before? As images and information flashed through Valentine's mind, he looked up, interrupting Jenna's narrative with a probing question. What seals true identity? When the purifiers plastered the wanted posters across the city, they were on to seal Du Bois and his fake identity cooked up by the Savoy mob. The police headquarters had their hands full interrogating the captured Savoy mob members, digging for any shreds of information about Seal Du Bois's background. Jenna understood that now that he was wanted, Seal couldn't conceal his true identity further. After some consideration, she smiled and said, Don't you know? His real name is Lumian Lee, also a wanted criminal from Cordu in the South. Lumian Lee. Valentine's eyelids twitched as he realized his suspicions were correct. Jenna glanced at him and softly explained, Seal joined the Savoy mob and the Iron and Blood Cross Order to enhance himself and seek revenge on the evil gods bestowed. He played a crucial role in this matter. Without his investigation, the hostile ritual wouldn't have been brought forward, and the catastrophe would have been even more severe. Though he claims it's to finish off the bestowed of evil gods, deep down, he doesn't want others to suffer the same fate after he experienced the disaster. Valentine's expression eased, revealing a mix of regret and relief. He sighed, acknowledging, he is indeed a devout follower of God. Unfortunately, fate and those malevolent forces pushed him into the darkness. Jenna, muttering silently, a devout follower. I'm afraid you have some unnecessary misunderstandings about Seal. Angulim responded to the revelation with a self-deprecating smile. I didn't expect the one preventing the catastrophe from escalating last night to be a wanted criminal, a member of an evil organization. Even without standing in the light, one can still be a hero. Jenna agreed with this sentiment, choosing not to divulge the pixie's reference to Lumian as Room 1. Instead, she focused on the escape from the painting world, describing their emergence in the wilderness outside Fourth Epic Trier after passing through the darkness corresponding to the Sal de Ball breeze at sunrise. She detailed the collapsed grayish-white stone pillar, the distant giant's figure, General Philip's feigned death, the black primordial demoness figurine, Mirror Gardener Martin, the terrifying roar, the descending sun, the reddened sky, and the rain of fire. However, she discreetly omitted the specifics of the ensuing battle. Angulim and the rest wisely held back from prying too much. Among wild beyonders, certain intel could fetch a handsome sum, but the details of their abilities and combat techniques were strictly confidential. 
Finally, we obtained the figurine and the fragment left behind by Mirror Gardener, left the seal, and returned to the normal underground, Jenna continued. Though the first half of her sentence wasn't directly related to the second half, it created an impression of how they left Fourth Epic Trier. The complexity of the matter is beyond imagination, and it involves a high-level power, Angulim sighed softly. They had no idea what had happened for the sun to rise from the Sacred Heart Cloister last night, nor did they understand why it had fallen into the Fourth Epic Trier's seal. They felt that it had something to do with an angel-level battle. Where is the figurine and the mirror fragment? Valentine asked anxiously. Jenna couldn't be more honest. It's with Franca. Angulim nodded gently. Where's the full body armor? This was linked to the deaths of his two former colleagues. Of course, Gardner Martin's death could be seen as a form of successful revenge. Magic mirror divination revealed a terrifying betrayal curse associated with it. Gardner Martin's fate served as proof. None of us dared to take the risk. Ultimately, we left it with Seal. Jenna, even as a witch, found the curse to be exaggerated and ridiculous. After a brief silence, Angulim addressed the issue, if you encounter Seal again, tell him he can sell us the armor. Jenna nodded in agreement, and the purifier deacon got serious. The intel you provided is very important. What kind of compensation do you want? The potion formula for pleasure and all the ingredients, Jenna replied, intending to set a high starting point for negotiation. This came from years of bargaining experience. Angulin glanced at the witch and said, Are you planning to leave the market district too? That's right. Jenna smiled sadly and self-deprecatingly. Witches bring catastrophe. I don't want to impact the people here. No wonder the witches in stories always live in the dark forest, away from people. However, I'll return occasionally and remain your informant. You can continue to contact me through the agreed method. Her slightly sad smile prompted an instinctive urge in Imra to look away, wary of falling for her. Once we verify the authenticity of your intel, we'll help you apply for the formula and ingredients for pleasure. I can't guarantee its success. Items at this level require approval from the higher-ups, Angulin promised without entering into further negotiation. After bidding farewell to the purifiers, Jenna picked up her suitcase and took a carriage to Franca's safe house in Cartier de la Cathedral commemorative. Once settled, she reflected for a moment and decided to express her gratitude at the Fool's Cathedral and Lavini docks. She felt compelled to thank this great entity for answering her prayers and enabling Seal to enter the painting world to provide assistance. This marked the official commencement of her commitment to Mr. Fool. In the pristine cathedral with clear windows, Jenna sat at the edge of the last row of pews. She closed her eyes, clasped her hands, brought them to her chest, and bowed her head in prayer. Amidst the tranquility of the religious space, it felt as if she had entered a deep slumber, her mind empty, and her words mere offerings of praise. Vaguely, she sensed someone settling beside her. Ignoring the newcomer, she continued with her prayer. After a few minutes, she opened her eyes and noticed a petite lady praying beside her. The lady had shoulder-length yellow hair and wore light pants, a masculine-looking shirt, and a small brown coat. Although her eyes remained closed, the delicate contours of her brows, mouth, and nose were discernible from her side profile. Despite her lack of height, she exuded a calm and dignified aura. Sensing Jenna's gaze, the woman opened her eyes and greeted her with a smile. Jenna? Yes. Whom am I speaking to? Jenna felt puzzled and vigilant, but she sensed no danger in Mr. Fool's cathedral. The young lady introduced herself, I'm the major arcana card holder of the Two of Cups, whom you might know as Franca, Judgment. I came to the Fool's Cathedral to pray today, not expecting to meet you. Perhaps this is fate. How about it? Do you want to draw a minor arcana card? Feeling the friendliness in her tone, Jenna nodded and said, I'd be delighted, Madam Judgment. If it were any other major arcana card holder, Jenna might have been instinctively worried but Franca and Lumian had already mentioned judgment and magician to her. She had a natural favorable impression and trust in them. 
Judgment retrieved a stack of tarot cards from a small black bag hanging from her waist. She casually cut them a few times and handed them over with a smile. Draw one. Jenna felt inexplicably nervous. After contemplating for a moment, she reached out her right hand and drew a minor arcana card. The card depicted seven cups floating in the clouds, with skulls and people looking at them below. Seven of cups, Madam Judgment chuckled. This represents confusion, puzzlement, dreams, illusions, and choices. But what's important is not that. Our tarot club's two demonesses drew a cup card. She produced another tarot card, this one portraying an angel sounding a trumpet to guide the departed. Major Arcana card, Judgment. Keep this card. When faced with unforeseen danger, take it out and recite Rain Judgment in Hermes. As long as I'm in Trier, I can provide assistance. Of course, you have to be in Trier too when requesting. Except in places like Fourth Epic Trier, I won't be able to hear you, Madam Judgment calmly explained. Thank you, Madam Judgment, Jenna expressed her gratitude sincerely, accepting the Major Arcana card. Judgment nodded and continued, Now, cooperate with the Two of Cups to carry out the Demonist Sect's mission, but with a different direction. Avoid the Demonist Sect and investigate the special mirror worlds. The Demonist of Catastrophe, Chris Mona, who perished in the fourth epic, is a starting point. She's a child of the primordial demoness, a natural-born woman, a pure female demoness, just like you. Chapter 500, Non-Existent City The child of the primordial demoness must be born as a woman? Jenna pondered the sequence name which and began to grasp its significance. A god's offspring can't be just ordinary, and being a sequence nine or eight from birth seems impossible, doesn't it? All right, Jenna agreed. Upon joining the tarot club, her initial mission didn't require her to part ways with her companions or expose herself to unnecessary risks, bringing a sense of comfort. Madam Judgment responded with a smile, saying, Allow me to update you on the tarot club's current situation. After Anthony Reed left apartment 601 at 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches, the exhaustion of a sleepless night hit him hard. As a psychiatrist, his physical condition hadn't improved much. Staying awake until dawn and enduring severe injuries took a toll. Surviving with the help of the blood-sucking obsidian arrow had left him weakened, having lost a significant amount of blood. Subsequent intense battles and relentless running had drained his stamina leaving him naturally fatigued and yearning for a bed. At times like these, he couldn't help but envy the hunters. Lumian, just one sequence higher, hadn't slept either. Despite being the main force in both battles, he showed no signs of weariness, appearing energetic enough to take on Gardner Martin once more. Pressing on, Anthony Reed turned on to Rue Anarchy, entering a brownish-gray house and reaching a corner on the third floor. This was his safe house, an apartment vacant for a long time. He believed it unsafe to rent from a landlord or broker for a safe house. Any interaction risked betrayal and tracking. Leveraging his identity as an information broker, he identified and used or abandoned apartments in the market district. If things went awry, he could choose a random one to hide without making contact. Dusty bed and moldy blanket didn't bother Anthony. He collapsed and quickly succumbed to sleep. In the hazy dream, clarity and rationality returned suddenly. Ahead, Avenue du Marque unfolded, a café bustling with patrons and thriving. Following his peculiar intuition, Anthony Reed passed a golden retriever at the café's entrance and arrived at Booth D by the window. A lady in a light green and white dress sat there. Anthony sensed he should see her face clearly, one capable of leaving a stunning impression but a clear mental image eluded him. It was as if all the information had been gathered, but his brain or body of heart and mind struggled to process it. Good morning. I'm Justice, the lady introduced herself in a gentle voice, carrying a hint of briskness. Justice. Anthony had already learned from Lumian and Franca that the secret organization they belonged to was the Tarot Club. Members used tarot cards as code names, with major arcana card holders representing key demigod members, 
and minor arcana card holders as peripheral members under the different major arcana cards. Justice was undoubtedly a major arcana card. Are you going to be my major arcana card holder? Anthony asked respectfully, taking a seat across from her. Justice smiled. You can also choose to switch. It's not that fate can't be changed. Of course, some entities don't think so. The major arcana card opposite him was friendly, not imposing at all. She even initiated a joke, easing Anthony's tense heart. He exhaled quietly and said, I can draw a card now. As he finished speaking, a stack of tarot cards appeared in front of him. Anthony habitually selected one from the middle and placed it on the table. The minor arcana card revealed, a man carrying a sword sitting beneath three hanging swords. Four of swords. You've already unburdened your heart. The remaining rest and preparation are for propelling yourself further into the future. As a psychiatrist, this card signals you to be vigilant about your mind at all times. We can shoulder new burdens at any moment, and it's crucial to know how to accept, accommodate, and resolve them, Madam Justice interpreted the minor arcana card. A stack of tarot cards appeared in front of her, noticeably less than before. With casual ease, she drew a card and placed it at the center of the table. The card portrayed an impartial goddess seated on a stone chair, wielding a sword and scales, the justice card from the major arcana. Pushing the justice card toward Anthony, she smiled and said, You have two missions now. First, collaborate with the Two of Cups to eliminate mirror people and investigate the demoness sex predicament. Second, make contact with a covert organization known as the Psychology Alchemists. Psychology Alchemists. Anthony mulled over the name. After laying out the missions, Justice inquired, Did they brief you on the specifics of the great existence we're following and the Tarot Club? All I know is that you follow an orthodox god named the Fool and use tarot cards as code names. Following his name, Anthony honestly replied. Before formally joining the Tarot Club, Lumian and Franca had kept details scarce. Justice chuckled. Then allow me to introduce you to our beacon and savior, the great Mr. Fool. Her tone held a touch of joy. After leaving Lugano Toscano's secure hideout, Lumian took a carriage to Cartier du Jardin Botanique. He navigated the street named Rue de Paves in the market district and entered the safe house he had leased earlier. Ludwig sat on the sofa, engrossed in a novel and indulging in dessert. Lumian glanced at him, sneering, escaping the church of knowledge doesn't mean you should stoop to reading novels only. Ludwig diverted the conversation. Someone of ill temper sent you a letter. It's in the bedroom. Ill tempered? Lumian furrowed his brow. The one in the golden dress, like a doll, Ludwig replied, not bothering to look up. Midway, he paused to savor a bite of carrot cake, a specialty from the Lowen Kingdom. Madam Magician's Messenger. Lumian asked in puzzlement, Why did she lose her temper at you? I saw her and had a little spat with her, Ludwig replied nonchalantly. Just an argument? She didn't string you up for a beating? Lumian muttered silently as he entered the bedroom and picked up the folded letter from the desk. This letter differed from the one that had previously rewarded him. It primarily addressed Lumian's inquiries after acquiring the 0-01 information. This seems to be a hint from the Church of Knowledge. If you can attain a high position, they are willing to offer some assistance. They might even tacitly permit you to take possession of the sealed artifact. However, there are two prerequisites. Firstly, you must achieve the status of a Sequence 4 saint at the very least, possessing godhood and the qualifications to step onto the chessboard. Secondly, you must have a method to transport that sealed artifact without causing harm to the surrounding humans and the environment. If you fail to meet these two conditions, the Church of Knowledge won't extend clear support. There's also a contradiction for becoming a demigod and how those more formidable than Sequence 5 are unable to approach 0-01. Perhaps there's a hidden message here, suggesting that after proving your ability to advance to Sequence 4, but before consuming the potion through a ritual, entering the City of Exiles, Morora, and approaching 0-01 is the next step. Leave a mark or achieve something to lay the groundwork for controlling it when you advance to a higher sequence. 
As for their specific expectations, I cannot discern them at the moment. In simple terms, if you demonstrate and prove your potential, the Church of Knowledge is willing to support your bid for the Red Priest position, competing against Red Angel Medici. Does that surprise you? Are you excited? Surprise? More like shock. Lumian had never truly entertained the idea of becoming a true god. Despite not being a devout believer, he had grown up in a society influenced by such beliefs. His exposure to the mystical world was relatively recent, making the notion of I too can become a god, I also want to become a god unlikely. As for the terror and might of Red Angel Medici, Lumian had witnessed it in Fourth Epic Trier. The prospect of becoming enemies with such a formidable entity and vying for the Red Priest's deity position instinctively struck him as absurd and meaningless. What's the fundamental difference between this and Aurora's jest during combat class, claiming you've mastered basic combat techniques and can now slay a god? As these thoughts raced through his mind, Lumian suddenly muttered to himself, If I become a true god, can I resurrect Aurora? After a moment of silence, he smiled self-deprecatingly and said, Even deities can perish and may not be resurrected. Madam Magician mentioned that the betrayal curse of the Pride Armor stems from the aversion and hatred of a deity before their demise. However, according to the information she provided, the Pride Armor first appeared at the end of the all-out war in the Northern Continent. Did a true god perish back then? The abilities of the Pride Armor clearly belonged to the warrior pathway. The one who perished was the god of war? But in the Faisak Empire, the Church of the God of Combat is still fine. Ah, that's what the newspapers, magazines, and merchants said. Lumian pondered for a moment but couldn't come to a conclusion. He shifted his gaze back to the letter. I never intended for you to pursue the Red Priest's deity position, actually. I believe that with an angel sealed within you and a changed fate, there was a chance for you to become a high sequence beyonder. Now, follow your heart's desires. Our tarot club is here to support you. However, there's something to be cautious about. I went to Lenberg and consulted a few local scholars known for their knowledge, but none of them have heard of the City of Exiles, Morora. In the eyes of ordinary people and even the lower and middle class clergymen of the Church of Knowledge, this city is non existent and unrecorded. If you are enjoying this audiobook and would like to support Wispy Tales, Please visit our Patreon and join our Discord server.